The Born Dominion by Robert Ludlum. Written by Eric von Lustbader. Read by Jeremy Davidson. In loving memory of Barbara Skydell. Prologue. Phuket, Thailand. Jason Bourne eeled his way through the mob. He was assaulted by the bone-juddering, heart-attack-inducing, soul-shattering blast of music coming from ten-foot-tall speakers set on either end of the enormous dance floor. Above the dancers' bobbing heads, an aurora borealis of light splintered, coalesced, and then shattered against the domed ceiling like an armada of comets and shooting stars. Ahead of him, across the restless sea of bodies, the woman with a thick mane of blonde hair made her way around gyrating couples of all possible combinations. Bourne pressed after her. It was like trying to push his way through a soft mattress. The heat was palpable. Already the snow on the fur collar of his thick coat had melted away. His hair was slick with it. The woman darted in and out of the light, like a minnow under the sun-beaten skin of a lake. She seemed to move in a shuddering jerk step, visible first here, then there. Bourne pushed after her, over-amplified bass and drums having hijacked the feel of his own pulse. At length, he confirmed that she was making for the ladies' room, and, having already plotted out a shortcut, he broke off his direct pursuit and plowed the new route through the melee. He arrived at the door just as she disappeared inside. Through the briefly open door, the smells of weed, sex, and sweat emerged to swirl around him. He waited for a pair of young women to stumble out in a cloud of perfume and giggles. Then he slid inside. Three women with long, tangled hair and chunky, jangling jewelry huddled at the line of sinks, so engrossed in snorting coke they didn't see him. Crouching down to peer under the doors, he went quickly past the line of stalls. Only one was occupied. Drawing his Glock, he screwed the noise suppressor onto the end of the barrel. He kicked open the door, and as it slammed back against the partition, the woman with ice blue eyes and a mane of blonde hair aimed a small silver plated 22 Beretta at him. He put a bullet through her heart, a second in her right eye. He was smoke by the time her forehead hit the tiles. Bourne opened his eyes to the diamond glare of tropical sunshine. He looked out onto the deep azure of the Adamant Sea, at the sail and motorboats bobbing at anchor just offshore. He shivered, as if he were still in his memory shard instead of on Batong Beach in Phuket. Where was that disco? Norway? Sweden? When had he killed that woman? And who was she? a target assigned to him by Alex Conklin before the trauma that had cast him into the Mediterranean with a severe concussion. That was all he could be certain of. Why had Treadstone targeted her? He racked his brain, trying to gather all the details of his dream, but like smoke, they drifted through his fingers. He remembered the fur collar of his coat, his hair wet with snow. But what else? The woman's face? that appeared and reappeared with the echo of the flickering starbursts of light. For a moment, the music throbbed through him, then it winked out like the last rays of the sun. What had triggered the memory shard? He rose from the blanket. Turning, he saw Moira and Berengaria Moreno Skydell silhouetted against the burning blue sky, the blindingly white clouds, the vertical finger hills, umber and green. Moira had invited him down to Berengaria's Estancia in Sonora, but he had wanted to get farther away from civilization, so they had met up at this resort on the west coast of Thailand, and here they had spent the last three days and nights. During that time, Moira had explained what she was doing in Sonora with the sister of the late drug czar Gustavo Moreno. The two women had asked for his help, and he had agreed. Moira said time was of the essence, and after hearing the details, he had agreed to leave for Colombia tomorrow. Turning back, he saw a woman in a tiny orange bikini high-stepping like a cantering horse through the surf. Her thick mane of hair shone pale blonde in the sunlight. Bourne followed her, drawn by the echo of his memory shard. He stared at her brown back, where the muscles worked between her shoulder blades. She turned slightly then, and he saw her pull smoke into her lungs from a hand-rolled joint. For a moment, the tang of the sea breeze was sweetened by the drug. 
Then he saw her flinch and drop the joint into the surf, and his eyes followed hers. Three police were coming down the beach. They wore suits, but there was no doubt as to their identity. She moved, thinking they were coming for her, but she was wrong. They were coming for Bourne. Without hesitation, he waded into the surf. He needed to get them away from Moira and Berengaria because Moira would surely try to help him and he didn't want her involved. Just before he dived into an oncoming wave, he saw one of the detectives raise his hand as if in a salute. When he emerged onto the surface, far beyond the surf line, he saw that it had been a signal. A pair of Wave Runner FZRs were converging on him from either side. There were two men on each, the driver and the man behind him clad in scuba. These people were covering all avenues of escape. As he made for the parole, a small sailboat close to him, his mind was working overtime. From the coordination and meticulous manner in which the approach had been made, he knew that the orders had not emanated from the Thai police, who were not known for either. Someone else was manipulating them, and he suspected he knew who. There had always been the chance that Severus Domna would seek retribution for what he had done to the secret organization. But further speculation would have to come afterward. First, he had to get out of this trap and away to keep his promise to Moira to ensure Berengaria's safety. Within a dozen powerful strokes, he'd come to the parole, hoisting himself over the side. He was about to stand up when a fusillade of bullets caused the boat to rock back and forth. He began to crawl toward the middle of the boat, grabbing a coil of nylon rope. His hands gripped either gunwale. The wave runners were closer when the second fusillade came, their violent wakes causing the boat to dance and shudder so violently it was easy for him to capsize it. He dived backward over the side, arms pinwheeling as if he'd been shot. The pair of wave runners crisscrossed the area around the overturned boat, their occupants looking for the bobbing of a head. When none appeared, the two scuba divers drew down their masks and, as the drivers slowed their vehicles, tumbled over the side, one hand keeping their masks in place. Completely invisible to them, Bourne was treading water under the overturned boat, the trapped air sustaining him. But that respite was short-lived. He saw the columns of bubbles through the transparent water as the divers plunged in on either side of the boat. Quickly, he tied off one end of the nylon rope to the starboard cleat. When the first of the divers came at him from below, he ducked down, wrapped the cord around the diver's neck, and pulled it tight. The diver let go of his spear gun to counter Bourne's attack, and Bourne ripped off his mask, effectively blinding him. Then he grabbed the spear gun as it floated free, turned, and shot the oncoming second diver through the chest. Blood ballooned out in a thick cloud, dispersed by the current rising from the deep. Bourne knew it wasn't wise to stay in these waters when blood was spilled. Lungs burning, he rose, breaking the surface under the overturned boat. But almost immediately, he dived back down to find the first diver. The water was dark, hazy with a gout of blood. The dead diver hung in the mist, arms out to the sides, fins pointing straight down into darkness. Bourne was in the midst of turning when the nylon rope looped around his neck and was pulled tight. The first diver drove his knees into the small of Bourne's back while he hauled on the rope from both sides. Bourne tried grabbing at the diver, but he swam backward out of the way. Though it was clamped shut, a thin line of bubbles trailed from the corner of Bourne's mouth. The rope was cutting hard into his windpipe, holding him below the surface. He fought the urge to struggle, knowing that this would both pull the rope tighter and exhaust him. Instead, he hung motionless for a moment, like the diver not three feet away, twisting in the current, playing dead. The diver pulled him close as he drew his knife to deliver the coup de grace across Bourne's neck. Bourne reached back and pressed the purge button on the regulator. Air shot out with such force it caused the diver to loosen his mouth, and, with a thick plume of bubbles, Bourne tore the regulator free. The cord loosened around his neck. Taking advantage of the diver's surprise, Bourne freed himself. Turning, he tried to pinion the diver's arms, but his adversary drove the knife toward his chest. Bourne knocked it away, but as he did so, the diver wrapped his arms around Bourne's body so he couldn't surface to get air. Bourne pressed the diver's octopus, the secondary regulator, into his mouth and sucked air into his fiery lungs. The diver scrabbled for his regulator, but Bourne fought him off. The man's face was white and pinched. 
He tried again and again to position the knife so that it would cut Bourne or the octopus to no avail. He blinked heavily several times and his eyes began to turn up as all the life drained out of him. Bourne lunged for the knife, but the diver let it go. It spiraled down into the deep. Though Bourne was now breathing normally through the octopus, he knew that following a purge, there would be very little air left in the tanks. The diver's legs were locked around him, ankles crossed. In addition, the nylon cord had become entangled with both of them, building a kind of cocoon. He was working on freeing himself when he felt the powerful ripple. A chill rolled through him, rising from the depths. A shark came into view. It was perhaps 12 feet long, silvery black, slanting unerringly upward toward Bourne and the two dead divers. It had smelled the blood, sensed the thrashing bodies in the water transmitting the telltale vibrations that told it there was a dying fish, possibly more than one, for it to feast on. Struggling, Bourne swung around, the diver in tow. Unbuckling the harness of the second diver's air tanks, he pushed them off. Immediately, the corpse sank down amid its black clouds of blood. The shark changed course, heading directly for the body. Its mouth hinged open and it took an enormous bite out of the diver. Bourne had given himself a respite, albeit a short one. Any minute now, more sharks would be drawn to join in a feeding frenzy. He had to be out of the water by then. He unsnapped the first diver's weight belt, then pulled off his tanks. Then he fitted the mask over his face. Taking one last aborted breath, he let the tanks go. They were out of air anyway. The two of them, locked in a macabre embrace, began to rise toward the surface. As they did so, Bourne worked on the nylon cord, unwinding it from around them. But the diver's legs were still imprisoning his hips. Try as he might, he couldn't unlock them. He broke the surface and immediately saw one of the wave runners bouncing over the water directly at him. He waved. In the mass, he was hoping the driver would assume he was one of his divers. The wave runner slowed as it neared him. By this time, he'd managed to untangle the rope. As the craft swung around, he grabbed onto its back. When he tapped the driver on the knee, the wave runner took off. Bourne was still half in the water, and the vehicle's speed loosened the diver's death grip. Bourne pounded on the diver's knees, heard a crack of bone, and then he was free. He swung up onto the wave runner and broke the driver's neck. Before he tossed him into the water, he unhooked the spear gun from his belt. The driver of the second wave runner had seen what was happening and was in the process of turning when Bourne drove directly at him. The driver made the wrong choice. Drawing a handgun, he squeezed off two shots, but it was impossible to aim accurately on the bucking vehicle. By this time, Bourne was close enough to make the leap. He swung the spear gun, launching the wave runner's driver off the vehicle, even while he took control of it. Alone now, on the sapphire water, Bourne sped away. Book One Chapter One One week later. They're making us look like fools. The President of the United States glared around the Oval Office, fixing his eyes on the men standing almost at attention. Outside, the afternoon was bright and sunny, but in here, the tension in the room was so oppressive, it felt as if the President's own private thunderstorm had rolled in. How did this sorry state of affairs happen? The Chinese have been ahead of us for years, said Christopher Hendricks, the newly minted Secretary of Defense. They've begun building nuclear reactors in order to wean themselves off oil and coal, and now, as it turns out, they own 96% of the world's production of rare earths. Rare earths? The president thundered. Just what the hell are rare earths? General Marshall, the Pentagon's chief of staff, shifted from one foot to the other, clearly uncomfortable. They are minerals that, with all due respect, General, Hendricks said, rare earths are elements. Mike Holmes, the national security advisor, turned to Hendricks. What's the difference and who the hell cares? Each of the rare earth oxides exhibits its own unique properties, Hendricks said. Rare earths are essential for a host of new technologies, including electric cars, cell phones, windmills, lasers, superconductors, high-tech magnets, and, to many in this room, especially you, General, most important of all, 
Military weaponry in all areas crucial to our continued security. Electronic, optical, and magnetic. Take, for example, the Predator unmanned aircraft, or any of our next-generation precision-guided munitions, laser targeting, and satellite communications networks. They all depend on rare earths we import from China. Well, why the hell didn't we know about all this before? Holmes fumed. The president plucked a number of sheets off his desk, holding them up like washing on a line. Here we have Exhibit A. Six memos dated over the last 23 months from Chris to your staff, General, making the same points Chris has made here. The president turned one of the memos around and read from it. Is anyone at the Pentagon aware that it takes two tons of rare earth oxides to make a single new energy windmill? That those windmills we use are imported from China? He looked inquiringly at General Marshall. I never saw those, Marshall said stiffly. I have no knowledge. Well, at least someone on your staff does, the president cut in. Which means that, at the very least, General, your lines of communication are fucked. The president hardly ever used foul language, and there ensued a shocked silence. At worst, the president continued. There's a case to be made for gross negligence. Gross negligence? Marshall blinked. I don't understand. The president sighed. Clue him in, Chris. As of five days ago, the Chinese slashed their export quotas of rare earth oxides by 70%. They are stockpiling rare earths for their own use, just as I predicted they'd do in my second Pentagon memo 13 months ago. Because no action was taken, the president said, we're now good and screwed. Tomahawk cruise missiles, the XM-982 Excalibur Precision Guided Extended Range Artillery Projectile, the GBU-28 Bunker Buster Smart Bomb. Hendricks counted the weaponry off on his fingers. Fiber optics, night vision technology, the multi-purpose integrated chemical agent detector known as MICAD and used to detect chemical poisons. Sent Goban crystals for enhanced radiation detection. Sonar and radar transducers. He cocked his head. Shall I go on? The general glared at him, but wisely kept his venomous thoughts to himself. So, the president's fingers drummed a tattoo on his desk. How do we get out of this mess? He did not want an answer. Depressing a button on his intercom, he said, Send him in. A moment later, a small, round, balding man bustled into the Oval Office. If he was intimidated by all the power in the room, he didn't show it. Instead, he gave a little head bow, much as someone would when addressing a European monarch. Mr. President, Christopher. The president smiled. This gentleman is Roy Fitzwilliams. He's in charge of Indigo Ridge. Besides Chris, has any of you heard of Indigo Ridge? I thought not. He nodded. Fitz, if you would. Absolutely, sir. Fitzwilliams' head bounced up and down like a bobblehead. In 1978, Unical bought Indigo Ridge, an area in California with the largest deposit of rare earths outside of China. The oil giant wanted to exploit the element deposits, but with one thing and another, they never got around to it. In 2005, a Chinese company made a bid for Unical, which Congress stopped because of security concerns. He cleared his throat. <clears throat> Congress was worried about oil refining getting into Chinese hands. It had never heard of Indigo Ridge, or for that matter, rare earths. So, the president said, simply by the grace of God, we retain control of Indigo Ridge. Which brings us to the present, Fitz said. Through the efforts of you, Mr. President, and Mr. Hendricks, we have formed a company called Neodyme. So much money is needed that Neodyme is being taken public tomorrow in an enormous IPO. Some of what I've told you is, of course, in the public domain. Interest in rare earths has quickened with a Chinese announcement. We've also been taking the Neodyme story on the road, talking the IPO up to key securities analysts, so we hope that they will be recommending the stock to their clients. Neodyme will not only begin the mining of Indigo Ridge, which should have begun decades ago, but also ensure the future security of the country. He pulled out a note card. To date, we have identified 13 rare earth elements in the Indigo Ridge property, including the vital heavy rare earths. Shall I list them? 
He looked up. Uh, no, maybe not. He cleared his throat again. Just this week, our geologists delivered even better news. The latest test bores have given indications of the presence of a number of so-called green rare earths, a tremendously significant find for the future, because even the Chinese mines don't contain these metals. The president rolled his shoulders, which he did when coming to the crux of the matter at hand. Bottom line, gentlemen, Neodyme is going to become the most important company in America, and possibly, I assure you this is not an overstatement, in the entire world. His piercing gaze rested on everyone in the room in turn. It goes without saying that security at Indigo Ridge is a top priority for us now and into the foreseeable future. He turned to Hendricks. Accordingly, I am this day creating a top-secret task force, codenamed Samaritan, which will be headed by Christopher. He will liaise with all of you, draw resources as he sees fit from your domains. You will cooperate with him in every way. The president stood. I want to make this crystal clear, gentlemen. Because the security of America, its very future, is at stake, we cannot afford even one mistake, one miscommunication, one dropped ball. His eyes caught those of General Marshall. I will have zero tolerance for turf wars, backbiting, or interagency jealousies. Anyone holding back intelligence or personnel from Samaritan will be severely disciplined. Consider yourselves warned. Now, go forth and multiply. Boris Ilyich Karpov broke the arm of one man and jammed his elbow into the eye socket of the second. Blood spurted and heads hung. The stink of sweat and animal fear rose heavily from the two prisoners. They were bound to metal chairs bolted to the rough concrete floor. Between them was a drain, ominous in its circumference. Repeat your stories, Karpov said. No. As newly appointed head of FSB-2, the Russian secret police arm built by Viktor Cherkasov from an anti-narcotic squad into a rival of Russia's FSB, inheritor of the KGB's mantle, Karpov was cleaning house. This was something he had longed to do for many years. Now, through a deal made in strictest confidence, Cherkasov had given him the chance. Karpov, leaning forward, slapped them both. The normal procedure was to isolate suspects in order to ferret out discrepancies in their answers. But this was different. Karpov already knew the answers. Cherkasov had told him all he needed to know about not only the bad apples in FSB-2, those on the take from certain Gruprovka families or what business oligarchs remained after the Kremlin crackdown of the last several years, but also the officers who would seek to undermine Karpov's authority. No one was speaking so Karpov stood up and exited the prison cell. He stood alone in the sub-basement of the yellow brick building just down the road from Lubyanka Square, where the rival FSB was still headquartered, just as it had been since the time when it was overseen by the terrifying Lavrentie Beria. Karpov shook out a cigarette and lit it. Leaning against a dank wall, he smoked, a silent, solitary figure, locked within thoughts of how he would redirect FSB-2's energies, how he could build it into a force that would find permanent favor with President Imov. When his fingers began to burn, he dropped the butt, ground it beneath his heel, and strode into the neighboring cell where a rotten officer of FSB-2 sat, broken. Karpov hauled him up and dragged him into the cell with the two officers, the scuffling commotion caused them to lift their heads and stare at the new prisoner. Without a word, Karpov drew his Makarov and shot the man he was holding in the back of the head. The percussion was such that the bullet exited the brain through the forehead in a spray of blood and brains that spattered the two men bound to their chairs. The corpse pitched forward, sprawled between them. Karpov called out and two guards appeared. One carried a large reinforced black plastic lawn bag, the other a chainsaw, which at Karpov's direction he started up. A puff of oily blue smoke rose from the machine, and then the two men went to work on the corpse, beheading, then dismembering it. On either side, the two officers looked down, unable to tear their eyes away from the grisly sight. When Karpov's men were finished, they gathered up the pieces and dropped them into the lawn bag. Then they left. 
He didn't answer questions. Karpov looked hard from one officer to the other. His fate is your fate, most certainly, unless... He allowed his voice to die off like smoke rising from a fire that was only just starting. Unless what? Anton, one of the officers, said. Shut the fuck up! Yorgi, the other, snapped. Unless you accept the inevitable. Karpov stood in front of them, but he addressed Anton. This agency is going to change, with you or without you. Think of it this way. You have been granted a singular opportunity to become part of my inner circle, to give me both your faith and your fealty. In return, you live, and, quite possibly, you prosper. But only if your allegiance is to me, and me alone. If it wavers so much as a little, your family will never know what happened to you. There won't even be a body left to bury, to comfort your loved ones. Nothing, in fact, to mark your time on this earth. I swear undying loyalty to you, General Karpov. On this you can rely. Yorgi spat. Traitor, I'll tear you limb from limb. Karpov ignored the outburst. Words, Anton Fedorovich, he said. What must I do then? Karpov shrugged. If I have to tell you, there's no point, is there? Anton appeared to consider a moment. Untie me, then. If I untie you, then what? Then, Anton said, we will get to the point. Immediately? Without a doubt. Karpov nodded, and moving around behind the two, untied Anton's wrists and ankles. Anton stood up. He was careful not to rub the rawness of his wrists. He held out his right hand. Karpov stared fixedly into his eyes. Then, after a moment, he presented his Makarov butt first. Shoot him! Yorgi cried. Shoot him! Not me, you fool! Anton took the pistol and shot Yorgi twice in the face. Karpov looked on without expression. And now, how shall we dispose of the body? This was said in the manner of an oral exam, a final, the culmination, or perhaps the first step in indoctrination. Anton was as careful with his answer as he was thoughtful. The chainsaw was for the other. This man, this man deserves nothing, less than nothing. He stared down at the drain, which looked like the maw of a monstrous beast. I wonder, he said. Have you any strong acid? Forty minutes later, under bright sunshine and a perfectly blue sky, Karpov, on his way to brief President Imov on his progress, received the briefest of text messages. Border. Ramenska, Karpov said to his driver, referring to Moscow's main military airport, where a plane, fueled and fully manned, was always at his disposal. The driver made a U-turn as soon as traffic allowed and stepped on the accelerator. The moment Karpov presented his credentials to the military immigration official at Romenska, a man so slight, Boris at first mistook him for a teenager, stepped out of the shadows. He wore a plain dark suit, a bad tie, and scuffed, dusty shoes. There was not an ounce of fat on him. It was as if his muscles were welded into one lithe machine. It was as if he'd honed his body for use as a weapon. General Karpov. He did not offer his hand or any form of greeting. My name is Zyechet. He offered neither a first name nor a patronymic. What? Karpov said. Like Paladin? Zaychek's long, axe-like face registered nothing. Who's Paladin? He snatched Karpov's passport from the soldier. Please, come with me, General. Turning his back, he started off across the floor, and because he had Karpov's credentials, Boris, quietly seething, was obliged to follow him. Zaychek led him down a sporadically lit corridor that smelled of boiled cabbage and carbolic, through an unmarked door and into a small, windowless interrogation room. It contained a table bolted to the floor and two blue-molded plastic folding chairs. Incongruously, there was a beautiful brass samovar on the table, 
along with two glasses, spoons, and a small brass bowl of white and brown sugar cubes. Please sit, Zaychek said. Make yourself at home. Karpov ignored him. I'm the head of FSB-2. I am aware of who you are, General. Who the hell are you? Zaychek pulled a laminated folder out of the breast pocket of his suit jacket and opened it. Karpov was forced to take several steps closer in order to read it. Slujba Vnezhny Rajvedki. He reared back. This man was head of the counterinsurgency directorate at SVR, the Russian Federation equivalent of the American Central Intelligence. Strictly speaking, FSB and FSB-2 were confined to domestic matters, though Cherkasov had expanded his agency's mandate overseas without generating any blowback. Was that what this interview was about, FSB-2 encroaching on SVR's territory? Karpov now very much regretted not having brought up the subject with Cherkasov before he had taken over. Karpov slapped the veneer of a smile on his face. What can I do for you? It's more what I, or more accurately, SVR, can do for you. I very much doubt that. Karpov was close enough to snatch Zaychek's credentials as Zaychek was about to put them away. Now, he waved them like a flag of war on the battlefield. In his mind, he heard the sounds of sabers rattling. Zaychek held out Karpov's passport, and the two men exchanged prisoners. When Karpov had put his passport safely away, he said, I have a plane to catch. The pilot has instructions to wait until this interview has ended. Zaychek crossed to the samovar. Tea? I think not. Zaychek, in the process of filling one glass, turned back to him. A mistake, surely, General. We have here the finest Russian caravan black tea. What makes this particular blend of oolong, kimong, and lapsong sushong so special is that it was transported from its various plantations through Mongolia and Siberia, just as it was in the 18th century when the camel caravans brought it from China, India, and Ceylon. He took the filled glass by his fingertips and brought it up to his nose, breathing in deeply. The cold, dry climate allows just the right touch of moisture to be absorbed by the tea when it is nightly set down on the snow-covered steps. He drank, paused, and drank again. Then he looked at Karpov. Are you certain? Quite certain. As you wish, General. Zaychek sighed as he put down the glass. It has come to our attention. Our? The SVR's attention. Do you prefer that? Zaychek's fingers waggled. In any event, you have piqued the SVR's attention. In what way? Zaychek put his hands behind his back. He looked like a cadet on the parade ground. You know, General, I envy a man like you. Karpov decided to let him talk uninterrupted. He wanted this mysterious interview over with as soon as possible. You're old school. You came up the hard way, fought for every promotion. Bodies of those weaker than you littered behind you. He pointed at his own chest. I, on the other hand, had it comparatively easy. You know, it occurs to me that I could learn a lot from a man such as yourself. He waited for Karpov to respond, but when only silence ensued, he continued. How would you like that, General? Mentoring me. You're like all the young technocrats who play video games and think that's a substitute for experience in the field. I have more important things to do than play video games. It pays to familiarize yourself with what the competition is up to. Boris waved a hand. Now get to the point. I don't have all day. Zaychek nodded thoughtfully. We simply want to ensure that the arrangement we had with your predecessor will continue with you. What arrangement? Oh, dear, you mean Cherkisov flew the coop without informing you? I have no knowledge of a deal, Karpov said. If you've done your research, 
You know that I don't do deals. He was through here. He headed for the door. I thought, Zaychek said softly, that in this case you would make an exception. Karpov counted to ten and then turned back. You know, it's exhausting talking to you. Apologies, Zaychek said, though his expression indicated anything but. The deal, General, it involves money. A monthly figure can easily be arrived at, and intelligence. We want to know what you know. That isn't a deal, Karpov said. It's extortion. We can bandy words all day, General, but as you yourself said, you have a plane to catch. His voice hardened. We do this deal, as we did with your predecessor, and you and your colleagues are free to wander the globe, far beyond the scope of FSB-2's charter. Viktor Cherkisov created our charter. Karpov turned the doorknob. Believe me when I tell you that we can make your life a living hell, General. Boris opened the door and strode out. It was just over 665 miles from Ramenska to the Uralsk airport in western Kazakhstan, a flat and ugly stretch of land, barren, brown, desiccated. Viktor Delyagovich Cherkasov was waiting for him leaning against a dusty military vehicle, smoking a black Turkish cigarette. He was a tall man with thick, wavy hair, graying at the temples. His eyes were dark as coffee and unreadable. He'd seen too many atrocities, had given too many orders, had himself participated in too many crimes. Karpov walked over to him with a quickening pulse. Part of his deal with this devil was that in return for the keys to FSB-2, he would, from time to time, grant favors. Of what sort, he had not bothered to ask. Cherkasov would not have told him. But now the first summons had arrived, and Karpov knew that his obligation to the former head of FSB-2 had come due. Denying him his request was not an option. Cherkasov offered a cigarette, and Karpov took it, leaned in to catch the flame from Cherkasov's lighter. He despised the harshness of Turkish tobacco, but he wasn't about to refuse his former boss anything. You look good, Cherkasov began. Ruining other people's lives suits you. Karpov cracked a wry smile. And your new life suits you. Power suits me. Cherkasov threw down his cigarette, the end burning bright against the cheap tarmac. It suits both of us. Where have you been since you left us? Cherkasov smiled. Munich? Nowhere? Munich is nowhere, Karpov affirmed. If I never see that city again, it will be too soon. Cherkasov shot out another cigarette and lit it. I know you, Boris Ilyich. You have something weighing on your mind. SVR, Karpov said. He'd been seething the entire flight. I want to talk with you about the deal you made with them. Cherkasov blinked. What deal? And then everything fell into place. Zaychek had been running a bluff, hoping to take advantage of the fact that Boris had been in his new job less than a month. He told his former boss about the repugnant interview at Ramenska, leaving out no detail, from Zaychek's approach at immigration to his last line as Boris had walked out the door of the windowless room. During this discourse, Cherkasov sucked ruminatively on the inside of his cheek. I'd like to say I'm surprised, he said at last, but I'm not. You know this man Zaychek. There's something smarmy about him. All flunkies are smarmy. Zaychek does Beria's bidding. Beria is the man you need to watch out for. Constantine L. Beria was the current head of SVR, and, like his notorious forebear, had amassed a reputation for violence, paranoia, and malevolent trickery. Constantine was every inch as feared and despised as Lavrenti Pavlovich Beria had been. Beria was afraid to come near me, Cherkasov said. He sent Zaychek on a fishing expedition to see if you could be turned. Fuck Beria. Cherkasov's eyes narrowed. Careful, my friend. 
this is not a man to be taken lightly. Advisement taken. Cherkasov gave a curt nod. If relations deteriorate, contact me. He flicked his lighter open and closed, the clicking like that of an insect moving through a field of grass. Now, to the matter at hand. I have an assignment for you. Karpov watched the other man for any sign of what he was about to say. He found none. Cherkasov was like that, his face closed as a bank vault. Military jets sat, tense and watchful, on the tarmac. Now and again a mechanic would appear. No one came near the two Russians. Cherkasov plucked a bit of tobacco off his lip, ground it to powder. I need you to kill someone. Karpov let out a breath he had not been fully aware he'd been holding. Was that all? He felt a wave of relief flood through him, and he nodded. Just give me the details, and it will be done. Immediately. Karpov nodded again. Of course, immediately. He took a drag on his cigarette, one eye slitted against the smoke. I assume you have a photo of the victim. Cherkasov, smirking, drew a snapshot out of his breast pocket and handed it over. He watched, curious and avid, as all the blood drained from Karpov's face. He met Karpov's eyes with a knowing smile. You have no choice. None whatsoever. His head tilted. What? Is the price of your success too high? Karpov tried to speak, but he felt as if Cherkasov were throttling him. Cherkasov's smile brought him. No, I thought not. Chapter 2 Jason Bourne, in a hotel on the edge of the Colombian jungle, awoke into darkness, but he did not open his eyes. He lay on the thin, lumpy mattress for a moment, still wrapped in the strange web of his dream. He'd been in a house of many rooms, with corridors that seemed to lead to places in which he was blind, like his past. The house was on fire and filled with smoke. He was not the only one in it. There was someone else who moved with the stealth of a fox, someone who was looking for him, someone who, with murderous intent, was very close, though the thick, choking smoke hid him completely from view. At what precise moment dream became reality, he couldn't say. He smelled smoke. It was what had awakened him. Rolling out of bed, he was engulfed in it, and once again his dream reared up in his mind. He made for the door and stopped. Someone was waiting for him, just on the other side of the door. Someone armed, someone with murderous intent. Born backed up, grabbed a scarred wooden chair, fragile seeming as kindling. Opening the door, he hurled the chair through the doorway. Even as he heard the answering gunshots, he exploded across the threshold. He struck the gunman's wrist with such force that a bone snapped. The weapon hung by nerveless fingers, but the gunman wasn't done yet. His kick caught Bourne in the side, slamming him against the opposite wall. The gunman, having given himself breathing room, moved through the smoke like a wraith, swinging the butt of the gun, now gripped in his other hand, into the side of Bourne's head. Bourne went down and stayed down. The smoke was thickening, and he could feel the heat as the flames licked closer. Down on the floor, the air was clearer. It gave him an edge his opponent had not yet figured out. He kicked out at Bourne, who grabbed the shoe in mid-flight, twisted it so that the ankle cracked. The gunman shouted in pain. Bourne, on his knees, punched him hard in the kidneys. Then, as the body started to crumple, grabbed the back of the gunman's head and slammed the chin against his knee. Smoke engulfed the hallway. The flames had reached the head of the stairs and threatened to turn the second floor into an inferno. Grabbing the gunman's weapon, Bourne launched himself back into his room. As he sprinted across the floor, he crossed his arms over his face and, leaping, crashed through the glass and wood of the window. They were waiting for him on the other side. There were three of them, converging on him as he hurtled to the ground from the second floor window in a hail of shattered glass. He caught one, in a bright wink of blood, the barrel of his gun scoring a line down the man's cheek. He buried his fist into the belly of the second man who doubled over. 
then a gun muzzle pressed hard into the back of his neck. Bourne raised his hands, and the man with a gashed cheek ripped the gun from his grip, then punched him in the jaw. Basta, the man behind Bourne commanded. El no quiere ser lastimado. He's not to be hurt. Bourne calculated that he could take these three, but he remained unmoving. These people weren't out to kill him. They had started the fire. The one lurking outside his door could have kicked it down and tried to shoot him, but he didn't. The fire was to herd him, as were the shots fired in the hallway. He hadn't been expected to engage the gunman in the hallway. Bourne had a strong suspicion who had sent these men, so he allowed them to tie his hands behind his back and jam a hemp sack over his head. He was bundled into a hot, cramped vehicle that stank of gasoline, sweat, and oil. They rumbled off into the jungle, the lack of shocks telling him that he was in some sort of run-down military vehicle. Bourne memorized the turns, counting to himself to get a rough approximation of how far they had come. All the while, he used the sharp metal edge behind his back to begin sawing through the flex that bound his wrists together. After perhaps twenty minutes, the vehicle came to a halt. For some time, nothing happened, except the sharp and sometimes vitriolic exchange in idiomatic Spanish. He tried to make out what was being said, but the thick hemp and the peculiar acoustics of the vehicle's interior made it virtually impossible. He was summarily hauled out into the coolness of deep shade. Flies and mosquitoes buzzed, a falling leaf brushed against the back of his hand as he was pulled forward. The acrid stench of a latrine, then the odors of gun oil, cordite, and sour sweat. He was pushed down onto what felt like the rough canvas of a folding camp stool, and there he sat for another half an hour, listening. He could hear movement, but no one spoke, a sign of ironclad discipline. Then, abruptly, the hemp sack was removed, and he blinked in the dusky light of the forest. Looking around, he found himself in a makeshift camp. He noted thirteen men, and that was just in his field of vision. One man approached, flanked by two uniformed counterparts, heavily armed with semi-automatics, handguns, and ammo belts. Bourne recognized Roberto Correos from Moira's detailed description. He was handsome in a rough, hard-muscled way, and with his dark, smoldering eyes and intensely masculine presence, he possessed a certain charisma that was certain to resonate with these men. So... He drew his cigar from the breast pocket of his beautifully embroidered Huayabara shirt, bit off the end, and lit up, using a heavy Zippo lighter. Here we are, hunter and prey. He blew out a cloud of aromatic smoke. But which is which, I wonder? Bourne studied him with great care. Funny, he said. You don't look like a convict. A grin split Correos' face, and he made a broad gesture. That, my friend is because my friends at Fark were good enough to spring me from La Modelo. Fark, Bourne knew, stood for Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia, the left-wing guerrillas. Interesting, he said. You're one of the most powerful drug lords in Latin America. In the world, Correos corrected. His cigar lifted high. Bourne shook his head. Left-wing guerrillas and right-wing capitalists, I don't get it. Correos shrugged. What's to get? Fark hates the government, so do I. We have a deal. Every now and again we do each other favors, and as a result, the government fuckers suffer. Otherwise, we leave each other alone. He puffed out another fragrant cloud. It's business, not ideological. I make money. I don't give a fuck about ideology. Now, to business. Correos bent over, hands on knees, his face on a level with Bourne's. Who sent you to kill me, senor? Which of my enemies, eh? This man was a danger to Moira and to her friend Berengaria. In Phuket, Moira had asked him to find Correos and deal with him. Moira had never asked him for anything before, so he knew this must be extremely important, possibly a matter of life or death. How did you find out I was sent to kill you? Bourne said. This is Colombia, my friend. Nothing happens here that I don't know about. But there was another reason he hadn't hesitated. 
His epic encounter with Leonid Arkadian had taught him something about himself. He was not happy in the spaces between, the dark, solitary, actionless moments when the world came to a standstill and all he, an outsider, could do was observe it and feel nothing at the sight of marriages, graduations, memorial services. He lived for the periods when he sprang into action, when both his mind and his body were fully engaged, sprinting along the precipice between life and death. Well? Correos was almost nose to nose with Bourne. What do you have to tell me? Bourne slammed his forehead into Correos's nose. He heard the satisfying crack of cartilage being dislodged as he freed his hands from the flex bindings he'd surreptitiously sawed through. Grabbing Correos, he swung him around in front of him and locked the crook of his arm around the drug lord's throat. Gun muzzles swung up, but no one made a move. Then another man strode into the arena. That's a bad idea, he said to Bourne. Bourne tightened his grip. It certainly is for Signor Correos. The man was large, well-built, with walnut-colored skin and windswept eyes, dark as the inside of a well. He had a great shock of dark hair, almost ringlets, and a beard as long, thick, and curly as an ancient Persian's. He emitted a certain energy that affected even Bourne. Though he was much older, Bourne recognized him from the photo he'd been shown so many years ago. Halal Isai, Bourne said now. I'm wondering what you're doing here in the company of this drug lord. Is Severus Domna moving heroin and cocaine now? We need to talk. You and I. I doubt that will happen. Mr. Bourne, Asai said slowly and carefully, I murdered Frederick Willard. Why would you tell me that? Were you an ally of Mr. Willard's? No, I think not. Not after he spent so much time and energy pitting you against Leonid Arkadyin. He waved a hand. But in any event, I killed Willard for a very specific reason. He'd made a deal with Benjamin El Arian, the head of the Domna. That's difficult to believe. Nevertheless, it's true. You see, Willard wanted Solomon's gold as badly as your old boss at Treadstone, Alexander Conklin did. He sold his soul to El Arian to get a piece of it. Bourne shook his head. This from a member of the Domna? A slow smile spread across Isai's face. I was when Conklin sent you to invade my house, he said, but that was a long time ago. Now, now, Benjamin Elarian and the Domna are my sworn enemies. His smile turned complicit. So, you see, we have a great deal to talk about after all. Friendship, Ivan Volkin said as he took down two water glasses and filled them with vodka. Friendship is highly overrated. He handed one to Boris Karpov and took up the other, holding it high in a toast. In less it's between Russians, friendship is not entered into lightly. Only we, of all the peoples of the world, understand what it means to be friends. Nostrovia. Vulcan was old and gray, his face sunken in on itself, but his blue eyes still danced merrily in his head, proof, if any was needed, that even in his retirement he retained every fiber of the superbly clever mind that had made him the most influential negotiator among the heads of the Gruprovka, the Russian mafia. Boris poured himself more. Ivan Ivanovich, how long have we known each other? Vulcan smacked his livery lips and held out his empty glass. His hands were large, the veins on their backs ropey, popped out, a morbid blue-black. If memory serves, we wet our diapers together. Then he laughed, a gurgling sound in the back of his throat. Boris nodded. A wistful smile lifted the corners of his mouth. Almost, almost. The two men stood in the cramped, overstuffed living room of the apartment in central Moscow where Vulcan had lived for the last fifty years. It was a curious thing, Boris thought. 
With the money Yvonne had amassed over the years, he could have had his pick of any apartment, no matter how large, grand, or expensive. And yet he chose to stay in this insular museum of his with its hundreds of books, shelves stocked with souvenirs from around the world, expensive gifts bestowed on him by grateful clients. Vulcan stretched out an arm. Sit, my friend. Sit and put your feet up. It's not often I am visited by the great General Karpov, head of FSB-2. He sat in his usual spot, an upholstered wing chair that had been in desperate need of recovering fifteen years ago. Now its oxblood hue had all but receded into formless, colorless mass. Boris sat opposite him on the chintz sofa, mildewed and battered as if it had been salvaged from a shipwreck. He was shocked by how thin Yvonne had grown, how stooped, bent like a tree battered by decades of storm, sleet, and drought. How many years has it been since we last saw each other? he asked himself. He was dismayed to discover that he couldn't recall. To the general, a pisan's death to his enemies, Ivan cried. Ivan, please. Toast, Boris, toast! Revel in your time. How many men in their lifetime have achieved what you have? You are at the pinnacle of success. He rolled his thin shoulders. What? You're not proud of what you have accomplished? Of course I am, Boris said. It's just that... He let his voice trail off. Just what? Ivan sat up straight. What's on your mind, old friend? Come, come, we shared too much for you to be reticent with me. Boris took a deep breath and another slug of the fiery vodka. Ivan, I find myself, after all these years, in the jaws of a trap, and I don't know whether I can extricate myself. Vulcan grunted. Well, there is always a way out of a trap, my friend. Please, go on. As Boris described the deal he had made with his former boss and what Cherkasov had asked for, Vulcan's eyes turned yellowish, feral, his innate cunning rising like a deep-sea creature to the surface. At length, he sat back and crossed one leg over the other. The way I see it, Boris Ilyich, this trap exists only in your mind. The problem is your relationship with this man born. I have met him several times. In fact, I even helped him. But he is an American. Worst still, he's a spy. In the end, how can he be trusted? He saved my life. Ah, now we get to the nub of the problem. Vulcan nodded sagely. Which is, you are a sentimentalist at heart. You think of this man born as your friend. Maybe he is, maybe he isn't, but are you prepared to throw away everything you've worked toward for the last thirty years to save his skin? Vulcan tapped the side of his nose. Consider that this is not a trap at all, but a test of your will, your determination, your dedication. All great things require sacrifices. This, in essence, is what sets them apart from the ordinary, what makes them great out of the reach of ordinary civilians, attainable by only the very few individuals willing and capable of making such sacrifices. He leaned forward. You are such an individual, Boris Ilyich. Silence engulfed them. An Ormolu clock ticked the minutes off like the beating of a heart pulled from a victim's chest. Boris's gaze fell upon an old czarist sword he'd given Vulcan many years before. It was in beautiful shape, well-oiled, lovingly rubbed, its steel glowing in the lamplight. Tell me, Ivan Ivanovich, he said, what if it were you Cherkasov ordered me to kill? Vulcan's eyes were almost all yellow now, a cat's eyes, full of mysterious, unknowable thoughts. A test is a test, my friend. A sacrifice is a sacrifice. I would trust you to know that. La Défense rose like a postmodern stranger at the extreme western edge of Paris, and yet it was a far better solution exiling the high-tech business district of the city to La Défense than allowing modern construction to spoil Paris's gorgeous architecture. 
The gleaming green glass Ile de France bank building sat midway along the Place de Lyrie, which ran like an aorta through the heart of La Défense. On the top floor, fifteen men sat on either side of a polished marble table. They wore elegant made-to-measure business suits, white shirts, and conservative ties, even the Muslims. It was a requirement of the domna, as was the gold ring on the forefinger of the right hand. The domna was probably the only group in existence where the two major Muslim sects, Sunni and Shia, peacefully coexisted and even helped each other when the occasion called for it. The sixteenth man commanded the head of the table. He had a cruel mouth, a hawk's beak for a nose, piercing blue eyes, and skin the color of wild honey. By his left elbow and slightly behind him sat the lone woman, notebooks open on her lap. She was younger than the men, or at least seemed so, with her long red hair, porcelain skin, and wide-apart eyes, transparent as seawater. Occasionally, when the man at the head of the table extended his left hand, she passed him a sheet of paper in the crisp, professional manner of a nurse handing a surgeon a scalpel. He called her Skara, and she called him Sir. When the man at the head of the table read from the printout, everyone in the room listened, except perhaps for Skara who had memorized the entire contents of her constantly updated notebooks, which she considered far too sensitive to be digitized. The seventeen people inhabited a room made of concrete and glass, into which had been embedded a network of electronic gear that would foil even the most sophisticated attempts at eavesdropping. The directorate heads of the Severus Domna had convened from the four corners of the globe, Shanghai, Tokyo, Berlin, Beijing, Sanaa, London, Washington, D.C., New York, Riyadh, Bogota, Moscow, New Delhi, Lagos, Paris, and Tehran. Benjamin El Arian, the man at the head of the table, finished addressing the men at the table. Frankly, America has always been a thorn in our side. Until now. He curled his hand into a fist. Our goal is within our grasp. We have found another way. For the next ten minutes, El Arian explicated every detail of the new plan. This will, by design, put a great deal of pressure on myself and the other American members, but I have every confidence that this new plan will gain us far more than what was in place before Jason Bourne derailed it. He continued with a few more words of summation, then called an adjournment. The others filed out, and El Arian, using the intercom to call in Marlin Etana, the Domna's most powerful and therefore influential field agent. I trust you are about to assign someone to terminate Bourne, Etana said as he approached his leader. He murdered our people in Tenegir, including Idir Sifax, who was beloved by all of us. El Arian smiled toothily. Forget Bourne. Your assignment is Halali Sai. Since betraying his sacred trust to us, He has caused us considerable inconvenience. I want you to find him and terminate him. But through Bourne's interference, we lost our chance at Solomon's gold. El Arian frowned. Why do you remind me of something I already know? Etana's hand curled into a ball. I want to kill him. And leave a sigh free to do more damage? He placed a hand on the other's shoulder. Trust in these decisions, Marlin. Carry out your assignment. Remember the Dominion. The Domna is counting on you. Etana nodded, turned, and without a backward glance, left the room. All was silence in the vast, echoless place until Skara rose. Five minutes, she said without looking at her watch. El Arian nodded and stepped to the north-facing window. He stared down at the wide road, the foreshortened people. He was a scholar, a professor of archaeology and ancient civilizations, a formal man with an almost regal bearing. This will work, he said almost to himself. It will work, Skara said as she came up beside him. What color? Black, a Citroen. She breathed against his shoulder. Her scent was curious, cinnamon and something slightly bitter, burnt almond perhaps. Three minutes from now, no one will remember it. El Arian nodded again, almost absently. The familiar frizzing coming off her still made him slightly uncomfortable. 
He thought fleetingly of his wife and children, safe, protected by many layers, but so far away. Who will I be tomorrow? He turned to see her slender hand extended. Reaching into the breast pocket of his jacket, he produced a thick packet. Opening it, Skara found a passport, her new legend, a first-class air ticket with an open return, credit cards, and 3,000 American dollars. Margaret Penrod, she read off the open passport. Maggie, Elarian said. You call yourself Maggie. He tilted his head slightly as his gaze returned to the street below them. It's all in the legend. Skara nodded, as if satisfied. I'll memorize it tonight on the plane. There's Laurent, Elarian said, indicating a figure in a dark suit exiting their building. He could not keep a certain excitement out of his voice. Skara drew out a disposable cell phone and punched in Laurent's number. At once, a pre-programmed code was transmitted. Elarian had already commenced his mental countdown. Laurent gave a little shiver and, drawing out his cell, checked its screen. What's he doing? Elarion said. Nothing, Skara assured him. He must have felt the pulse, that's all. Elarion frowned. He shouldn't have felt anything. Skara shrugged. Can he do anything about it? Not a thing. At zero minus fifteen, a blur appeared in his peripheral vision and he shifted his gaze to the oncoming black Citroën. El Arian craned his neck. Is he calling someone? Skara's shapely shoulders lifted and fell. There's no need to worry. The next instant, El Arian understood her certainty. The Citroën struck Laurent so hard, he flew perhaps ten feet in the air. He hit the ground, lay there for several seconds, then, astonishingly, began to move trying to crawl back to the curb. The car swerved to allow its right-hand tires to crush his head. Then it sped off so fast that by the time bystanders started to rush out into the street, it had vanished. Chapter 3 Koreos was getting antsy. Born could feel his body tensing in advance of the moment when he believed that he could take Born unawares. This is the moment, Born said. There won't be another. Halali Sai nodded, but Born could see the burning hatred in his eyes. Years ago, Born had been sent into Isai's house to retrieve a laptop. To a man like Isai, there was no greater transgression than the invasion of his house where his family ate and slept. This was the essential dilemma. Isai could not forgive Born, and yet he was being forced to put aside his bitter enmity in order to get what he now wanted. Born did not ever want to be in his damnable position. All around Born, Koreos' men put down their weapons. Hombre, do you know what you're doing? Koreos' voice was drawn tight as a bowstring. I'm doing what needs to be done, Isai said. You can't trust this bastard. He was sent here to kill me. The situation has changed. Now, Mr. Bourne realizes that killing you will be counterproductive. He cocked his head inquiringly. Am I correct, Mr. Bourne? Bourne dropped his hold on Roberto Correos, who took one staggering step away, then stood under Isai's stern gaze, trembling with barely suppressed emotion. Blood dripped from one nostril. Stalking to where one of his men stood, Correos lifted an arm and wiped his nose on the sleeve of his shirt. The man made the mistake of staring at Correos's nose. Correos tore the AK-50 out of his grip and beat him to his knees with a butt. Bourne was busy working out the relationship between the two men. Before this encounter, he would not have believed that Correos would take orders from anyone else. His command of his dominion was absolute. None dared challenge him including the new rising order, the Russian, Albanian, and Chinese mobs. His clear subservience to Halali Sai was both puzzling and intriguing. He's entered a new and larger arena, Bourne thought. Isai has enticed him into the Domna's sphere. And then he thought, what prize has Isai offered him? And the most important question of all, what is Isai up to? 
allowing himself to be captured, had paid off. He'd sensed that the men had been sent by Koreos. But Isai's shocking appearance had led him into another world, one in which his interest was heightened. Isai spread his hands in an inclusive gesture of amity. There are camp chairs over there under that tree. Let's all sit down, break bread together, drink some tea, and talk. Pick up your damn weapons, maricons, Correos growled, glaring from one man to another, and then tossing his head. Bring tequila, lots of it. He shouted to another of his men, a direct slap at Isai, who, as a Muslim, was not allowed to drink alcohol. As they seated themselves, Isai smiled a secret smile, his eyes holding the smolder of a banked fire, as if he had already devised a suitable punishment for Koreos' disrespect. Not now, not tomorrow or the day after. Patience was one of the unofficial seven pillars of Islam, whereas Koreos was hot-tempered, given to sudden eruptions of violence. In fact, Bourne knew the comment to be an attempt to regain some of the face the drug lord had lost in front of his men. Not that that would mitigate the offense in Isai's eyes. These two might be partners, he observed, but they sure as hell didn't like each other, a state of affairs that might prove useful in the future. Isai watched Bourne, completely ignoring Koreos as the drug lord, bent over, tipped a full bottle of tequila over his nose. Snorting out blood and booze, he drank in long, greedy swigs, his eyes fizzing with rage. Isai had arranged his camp chair so that he faced Bourne. It was thus clear that Koreos was to be an observer of this conversation, rather than a participant. The Domna has you in its sights, Isai began. It already tried to kill me in Thailand. Bourne sat back. So now it's the other way around. Isai, Bourne, and Koreos were handed pasole in a terracotta bowl, along with a wooden spoon. Koreos spat in his, and with a backhanded slap, sent it spinning away. He returned to his tequila, the bottle glinting in a leopard spot of sunshine as he tilted it up. Isai nodded. Possibly. Nevertheless, you have wounded them gravely, and believe me when I tell you that they will not stop until you're dead. The feeling is mutual. Isai peered at him from out of fathomless eyes. I believe you mean that. He sighed, put down his bowl, and laced his fingers in his lap. Bourne tried to discern whether Isai was resigned or satisfied. Possibly he was both. I know you don't trust me, he shrugged. Frankly, I'd feel the same were I where you're sitting now. He leaned forward, elbows on knees. But I'll tell you something. You royally screwed the Domna. The plan was to use the cash of Solomon's gold to create a new gold standard, undermining America's currency. Now, of course, you've swept that off the table. Countless time and money has been irretrievably lost. He applauded. Well done. So far as Bourne could tell, there wasn't even a hint of sarcasm in his voice. Abruptly, Asai's expression darkened. If only that were the end of it. Unfortunately for both of us, it's only the beginning. I assume Plan B will have the same dire consequences. Possibly, or it could be worse. He shrugged. There ensued a strangled silence, at the end of which Bourne said, You're telling me you don't know what Plan B is? Other than that it will extend the length and breadth of the Domla's dominion into the United States? No. He smashed a mosquito against his forearm and wiped away the resulting drop of blood. I can see the disappointment on your face. Disappointment hardly covers it. I can't imagine why you wanted to talk with me. As he began to rise, Isai said, The Domna has put out a sanction on you. It won't be the first, and it won't be the last, Bourne said, unimpressed. I'll survive. No, you don't understand. Now Isai stood too. In the Domna's world, a sanction is never undertaken lightly, never simply doled out to the highest bidder. It is sacred. Bourne watched Isai levelly. Meaning? Meaning the death blow will come at a time and a place even you will find surprising. He lifted a forefinger. 
and it will be dealt by someone. Yes. Isai took a breath. The fact is, I need you, Mr. Bourne. Bourne just managed not to laugh in his face. He did shake his head, though. I know it's difficult to fathom, for me as well, believe me. He took a step toward Bourne, but it's true what they say. Reality makes strange bedfellows, and, frankly, I cannot imagine stranger bedfellows than the two of us. He shrugged his shoulders. Nevertheless, Bourne waited. He wasn't going to do a sigh any favors. He wasn't going to keep the strange conversation going. But the fact was, he didn't dislike Isai, and he hadn't liked his original assignment of breaking into his house. This mortal transgression he couldn't put off on Alex Conklin, even though the order originated with his late boss. Conklin either had no inkling what the consequences of Bourne's assignment would be, or didn't care. But Bourne had. He knew how a Muslim would react to his home being invaded, and still he had obeyed orders. The fact was, he owed Isai. It was this debt that was keeping him here now. How long have you been siding against the Domna? This was a crucial question. Many years, Asai replied without hesitation, but it was only last year that I decided to break with them openly. What were you going to do with the information on the laptop I stole from your house all those years ago? I was planning to take it and make my escape, Isai said, but you put an end to that. A silence engulfed them so stifling it seemed to silence even the insects and the haunting bird calls. Isai spread his hands, palms up. So, here we are, in the godforsaken jungle, being eaten alive by mosquitoes and green-headed flies. He stepped away from the now-drunken Correos, who was clutching the near-empty tequila bottle like it was a ten-dollar whore. Bourne followed him into the dense undergrowth. A couple of Correos's men eyed them with ill-disguised contempt, then, growing bored, spat and went to get beers out of a cooler. These Colombians, Isai said in that conspiratorial tone he could turn on and off at the drop of a hat. That's all he said, as if those two words spoke volumes, and they did. Bourne was aware that Isai felt he was better than these people, and maybe he was right. He was certainly better educated, more aware of the outside world, but perhaps that was missing the point. These Colombians, even the least educated of the lot, possessed a concentration of energy that, like a cyclone, could leave devastation in its wake in a heartbeat. Death cared nothing for education or self-awareness. It was the great leveler. There was something crucial Bourne needed to know. I was under the impression that once you were in Severus Domna, you were in for life. What led you to break with it? At one point the Domna stood for something genuine. A meeting of the minds between East and West. It was a noble undertaking, a bold design. But it was like trying to mix oil and water. Gradually, so subtly that virtually no one was aware of it, the Domna changed. He shrugged. Perhaps it was the ascendance of Benjamin Alarian. Though much as I despise the man, that would be a simplification of the process. El Arian was and is the lightning rod, no doubt, but the disease infecting the Domna is widespread. It's gone too far to stop it. What disease are we talking about? Isai turned to him. I know a little about you, Mr. Bourne, so I know that you are familiar with the Black Legion. He was talking about the group of disaffected ethnic Muslims the Nazis brought back from the Soviet Union during World War II. The Muslims, who deeply hated Stalin, were trained by the SS, formed into units, and sent to the Eastern Front, where they fought with uncommon ferocity against the troops of their former motherland. The Black Legion had a number of powerful friends within the Nazi hierarchy. During the last days of the war, its soldiers were pulled out of the Eastern Front and sent to safe havens, where the Allies couldn't touch them. Thus, they were scattered, but they never forgot. Decades later, they reformed around a mosque in Munich, which was now widely regarded as one of the epicenters of Islamic fundamentalist terrorism. I've dealt with the Black Legion, Bourne said, but it's been silent for more than two years, no manifestos issued, no attacks attributed to it. It's as if they fell off the edge of the earth. Allah wills it, Isai said. 
This my heart knows. He wiped his forehead with the back of a hand. He was used to extreme heat, but the humidity was making a mess of his clothes. In any event, the Black Legion, after suffering a number of defeats, at least one of them, I understand by your hand and will, has turned its attention, shall we say, inward. He glanced around, as if gauging and analyzing the position of Koreos in every one of his men. For decades, elements high up in the Munich Mosque have had their eye on the Domna. They saw its aims as a direct threat because, as you know, the Mosque wishes nothing less than the domination of Islam in the Western world. The Mosque has been behind the steady influx of Muslims into Western Europe, as well as agitating them to demand more rights, more power, and influence over the local governments. Once the mosque had two or three of its people inside the Domna, now it holds a majority, including Benjamin el Arian. Now the Domna, with more global reach than even the mosque possesses, is the greatest threat to world peace that we have ever ever seen. Bourne thought about this for some time. You're a family man, he sigh. You're playing a too dangerous game. You of all people know how dangerous. A slow smile spread across his sigh's face. But the die has been cast. The decision made. I cannot live with myself if I stand by and do nothing to stop the Domna. His eyes blazed like black fire. The Domna must be stumped out, Mr. Bourne. There is no other alternative for me, for you, for your country. Bourne could see the hatred in Asai's eyes as well as hear it in his voice. This was a man of rigid principle, indomitable spirit, fierce in action, clever in thought. For the first time, Bourne found a measure of respect for the man. And again, he thought about how he had broken into his home, principally because he felt sure that his sigh would never forgive him. My sense is we don't have much time to find out what the Domna's new plan is, Isai said. There was another silence between them, just the whir of insects, the chitter of tree frogs, the leathery sound of bats swooping through the treetops. Isai rose and walked a bit away from the encampment. After a time, Bourne joined him. Isai stared off through the trees. I have four children, he said after a long time. Three now, actually. My daughter is dead. I'm sorry. It was years ago, like another lifetime. Isai bit his lip, as if pondering whether or not to go on. She was a willful girl, not, as you can imagine, the best of traits in a Muslim household. As a child, I could control her, But there came a time when she rebelled. She ran away three times. The first two, I was able to bring her back. She was only fourteen. But then, four years later, she ran away with an Irani boy. Can you imagine? I imagine it could have been worse, Bourne said. No, Isai said. It couldn't. He began to peel the bark off a tree digging into the tree's flesh with his long scimitar nails. The boy was engaged to be married, and quite stupidly, he took her back to Iran with him. Don't ask me why, because to this day I have no idea. Perhaps he truly loved her. Isai shook his head. The things humans do. His voice trailed off for a moment, but his nails never stopped stripping the tree. Then he took a deep breath, and when he let it out, The words came like water over spilling a dam. The inevitable happened, of course. My daughter was taken away from him and imprisoned. They were going to stone her to death. Can you imagine? Iranis. What barbarians. He meant Sunni, of course, because though Iranis weren't Arabs like him, they were nevertheless Muslim. Sunni, rather than Shia, like him. The enmity that accompanied the schism between Islam's two main sects was as poisonous as it was irreparable. Fucking animals is what they are. It was the first time he had used an expletive, and Bourne could see how much it took out of him. But his vehemence dictated he expel the curse from his system like an infection. So I went in, myself, myself. I got her out of prison, got her out of Tehran, got her out of Iran. 
I was on my way back home with her, on a ship crossing the Mediterranean, when the Domna appeared. Quite suddenly, he turned his eyes on Bourne. Six men. Six. That's how many they determined was needed. The Domna had warned me not to go to Iran, not to interfere, that peace needed to be kept within the High Council. To do that, they said, both Shia and Sunni were required to respect each other's traditions. But this is my daughter, I said, my flesh and blood. Otherwise, they said, a sectarian war would break out within the Domna, and we would be no better than those we sought to control. I doubt they heard me, or if they did, they did not care. We remind you of the Dominion, they said. Nothing is more important. His head swung away again. There was bark under his nails and dirt. An ant crawled along one finger, wandering, lost. That was the last I saw of her, my daughter. Nothing more was said. I did nothing because, because then I was Domna, and there was nothing to be done in the face of its collective will. It's true that I had lost a lot of blood and I was in pain. He raised his right hand so Bourne could see the ugly white knot, the scar in the center of his palm. I had no strength left. I told myself I was loyal, I told myself. But when I returned home and saw the look on my wife's face, the lies I told myself evaporated like mist in sunlight. His eyes sought Bourne's. Everything changed. Do you understand? You crossed the Rubicon. Isai let that sink in. Then he nodded. I came home a different man, a man of war, a man with a blackened heart. My colleagues, those I had considered friends, had betrayed me. They had slipped away when I wasn't paying attention. They no longer belonged to the Domna, at least the Domna I had once admired. This was a new Domna, enthralled to the mosque and its hideous black legion. Now all I can think of is revenge. The information on the laptop you stole was to be that revenge. I was going to steal the gold from under the Domna's nose, but that is no longer possible. Bourne was about to reply when his sigh waved away his words. But Allah is great, Allah is good, because in the fullness of time you have reappeared, you, the instrument of my revenge. There was another silence. Night creatures chittered overhead, and Correos, eyes closed, chin on chest, began to snortle like a pig. Isai gave a dry laugh, then cleared his throat. I need your expertise, Mr. Bourne. You are the only one I trust to find out what the Domna's new plan is, so that together we can stop it. I work alone. Odd, isn't it? He hadn't heard Bourne, or if he had, he ignored him. Using the word trust, we're both men of our word, yes? Bourne nodded. The corners of his size eyes wrinkled. Then this is what I propose. I know what you want me to do, Bourne said. It's only what you were planning to do yourself, but now you have my assistance. I don't want your assistance. With all due respect, Mr. Bourne, in this instance you most assuredly do. The Domna is both large and powerful. Its tentacles spread into every corner of the globe. He waggled his forefinger in Bourne's direction. You think I am being melodramatic, but I assure you, I am not. I'm going to do what I'm going to do. Isai nodded, almost eagerly. Understood. In return, I propose to tell you whom the Domna has sent to kill you. Bourne shrugged. I'll find out in due course. I know all the avenues, all the players. You won't know this one. As I said to you, the Domna has embarked on a sacred mission. Without my help, you may very well be destroyed. And I suppose you're planning to withhold this information until I deliver you the information you want on the Domna. Nothing of the sort, Mr. Bourne. I want you to live. Besides, I told you that we're both men of our word. I'm going to tell you this instant. He took a step closer, his voice lowered. Unless you stop him, your friend Boris Karpov 
will kill you. Chapter 4 You've been more than fair with us, Mr. Secretary. Peter, I've asked you to call me Christopher, Secretary of Defense Hendricks replied. Peter Marks, sitting beside his co-director, Soraya Moore, murmured his acquiescence. I have ideas for the resurrected treadstone, Hendricks continued. But before I voice them, I want to hear from you two. How do you envision treadstone going forward? The three were in the drawing room of Hendricks's townhouse in Georgetown, where they were beginning a strategy briefing. Hendricks's family, while from the upper crust of Washington society, was nevertheless lacking wealth which meant that despite his blue blood, he was possessed of a distinctly blue-collar work ethic. He was a striver, some might say an overachiever. He was slim and tall with the upright bearing of a military man. In fact, he had served briefly in Korea, had been wounded in the line of duty, and had been duly decorated by the president himself before returning to the public sector. Until a year ago, he had been national security advisor. Now that he was finally in the catbird seat, he was determined to implement a number of initiatives he had been formulating for years. The first, and frankly most important, was turning the resurrected Treadstone into his own organization, free of the impediments of CI, NSA, and Congress. Hendricks had no great desire to circumvent the law. Nevertheless, he had observed that, from time to time, there was a need for a group of people, small, tightly knit, intensely loyal to one another and to America, to operate in areas impossible for those subject to oversight and scrutiny to go. Now, with the country under attack from various extremist terrorist factions both foreign and homegrown, was such a time. To that end, Hendricks had hired Soraya Moore and Peter Marks. Moore had headed up CI's own black ops group, Typhon, until being summarily fired by M. Errol Danziger, the monomaniacal new head of CI, and Peter Marks had been close to the former heads of CI. They knew each other well, had complementary temperaments, and were smart enough to think outside the box, which, in Hendricks's opinion, was what was needed in this new splinter war of a thousand cadres they found themselves in. Best of all, Soraya Moore was Muslim, half Egyptian with a massively deep pool of knowledge, expertise, and hands-on experience in the Middle East and beyond. The two of them were, in short, the polar opposites of the sclerotic generals and career politicians that littered the American intelligence community like bird droppings. Marx and Moore were opposite him on a leather sofa, the twin of the one on which he sat. His assistant, Jolene, stood behind, a Bluetooth earplug connecting her to her cell. Sunlight crept in between thick curtains. Through the slice of visible window could be seen the shadows of the Secretary's National Guard detail. On the low table between them were the remnants of breakfast. Cleo, Hendrix's gorgeous golden boxer, sat immobile against his leg, mouth slightly open, head slightly cocked, staring at her master's two guests as if curious about the long silence. Soraya and Marks exchanged a quick glance, then she cleared her throat. Her large, deep blue eyes and her prominent nose were the centerpieces of a bold Arabian face the color of cinnamon. She was possessed of a commanding presence that Hendricks found impressive. What he liked best, however, was that she wasn't girly, nor was she brittly masculine like so many females in a male-dominated structure. She was her own person, which he found refreshing as well as curiously comforting. He therefore weighed her words as carefully as he did those of Marx. Peter and I want to move on a tip that came through early this morning, Soraya finally said. What sort of tip? Excuse me, Mr. Secretary, Jolene said, leaning in. I have Brad Finlay on the line. Hendricks's head whipped around. Jolene, what did I tell you about interrupting this briefing? Jolene took an involuntary step back. I'm sorry, sir, but seeing as how it's the head of Homeland Security, I assumed you... Never, ever assume, he snapped. Go into the kitchen. You know how to handle Finlay. Yes, sir. Cheeks flaming, Jolene beat a hasty retreat out of the room. Marx and Soraya exchanged glances again. Soraya cleared her throat. It's difficult to say. It's not what you'd call a normal tip, Marx said. Hendricks drew his brows together. Meaning? He had completely forgotten Jolene, the call, and his waspish reaction. It didn't originate from any of the usual suspects disgruntled mullahs, opium warlords, the Russian, Albanian, or Chinese mafias. Soraya rose and went around the room, 
touching a bronze sculpture here, the corner of a photo frame there. Cleo watched her with her large, liquid eyes. Sarias stopped abruptly and, turning, looked at Hendricks. All these things here are known. This particular tip came from the unknown. The secretary's brow furrowed further. I don't understand. Terrorism? Not terrorism, Soraya said. At least not as we have defined it so far. This is an individual who reached out to me. Why did he want to turn? What's his motivation? That was still to be determined. Well, whoever your informant is, get him over here for a debriefing, Hendricks said. I don't much care for mysteries. That would be the protocol, of course, Mark said. Unfortunately, he's dead. Murdered? Hit and run, Mark said. The point is, we don't know. Soraya gripped the back of an upholstered chair. We want to go to Paris and investigate. Forget him. You have more important matters to see to. Besides, who knows whether he was trustworthy. He had given me some preliminary information on a group known as Severus Domna. Never heard of it, and furthermore, the name sounds bogus, Hendricks said. I think this contact is playing you. Soraya stood her ground. I don't share that opinion. Hendricks rose and crossed to one of the windows. When he'd first met Soraya Moore, he'd wondered if she was a lesbian. There was something about her, a balance, an openness, a willingness to accept the complexities of people that a lot of hetero women simply couldn't manage. Then he dived deeper into her jacket and discovered that her lover was Amun Shalthum, head of al makabarat the Egyptian secret service. In fact, he'd called Shalthum and had an interesting 20-minute talk. Danziger had used her affair with Shalthum as an excuse to fire her from Typhon. That was high on the long list of stupidities perpetrated by M. Errol Danziger since he'd come to C.I. Typhon's invaluable contacts and deep cover operatives were loyal only to her. The moment Hendricks had named her co-director of Treadstone, every one of them had come with her. So now he had a sense of how unique she was. All right, he said. Look into it. Then he turned back to them. But Peter, I want you here. Treadstone is still in its infancy, and the fact is, I envisioned it as an agency with the ability to police and clean up the giant squid of our post-9-11 intelligence community. There are now 263 and counting intelligence organs created or reorganized since 2001. And that doesn't account for the hundreds of private intel firms we've seen fit to hire. Some of them so beyond our control, they're operating here in the States in the same manner they do in world war zones. Do you realize that at this moment there are 850,000 Americans with top secret clearance? That's far too many by a staggeringly exponential number. He shook his head emphatically. There's no way I will allow both my directors in the field at the same time. Marx took a step toward him. But, Peter? Hendricks smiled. Soraya has the field experience, so she gets this assignment. It's simple logic. As they were leaving, he said, Oh, by the way, I've been able to get the Treadstone servers access to all the clandestine services databases. After they'd gone, Hendricks thought about Samaritan. He had deliberately kept its existence from Peter, knowing that the moment he got wind of it, he'd want to become involved in the security of Indigo Ridge. Despite the president's clear warning, Hendricks wanted to keep Peter on Treadstone, which was his baby now, a long-held desire that he was not going to relinquish, even for Samaritan. He was taking a risk, he knew that full well. Should any of the others in the Oval Office meeting, especially General Marshall, suspect that he was holding back key personnel for his own use, he'd be in an untenable position. Ah, well, he thought, what's life without risk? He stepped back to the window. His roses looked bedraggled and forlorn. He glanced impatiently at his watch. Where was that damn rose specialist he'd hired? It was quiet here, the house removed from the hubbub at the center of the city. Normally, he enjoyed that. It allowed him to think. But this morning was different. He had awoken with a nagging sense that he had missed something. He had already been married and divorced twice when he had met, married, and then buried his beloved Amanda. He had one son from the second wife, now a Marine in military intelligence deployed in Afghanistan. He should have been worried about him. But the fact was, he rarely thought about him. He'd had little to do with raising him. To be truthful, 
he might have been someone else's son. Without Amanda, he had no attachments, no sense of family, only place. Like a European, he valued property over cash. In a sense, this house was all he had, all he needed. Why was that, he asked himself. Was something wrong with him? In restaurants, at official functions, or the theater, he encountered colleagues with their wives, sometimes with their grown children. He was always alone, even though from time to time he had one woman or another on his arm, widows desperate to remain part of the social scene inside the beltway. They meant nothing to him, these women of a certain age, with tight, poreless faces, breasts pushed up to their carefully sculpted chins, and their long gowns manufactured to impress. Often they wore gloves to hide their age spots. He was pulled away from his ruminations by the sharp sound of the bell. Opening the front door, he was confronted by a woman in her mid to late thirties, her hair pulled back from her heart-shaped face in a tomboyish ponytail. She wore round, steel-rimmed glasses, denim overalls atop a plaid man's shirt, frog green clogs, and a floppy canvas sun hat. She introduced herself as Maggie Penrod and presented her credentials just as she had with the bodyguards patrolling the property. Hendricks studied them. She was trained at the Sorbonne and at Trinity at Oxford. Her father, deceased, had been a social worker. Her Swedish mother, also deceased, a language teacher in the Bethesda school district. There was nothing memorable about her except, as she leaned forward to take back her ID, her scent, which had a decided tang. What was it? Hendricks asked himself. He sniffed as inconspicuously as possible. Ah, yes. Cinnamon and something slightly bitter. Burnt almond, maybe. As he led the way outside to the sad-looking rose bed, he said, What's an art history major doing in a place like this? She laughed, a soft, mellow sound that somehow stirred something inside him, long hidden. Art history was a totally unrealistic career choice. Besides, I don't do well in academia. Too much skullduggery and intrigue. She had a slight accent, doubtless a product of her Swedish mother, Hendricks thought. She paused at the edge of the rose bed, hands on hips. And I like being my own boss, no one but me to answer to. Listening more closely, he became aware that her accent softened her words, lending them an unmistakable sensuality. She knelt down, her soft, strong fingers pushing aside stillborn flowers, their edges tight, ruffled, and brown. Blood streaked her skin, but she seemed unmindful of the thorns. The roses are bald and the leaves are being eaten. She stood up and turned to him. For one thing, you're overwatering them. For another, they need to be sprayed once a week. Not to worry. I use only organics. She smiled up at him, her cheeks aflame in sunlight. It'll take a couple of weeks, but... I think I can get them out of intensive care. Hendricks gestured. Whatever you need. The sunlight slid over her forearms like oil, illuminating tiny white gold hairs that seemed to stir beneath his gaze. Hendricks's breath felt hot in his throat. And then, without his knowing quite how the word slipped out, he said, Care to come inside for a drink? She smiled sweetly at him the sun in her eyes. Not today. I don't believe it, Bourne said. It simply isn't possible. Anything is possible, Isai said. Everything is possible. No, Bourne said firmly. It's not. Isai smiled his enigmatic smile. Mr. Bourne, you are now in the dominion of Severus Domna. Please believe me in this. Bourne stared into the fire. Darkness had come, and with it a fresh wild pig, which Koreos's men had trapped, scraped free of hair, and spitted. The rich odor of its melting fat suffused the campsite. He and Asai sat near the fire, talking. Some distance away, Koreos was talking animatedly to his lieutenant. Petty victories, Isai said, eyeing him. Bourne looked at him inquiringly. You see how it is. He knows I can't eat pork, and yet this is what he offers for dinner. If you ask him, he'll say it's a treat for his men. 
Let's return to Boris Karpov. The enigmatic smile returned. Benjamin Alarian, our enemy, is a master chess player. He thinks many moves ahead. He planned for the eventuality that you might succeed in keeping the Domna from finding Solomon's hoard of gold. He turned his head, the firelight glinting off his eyes. You've heard of Viktor Cherkasov, yes? Until several months ago, he was the head of FSB-2. He left under mysterious circumstances, and Boris took his place. Boris told me all this. Cleaning up FSB-2 has been a long-held dream of his. A good man, your friend Boris. Did he happen to tell you why Cherkasov abdicated his powerful throne? Mysterious circumstances, Born repeated. Not so mysterious to me. Benjamin Elarian contacted Cherkasov through the appropriate intermediary and made him an offer he couldn't refuse. Born's muscles tensed. Cherkasov is part of the Domna now? His sigh nodded. And now I can see by your expression that you have intuited the rest of it. Cherkasov offered your friend Boris a deal. He'd give him FSB too, in return for future favors. And the first one is killing me. Isai saw that Koreos, having finished giving orders, was coming toward them. He sat forward, and lowering his voice, said with some urgency, You see what a clever fellow Benjamin Alarian is. The Domna is no ordinary cabal. Now you know the extent of what we are up against. As Koreos pulled over a camp chair, Bourne said, There's still the matter of why I came here in the first place. Koreos stared at him with stainless steel eyes. Above him, a tree grew with bark peeling off like strips of flayed skin. The air shimmered and danced with mosquitoes. Assurances, Bourne said. It was clear he was addressing both Isai and the drug lord. Koreos made a soundless laugh, bared his teeth and snapped his jaws together like a villain in a Tarantino film. My dead partner's sister is paranoid. I mean her no harm. All assurance is given. The business was Gustavo's and yours, Bourne said. Now it belongs to you. That's the line she fed you? She has no use for blood money derived from drugs. Correo spread his hands wide. Then why did he want her to take it over? Family. But she's not like him. You don't know her. Bourne made no reply. There was something about the drug lord that brought out an instinctive animosity, like seeing a scorpion or a black widow spider. The creature might not be threatening you at the moment, but what about in the future? Bourne studied him. He was the polar opposite of Gustavo Moreno, whom Bourne had met years ago. Whatever else he might have been, Moreno was a gentleman. That is, when he gave his word, it meant something. Bourne did not have that sense with Correos. Berengaria was right to be afraid of him. During this buzzing lull, Correos sat back, lounging in his chair so that it creaked like an old man's bones. So, what does the puta want? Berengaria wants only to be left alone. Correos threw his head back and laughed. Bourne could see the thick red welt from where he'd begun to strangle him. Bueno, okay, we go to the next step. How much does she want? I told you, Bourne said evenly. Nothing. Now I know you're fucking with me. Come on, give it. A thin breeze stirred the swarms of mosquitoes. The forest was dense with the sounds of insects, tree frogs, and small nocturnal mammals. Bourne wanted nothing more than to bury his fist in Correos' face. Now that he had met him, he suspected that Moreno had left his half of the business to his sister to piss his partner off. They could not have gotten on personally. You might believe the bitch, Correos said. Doesn't mean I do. Just leave her alone and this will be at an end. Correos shook his head. She has all my contacts. This came directly off her hard drive. Bourne handed him the computer printout Berengaria had given him before he left Phuket. Correos opened it and ran his thick, calloused forefinger down the list. All here. He looked up and shrugged. This is a copy. He waved it in the air. It means nothing. Bourne handed him the hard drive from Berengaria's laptop. Correos stared at it for a moment. Fuck me. Laughing, he nodded. Done. If you come after her, 
Bourne allowed the implied threat to hang in the humid air. Correos froze for half a second. Then he opened his arms wide. If I go after the beach, then come the fuck on. Chapter 5 God damn it! Peter Marks pounded his fist against the steering wheel as he was stopped short at a red light. Down, boy, Soraya said. What's eating you? He's lying. Peter hit the horn with the heel of his hand. There's something going on and Hendricks isn't telling us what. Soraya regarded him archly. And you know this how? That crap he fed me about why I need to stay here. He's resurrected Treadstone with your overseas network in place, so what? We can be nannies for the other clandestine services? It's fucking make work. There's nothing real about it. He shook his head. Uh Uh-uh. There's something going on he doesn't want us to know about. Soraya stifled a tart rejoinder and, instead, thought about Peter's supposition for a moment. She and Peter had worked together for a number of years in CI. They had come to trust each other with their lives. That was no little thing. And instincts had a lot to do with their mutual trust. What had Peter seen or sensed that she hadn't? To be honest, she had been so elated at being given the go-ahead to run down the death in Paris that she hadn't paid much attention to what went on after that. More fool her. Hey, slow down, cowboy, she yelled as he veered around the rear of a truck. I'd like to live until at least tonight. Sorry, Peter muttered. Seeing that he was really and truly upset, she said, What can I do to help? Go to Paris, get the investigation of your murdered source underway, find out who the hell killed him. She looked at him skeptically. I don't like leaving you in this state. You don't have to like it. She touched his arm. Peter, I'm concerned that you're going to do something stupid. He shot her a glare. Or at the very least, something dangerous. He took a breath. Do you think your being here would change any of that? She frowned. No, but then be on the first plane to Paris. You're planning something. No, I'm not. Damn it, I know that look. He bit his cheek. And before you leave, why don't you give Amun a call? Soraya immediately bridled, thinking he was needling her. But then, when she thought further, she saw the wisdom of his suggestion. He might be right. Amun could provide a different perspective on this mysterious group. She pulled out her cell and texted, Arrive Paris tomorrow a.m. regarding murder. Can you? She found her heart beating fast. She hadn't seen Amun in over a year, but it was only now, reaching out to him, that she realized how much she had missed him, his bright smile, his certain touch, the brilliance of his mind. She frowned. What time was it in Cairo? almost 10.30 p.m. As she was calculating, her cell buzzed. A text had come in. Arrive Paris, 8.34 a.m. local, day after tomorrow. Soraya felt a warmth suffuse her body. She flexed her hands. What's up? Peter asked. My fingertips are tingling. Peter threw his head back and laughed. A sigh drove Bourne away from Koreos' encampment. The headlights were on, illuminating the dirt track through the dense forest of the Bosque de Niebla de Chicaque, but already a pinkish-blue light stole through the branches, snatching shadows from along the ground. Birdsong, which had been missing during the depths of the night, ricocheted back and forth above their heads. We're heading west instead of east, Bourne said. Back to Bogota. We are going to the regional airport at Perales. Isai said, where I'll take a flight to Bogota, and you'll take the car. You need to go farther west, to Ubagwe. It's in the mountains, about sixty miles southwest of El Colegio. And why do I want to go there? In Ubagwe, you'll seek out a man named Esteban Vegas. He's a member of the Domna, a weak link, as you might say in idiomatic English, yes? I was going to speak with him about defecting, but now that you're here, I expect you'll have a better chance than I would. Explain yourself, Isai. With pleasure. Now that they were away from Koreos' camp, Isai seemed more relaxed, almost jovial, 
if such a word could be applied to this taciturn, revenge-obsessed man. It's simple, really. I'm a known quantity within the Domna, a pariah, a traitor. Even with a man like Vegas, with shaky loyalty to the group, my presence would be problematic. In fact, it might backfire, providing him with a reason to become defensive, intractable. While I am an unknown quantity, Bourne said, Vegas will be more inclined to listen to me. That will depend entirely on your powers of persuasion. From what I know of you, another excellent reason for you to take my place. Bourne thought for a moment, and if he does spill, your intel on the Domna will be current. I, unfortunately, have been cut off for some time. I am now deaf and blind to the details of their plots and plans. Vegas lives in the middle of nowhere, Bourne pointed out. First of all, the term middle of nowhere doesn't apply to the Domna, Isai said. Its eyes and ears are everywhere. They bumped onto a paved section of the road, though their speed slowed considerably because it was in desperate need of repair, and potholes deep enough to throw an axle seemed to be everywhere. Second, though Vegas may not know everything we need to know, he's bound to know someone who does. It will then be your job to find them and charm them out of the information. Then you'll take a flight out of Paralysis. Tickets will be waiting for you there. And while I'm trying to poke into the Domna's dark corners, what will you be doing? Providing a distraction to cover you. What exactly? You're better off not knowing, believe me. Isai manhandled the vehicle around a dual pothole of staggering depth. There's a spare sat phone in the glove box, charged and ready to go. Also, a detailed map of the area. A bugway is clearly marked, as is the oil field Vegas runs. Leaning forward, Bourne opened the glove box and checked the contents. You'll find my set number pre-programmed into it, Isai continued. That way, we'll never be out of touch, no matter where we are. They rumbled past a gorge with sheer rock walls, and a mile or two farther, an enormous waterfall crashing down a blood-red cliff with enormous unending energy. The tree canopy became abruptly less thick, more light flickering, a morse code through the tangle of branches. They burst through the western edge of the trees. A riot of bougainvillea inhabiting a colonial stone wall shivered, shaking off the early morning dew in the first slender shoots of sunlight. Bourne looked out at the countryside. Due west was a chain of formidable mountains, shaggy with dense forest. In a couple of hours, that was where he'd be headed. What can you tell me about this man, Vegas? He's crusty, belligerent, often intractable. Beautiful. Isai ignored Bourne's sarcasm. But he has another side. He's a long-time oilman. He has overseen the oil outfit out there for close to twenty years. By now I think his veins must run with oil. In any event, he's strictly hands-on. He believes in a hard day's work even at his age, which must be sixty, knowing him possibly more. He's hard-drinking, buried two wives, lost a daughter to a Brazilian who seduced her and spirited her away. He's never seen or spoken to her in thirty-odd years. Sons? Isai shook his head. He lives with a young Indian woman now, but to my knowledge she's never been pregnant. Other than that, I don't know anything about her. What doesn't he like? Isai shot him a look. You mean, what does he like? It's more important to know what to avoid saying or doing, Bourne said. I understand. Isai nodded reflectively. He hates communists and fascists in equal measure. How about drug lords? Isai glanced at him again, as if trying to figure out where this line of questioning was going. He was smart enough not to ask. You're on your own there. Born thought for a moment. What I find interesting is that he lost his child, and now, when he's in the perfect position to have more, he doesn't. Isai shrugged. Too much heartache. I can relate to that. But would you? My wife is too old. My point. His woman isn't. Peter Marks watched the gardener get into her SUV and drive away from Hendrix's house. He'd observed her feeding the roses, then spraying them from a pump canister. 
She had worked slowly, methodically, gently, murmuring to the roses as if she were making love to them. She drove off without a glance at the security personnel. The four men assigned to the secretary were of great concern to him. If he was going to shadow Hendricks in an attempt to discover what he was hiding, he'd have to stay off their radar. He considered it a challenge rather than a problem. Peter had always faced challenges head-on. He'd run at them with a fervor that burned brightest when he was a teenager and young adult. He hadn't come out so much as been brought out by Father Benedict, his local parish priest. But unlike the other boys whom the father had taken behind the sacristy for holy wine and sex, Peter had told his father. He was ten when this happened, but he was a precocious boy and wanted to publicly denounce the priest the following Sunday during Mass. His father had forbade this. It will be far worse for you than for him, he told his son. Everyone will know, and you'll be branded for life. There was no mistaking the warning in his father's voice. Peter had experienced the magnitude of his father's anger, and he wasn't eager to trigger it again. That Sunday, when they went to church, another priest whom Peter had never seen before performed the Mass. He wondered where Father Benedict was. Afterward, on the church steps in the sunshine of late morning, he heard people talking. Father Benedict had been assaulted the night before on his way home from church. Beaten to a pulp was the phrase most used. He now lay in critical condition at Sisters of Mercy Hospital eight blocks away. Peter never went to see him, and Father Benedict never returned to his parish church, even though he was discharged from Sisters of Mercy six weeks later. In the intervening years, Peter had never spoken to his father about Benedict, though his suspicion was that the priest had been on the receiving end of his father's wrath. And now, of course, it was too late to ask. His father had died eleven years ago. Peter's eyes cleared. Hendricks had emerged from his house. A black Lincoln town car had pulled up and the driver got out, opened the door for the secretary, who climbed in. One of the security detail followed. Two others got into their nondescript Ford, and the two cars pulled out in unison. Peter, avoiding the gaze of the fourth man left behind, began the tale, his memories trailing behind. In high school and college, he had experimented with like-minded boys his age, always being careful because that was his nature. But then he'd become interested in the clandestine services and begun to take the appropriate courses. When he did so, his college advisor changed. He had never seen or heard of him before. In fact, he couldn't find him on the college's admin list. One day, the advisor called him in for a talk, the gist of which was that if Peter truly desired a career in the clandestine services, he'd have to button it up, as the advisor put it. The subject was never raised again, but Peter, having been given a word to the wise, did, in fact, button it up, reading as he did about case after case where spies or men in sensitive positions were compromised because of their sexual proclivities. He fervently did not want to become one of those disgraced people, and he vividly recalled what had happened to Father Benedict. So he became a better celibate than Benedict had ever been. He loved Soraya like the sister he never had but he certainly was never in love with her. He wondered that he'd once been jealous of her affection for Bourne. He scoffed at that now. How could he have ever been jealous of Jason Bourne? He couldn't bear to have that man's shadowy life. The cars rolled out of the tree-lined streets of Georgetown, heading due east toward the heart of Washington. Dusk was forming, filled with haze and uncertainty. He checked his car's clock. Any moment now, Soraya would be in the air on her way across the Atlantic to Paris and her rendezvous with Amun Shalthoum. He'd call his friend Jacques Rabinet to give him the particulars of her visit. Rabinet, whom he'd met through Jason Bourne, was the French Minister of Culture. Rabinet was also one of the new leading lights of the Quai d'Orsay, the French equivalent of central intelligence, and so wielded enormous power both inside and outside France. Rabinet had assured Peter that he'd extend Soraya every courtesy in cutting through the Gordian knot of French red tape. The two cars were slowing as they approached East Capitol Street. They passed Second Street southeast and stopped in front of the Folger Shakespeare Library, one of the capital's more remarkable institutions. Henry Clay Folger had been chairman of Standard Oil, now ExxonMobil. He was cut from the same cloth as the great industrial robber barons John D. Rockefeller, J.P. Morgan, and Henry E. Huntington. 
However, Folger spent much of his later years amassing a staggering collection of first folios of Shakespeare's plays. In addition, the library housed, in the original edition or facsimile, every important volume on Shakespeare from the invention of the printing press to the end of the 17th century, including a copy of every book on history, mythology, and travel that had been available to the playwright. In fact, the library possessed 55% of all known books printed in the English language before 1640. But the crown jewels of the collection were the first folios, the sole textual source of over half of Shakespeare's plays. As Peter watched Hendricks emerge from his bulletproof car, he wondered what the secretary was doing at the Folger. It wasn't as if he'd come to write a dissertation on Shakespeare or the England of the Tudors and the Stuarts. Even more intriguing, none of his bodyguards accompanied Hendricks up the steps and into the building. Checking his watch, Peter saw that it was after four, which meant that the building was closed to the public for the day. Peter was familiar with the premises. There was a side entrance used by the staff, and on occasion, the flock of scholars and fellows who were, at any given time, in residence. He drove around the block, parked, and approached the side door, which was discreetly tucked away behind a line of sheared boxwood. Thick and solid, the door was made of stout oak, studded with old-world bronze round-head nails. It reminded Peter of the door to a medieval castle keep. He drew a pick out of his inside pocket. He'd carried a couple of these, which he'd filed himself, ever since he got locked out of his apartment five years ago. Within thirty seconds, he was inside, moving down a dimly lit corridor that smelled of filtered air and old books. The odor was both pleasant and familiar bringing back days in his youth when he'd haunted used bookstores for hours at a time, scanning titles, reading chapters, or even, sometimes, entire sections. Sometimes it was enough just feeling the heft of a volume in his hands, imagining his older self amid a library he himself had amassed. He kept an eye out for the residents or security, but saw no one. He moved through rooms filled with books and glass-fronted cases, crisscrossed by security wires, down more corridors, wood-paneled and hushed. Gradually, he became aware of the murmur of voices and turned in that direction. As he moved closer, he recognized one of the voices, Hendricks. The other speaker was also male, his voice pitched slightly higher. As he approached closer still, it struck him as being naggingly familiar. The pitch, the cadence, the long-winded sentences without pauses for punctuation. And then, when he had crossed the room, the voices were so clear he was certain they came from the open doorway to the next room. A particular turn of phrase caused him to freeze. The man Hendricks was talking with was M. Errol Danziger, the vampiric current head of C.I. He had sacked Soraya, one of the reasons Peter had quit. He'd seen her demise at C.I. coming. And now Danziger was in the process of dismantling the proud organization the old man had built from the scraps left to him by those who had remodeled the wartime OSS. Peter stole closer to the open doorway. If Hendricks is cooking up a deal with Danziger, he thought, it's no wonder he doesn't want us to know about it. He could hear them clearly now. Are you? Hendricks's voice. I couldn't say, Danziger replied. You mean you won't? A deep sigh, probably from the director of CI. I don't understand the need for this high school level cloak and dagger. Why meet here? My office? We weren't ever going to meet in your office, Hendricks said, for precisely the same reason you weren't invited to the meeting in the Oval Office. This was followed by what Peter could only characterize as a deathly silence. What is it you want from me, Mr. Secretary? Danziger's voice was so drained of emotion it might be called robotic. Cooperation, Hendricks said. It's what we all want, and by we, I mean the president. In the matter of Samaritan, I am his voice. Is that understood? Completely, Danziger said. But even at his close remove, Peter could hear the venom in that one word. Good, Hendricks said. Whether he had noted the bitterness in the director's voice or he'd chosen to ignore it was impossible for Peter to say. Because I won't be saying any of this twice. There was a soft rustling. Samaritan is on the strictest need-to-know basis. That means even the people you choose won't know about it until they arrive at Indigo Ridge. Samaritan is the president's number one priority. 
which means that from this moment forward, it's our number one priority. Here are your orders. Have your people rendezvous with the others at Indigo Ridge 48 hours from now. 48 hours? Danziger echoed. How do you expect? I mean, for God's sake, look at this list. What you're asking is impossible to mobilize in that time frame. Directors are trained to accomplish the impossible. Hendrix's implied threat was clear enough. That will be all, Mr. Danziger. Peter heard first one set of footsteps echoing on the polished floorboards, then, some moments later, another. Both faded away into the distance. Peter leaned back against the wall. Samaritan. Indigo Ridge. Two clues he would have to follow. Samaritan is the president's number one priority, he thought. Why did Hendricks agree to let Soraya go to Paris? Why didn't he involve us in Samaritan? These were questions Peter knew he had to answer, and the sooner, the better. He had an urge to text Soraya, briefing her on what he had just learned and asking her to come back to Washington, but his trust in her stayed his hand. If she thought this death was important enough to investigate personally, that was good enough for him. He'd learned that her instincts were impeccable. Then his mind turned to happier thoughts. It looked like Danziger was standing at the precipice. Peter felt elated, especially because he had been given inside knowledge. Anything he could do to sabotage Danziger's part in Samaritan, whatever that was, would be a giant step in destroying his career and getting him out of C.I. Off with his head. Peter's silent shout pinballed around his mind, gaining energy with each successive carom. Having dropped his sigh off at the airport, Bourne stopped at a cantina on the western outskirts of Paralis. He was hungry, but he also needed time to think. The place was fly-blown, with walls somewhere between mustard and adobe. The fluorescent lighting had a tick, and the heartbeat of the ancient ice drink cooler against one wall sounded erratic. There were two waiters, both young men, thin and harried. While scanning the paper menu, he noted faces, expressions, and the angles of repose of the other patrons old men with skin like tanned hides reading the local paper, drinking coffee, talking politics, or playing chess. An exhausted-looking prostitute passed her prime, and a farmer practically inhaling an enormous plate of food. A person on surveillance never held his body in the same way as a civilian. There was always a certain telltale tension in the back, neck, or shoulders. He also studied everyone who came in or out. Finding nothing out of the ordinary, he ordered a drink and bandeja paisa with a side of arepas. When the agua panela, sugarcane sweetened water with a muddle of fresh lime, came, he drank half of it at once, then settled back. There is a spare sat phone in the glove box, charged and ready to go, Isai had said. Also a detailed map of the area. A bagway is clearly marked, as is the oil field Vegas runs. That much he could buy but his sigh had made a mistake when he'd added, You'll find my set number pre-programmed into it. It was entirely possible, even prudent, for his sigh to have a spare sat phone, and the map was a no-brainer. But the fact that he had pre-programmed his sat phone number into it indicated to Bourne that it wasn't a spare at all. Bourne asked himself whether it was possible that his sigh had known he had been sent to find and kill Correos. Maybe Correos himself had told him, but if so... It would have been long after Asai could have bought a second sat phone. All of this meant that it was likely Asai was lying when he said he no longer had a way to ferret out intel from the Domna. If so, then he had a man inside the group, someone who was loyal to him. Bourne had never been completely sold on Asai's earnestness, but he didn't for an instant doubt his desire to destroy Severus Domna. In this one matter, he and Asai were aligned, they needed each other. They also needed to trust each other, but the trust was compromised because it pertained solely to the matter of the Domna's demise. After that, all bets were off. The food arrived, fragrant and steaming. Born, suddenly ravenous, dug in, using the arepas to soak up the sauce as a combination fork and spoon. As he ate, his thoughts continued. Then there was the matter of the Domna enlisting Boris to kill him. The story was so outrageous he had been inclined to dismiss it out of hand. Until, that is, Asai had described the trap Benjamin L. Arion had laid for his friend. 
He knew Boris wanted to be the head of FSB2 more than anything. In a sense, he dedicated his entire adult life to that end. If he had been given the choice between his heart's desire and protecting Bourne, what would he do? Bourne was shaken by the knowledge that he didn't know. Boris was a friend, true, and he had saved Boris's life in the temporary war zone of northeastern Iran. But Boris was a Russian through and through. His ethos was different, which made predicting his choices difficult, if not impossible. The thought that, even at this moment, Boris might be hunting him, sent a chill through him that could not be dispelled by Paralysis' blazing heat. He pulled out the sat phone from his size car and, placing it on the table, stared at it for a time. He resisted the urge to call Boris and ask him outright what had happened and where he stood. That would be an unforgivable mistake. If Boris was innocent, he'd be mortally offended. In fact, now that Bourne considered it, he'd act mortally offended even if he was guilty. Plus, if Isai was telling the truth, Boris would have been given a warning and Bourne would lose a vital advantage. He swept the sat phone off the table as if it were a chess piece. No, he thought. The best thing he could do was to go forward one step at a time into the dark. He was used to that. He had burst from the darkness of an unknown life into this shadow world where everything in front of him was black as night. There was a pain inside him, the agony of unknowing, that he had lived with so long he often forgot it was there. And yet every now and again it rushed back at him with the power of an express train. Nothing in his past was real. Nothing he had once done or accomplished, nothing he had felt, no one he had known or cared about. All had been obliterated by his fall into the void. He kept looking for the things that were now impossible to find. The occasional shards that came back to him from time to time only increased his sense of isolation and helplessness. Often they were disturbing in their own right. At once he saw again the woman in the stall of the Nordic Disco the sheen of sweat on her face, the sardonic smile, the muzzle of the handgun she aimed at him. What make and model was it? He strained to remember, but all he could see was her face, devoid of fear or even resignation. He felt the fur collar against his cheeks. Her mouth had opened, those red lips parting. She had said something to him in the moment before he had killed her. What was it? What had she said? He had the impression that it was somehow important, though he was at a loss to say why. And then the memory slithered away from him, back into the blackness of a past that felt as if it belonged to someone else. To lose everything, your very life, was an unspeakable agony. He was wandering in an unknown land. The stars overhead were arrayed in unfamiliar constellations, and the sun never rose. He was alone, the impenetrable darkness ahead, his sole companion. The darkness, and of course, the pain. Chapter 6 Soraya arrived in Paris early on a gray, rain-washed morning. She didn't mind. Paris was one of the only cities she loved in the rain. The slick surfaces, the melancholy mood mysteriously heightened the beauty and romance of the city, the modern-day crust sluiced away, revealing the facades of history, turning like the pages of a book. Besides, hours from now she would be seeing a moon. In the first-class lounge, she showered and changed into fresh clothes, then spent fifteen minutes applying makeup while she drank a cup of awful coffee and ate a croissant that tasted prepackaged. She rarely wore makeup other than a neutral lipstick, but she wanted to make an impression on Jacques Rabanet whom she was also meeting today. However, it wasn't the Minister of Culture who met her outside of security, but a man who introduced himself as Aaron Lipkin René. His credentials identified him as an inspector with the Quai d'Orsay. He was tall, reed thin, with one of those unmistakable Gallic noses that rode before him like the prow of a pirate ship. He wore his hand-tailored suit as only the French can. A gentleman, she thought, because he offered his hand to her and bent low over it. The secretary sends his apologies, he said in a softly slurred English. But a meeting at the Elysee Palace kept him from meeting you himself. The Elysee Palace was the residence and office of the French president. It was where the Council of Ministers met. He offered a self-deprecating smile. I'm afraid you'll have to settle for me. 
Je ne crains pas le moins du monde, she replied with a perfect Parisian accent. I don't mind in the least. Aaron's long, horsey face broke into a huge grin. Eh bien, maintenant tout devient clair. Ah well, now everything becomes clear. He took her carry-on from her, and as they walked together through the arrivals hall, Soraya had a chance to study him in more detail. She judged him to be in his mid-thirties, fit for a Frenchman. Though she wouldn't call him handsome, there was nevertheless something appealing about him, a certain boyishness in his gray eyes and informal manner that countered strongly the inevitable crusty cynicism built up by intelligence work. She thought they would get along. Outside, the rain had become a gentle mist. The sky seemed to want to pull apart its gauzy layers. It was exceptionally mild. A light breeze ruffled her hair. Aaron led her to a dark Peugeot waiting at the curb. When the driver saw them, he got out of the car, took Soraya's carry-on from his boss, and stowed it in the trunk. Aaron opened the rear door for her, and she climbed in. As soon as he was settled in beside her, they pulled away from the curb and threaded their way out of the airport. Monsieur Rabenet has booked you into the Astor Saint-Honoré. It's centrally located and is close to the Elysee Palace. Would you like to go there first and freshen up? Thank you, no, Soraya said. I'd like to view Laurent's body and then see the forensics report. He took a file out of the pocket in the driver's seat back and handed it to her. You're half Egyptian, aren't you? Is that a problem? She looked into his gray eyes, searching for a sign of prejudice. Not for me, is it for you? Not at all. She smoothed her hackles back down. Now she understood. Aaron was Jewish. With the recent huge influx of Muslims, Jews were having a harder time in France, especially Paris. Jewish children were being particularly targeted in schools. Almost every day, there was a report of a Jewish child being beaten by a gang of Muslim children. She'd recently read an alarming report that many Jewish families were leaving France altogether because increasingly they found the charged atmosphere unsafe for their children. He smiled at her, and she could very clearly see herself in him. The Semitic heritage that Arabs and Jews shared, but tragically, could not bear to contemplate. She smiled back and hoped that he saw the same. Then she opened the file and looked through the pages. There were several photos of Laurent taken by the forensics team in situ. It was not a pretty sight. She sucked in her breath. It looks to me as if the car struck him, then ran him over. Aaron nodded. Yes, it would seem so. There's no other way to explain the two sets of injuries, the first to his sternum and ribcage, the second to his head. They couldn't have been made in one strike. No, he confirmed. A coroner says definitely not. He tapped one of the photos. Someone hated this man very much. Or didn't want him to talk. Aaron gave her a sharp look. Ah, the light dawns. So, that is your interest in this murder. It has international implications. I'm not saying a word. You don't have to that boyish grin again. Soraya was appalled. Was she flirting with him? They drove onto the peripherie, the boulevard that girdled the city, and entered Paris via the Porte de Bercy. The moment the Peugeot hit the streets, Soraya felt the welcoming warmth of the city. The familiar streets seemed to beckon to her, smiling. Soraya tore her gaze away from the old mansard-roofed buildings and returned to her reading. The body exhibited no marks other than those consistent with being run over. His blood work was still being parsed, but the preliminary results noted no elevated alcohol levels or noticeable foreign substances. She returned to the photos, looking more closely at the ones that showed an overall view of the crime scene. She pointed to a small, vaguely oblong-shaped blob in the lower right-hand corner of photo number three. What's this? Cell phone, Aaron said. We think it belonged to the victim, but the damage to it made it impossible to manually access the phone book. What about the SIM card? Bent and creased, Aaron said. But I took it myself to our best IT technician. He's working on getting the information out of it. Soraya thought a moment. Change of plan. Take me to the tech. Then I want to see where the murder took place. 
Aaron took out his cell, punched in a number, then spoke softly for several seconds. The tech needs more time, he said when he folded away his phone. He's found something? He won't say for certain, but I know this man. Best to give him the time he needs. All right. Soraya nodded reluctantly. Then let's go to the murder scene. As you wish, mademoiselle. She grimaced. Call me Soraya, please. Only if you call me Ellen. It's a deal. Documentos de identidad, por favor. Bourne handed over his passport to the armed soldier. The man stared hard at Bourne while he flipped the passport open. This was the second roadblock Bourne had encountered. The Revolutionary Armed Forces of Colombia had been extremely active in the past six months, much to the vexation of the country's president. And then had come the invasion of La Modelo prison that had led to Roberto Correos's escape. In a fit of pique, El Presidente had begun flexing his military muscle. Bourne was sure the Federales were looking to summarily execute any FARC rebels they came across. The soldier handed back Bourne's passport and, without a word, waved him through. Bourne put the car in gear and set off after the caravan of semis in front of him. He'd been on the road several hours and was now high in the mountains. Ibagwe lay along the National Route 40 that connected Bogota with Cali, then continued to the Pacific coast. It was on a plateau 4,200 feet above sea level on the eastern slopes of the Cordillera Central, the central range of the Andes Mountains. The highway snaked back and forth in perilous switchbacks. Narrow shoulders plunged down hundreds of feet into needle-pointed pine forests or the remains of gigantic rock slides. Now and again, he spotted great charred slashes in the pines, evidence of lightning strikes. The sky was enormous, a kaleidoscope of swiftly moving cloud formations and dazzling sunlight. The elevation and the southern hemisphere sun combined to lend everything an astonishing clarity, knife-edged and vivid. Above him, the black crosses of condors wheeled and banked in the high thermals. According to Halali Sai, he would soon come to La Linea, the longest tunnel in Latin America. It cut through the mountain known as Alta de la Linea and was meant to ease the traffic on the truck-clogged highway to the Pacific port of Buenaventura. The tunnel was so new it wasn't on his map, which lay open on the seat beside him. As Asai had warned, there was no cell service here, and his sat phone had no GPS function. The traffic was heavy, the caravans of semis moving at identical speed, rolling around a long curve, following the contour of the mountain. And then, viewed at the apex of the bend, the mouth of La Linea gaped, a black hole into which the snaking traffic disappeared and on the eastbound side reappeared. Born headed into the tunnel, a long, sleek tube that bored straight through the mountain. It was lit on either side with strings of argon lights whose cool, bluish light spun off the hoods of oncoming vehicles. The traffic slowed, as was normal in tunnels, but the progress was steady. He passed the three-quarters mark and was beginning to see a glimmering of daylight in the distance when the line of trucks abruptly slowed. A sea of glowing ruby brake lights appeared and traffic came to a standstill. Had there been an accident? Was there another roadblock? Bourne strained in his seat, craning his neck. There were no flashing lights, no sign of the telltale sawhorses the military used to block the highway. He slipped out of the car. A moment later, he saw a group of men threading their way between the lanes of vehicles coming toward him. They were heavily armed with submachine guns, but they weren't wearing the uniforms of the Colombian army. A cadre of FARC insurgents had stopped the traffic. Why? He saw the leader now, a broad-shouldered man with a full beard and coffee-colored eyes even the lurid glow thrown by the argon lights couldn't wash out. One man stopped at each vehicle, holding up a faxed photo to show the driver while the others checked out the car's back seat and trunk. The trucks took longer, as the soldiers compelled the drivers, often at gunpoint, to open the back so they could inspect the contents. Bourne cautiously walked closer, passing other drivers who had climbed down from their cabs and were talking nervously among themselves. All at once, he saw the fax sheet clearly. He was staring at himself. The rebels were looking for him. No time to wonder why. 
Turning on his heel, he walked back to his car and rummaged through the glove box, which offered up a screwdriver and a wrench, both useful weapons. Retreating on foot, he ducked down, slid underneath a semi, crawling backward. Three vehicles behind him, he came out at the rear of an open-bed truck. Grabbing onto the nylon cords that tied down a canvas cover, he swung up onto the rear. From that vantage point, he saw more Fark soldiers approaching from the rear. Ahead or behind, there was no exit. Untying a section of canvas, he dropped down into the truck bed. The hemp sacks were stamped with the name of a well-known plantation. He used the screwdriver to rip open a corner. The truck was transporting green coffee beans. Leaving the items he'd taken from his car, he reemerged onto the canvas and took a cautious look ahead. The Fark rebels were making headway. They were almost at his car. Once they saw that it was empty, they'd know their prey was somewhere close at hand. He needed to be on his way before then. Stealing down to the tarmac of the highway, he crept along the side of the open bed truck. The driver was standing against the side of the semi in front, talking nervously with another man, probably the driver of the semi or his relief. The door to the cab was open, and Bourne slithered in. As Bourne watched, the driver took out a pack of cigarettes, shook one out, and put it between his lips. He dug in his pocket for a light, but couldn't find one. He turned around and began to walk back toward the cab of his truck. Born froze. Aaron stood in the street on Place de la Rue. This is where Monsieur Laurent was hit, he said. Anything on the car that hit him? Not much. The eyewitnesses disagree on the manufacturer, BMW, Fiat, Citroën. None of those cars look alike. Eyewitnesses, he lamented. But we did get black paint off the victim. Soraya was studying the roadbed. Not much help there, either. Aaron crouched down beside her. The same eyewitnesses claimed he had just stepped off the sidewalk. He stepped out into traffic without looking? Soraya looked doubtful. Aaron shrugged. He might have been distracted. Maybe someone called to him. Maybe he remembered he had to pick up the dry cleaning. He shrugged in that totally gallic manner. Who knows? Someone knows, she said, the person who killed him. Something occurred to her, and she stood suddenly. Where was his cell phone found? Aaron showed her, and she went back onto the sidewalk several paces. Now, when I step down into the street, run into me. What? You heard me, she said a bit impatiently. Just do it. She took out her phone and put it to her ear then walked at a brisk pace to the edge of the curb and down onto the street, whereupon Aaron, running, hit her. Her right arm flew diagonally out, and if she had not held on to it, her phone would have hit the street more or less where they found Laurence. A slow smile spread across her face. He was talking on his cell when he was hit. So what? Business people are on their cell phones constantly. Aaron appeared unimpressed. It was a coincidence. Maybe it was, Soraya said. Maybe it wasn't. She turned toward his car. Let's talk to your tech and see if he managed to pull anything from the phone or its SIM card. As they were walking back to Aaron's car, she stopped and turned around. She looked at the building directly across the sidewalk from where the hit and run took place. Her gaze rose up the gleaming green glass and stainless steel facade. What building is this? she asked. Aaron squinted up through the noonday gloom. Is the Ile de France bank building. Why? It's possible that's where Laurent was coming from. I don't see why, Aaron said, checking his notes. The victim worked for the munition club. Another fact Soraya hadn't known about her would-be informant. It's an archaeological society with offices here, Washington, D.C., Cairo, and Riyadh. When you say here, you mean La Défense? No. The 8th arrondissement at 5 Rue Vanet. So what the hell was he doing here, getting a loan? The munition club is quite wealthy, Aaron said, again consulting his notes. In any event, I checked with Ile de France. He had no appointment with anyone at the bank. He wasn't a client, and they never heard of him. So why was he here on a busy workday morning? Aaron spread his hands. My men are still trying to find out. 
Maybe he had a friend there. Have you talked to his associates at the munition club? No one knows much about him. He kept to himself, apparently. He reported directly to his superior, so no one could tell me what he was doing at La Defense. Laurent's superior is out of town until tonight. I have an appointment to interview him tomorrow morning. Soraya turned to him. You've been very thorough. Thank you. The inspector couldn't hide his smile. Soraya walked to his car, but before she got in, she took one last look at the Ile de France building. There was something about it that both drew and repelled her. The semi's driver called to his pal, and the man turned and went back to where the other driver waved a book of wooden matches. The open bed driver leaned forward, while the other one struck the match and held the flame to the end of his cigarette. He reared back, pulling the smoke deep into his lungs. The semi's driver checked nervously over his shoulder, measuring the FARC's progress. Bourne quickly checked the seat and the glove box. Nothing. Then, in the well of the passenger's side, he saw a cheap plastic lighter. It must have fallen out of the driver's pocket as he was getting out. He grabbed it. He slithered out of the truck's cab and went farther down the line until he encountered a knot of drivers. Hombre, ¿sabe usted lo que está pasando? One of them asked. Do you know what's going on? Far gorillas, Bourne said, which got them even more agitated. Ay de mí, another cried. Escúchame, Bourne said. Does anyone have a jerry can of gasoline? My truck is dry. If the rebels order me to move and I can't, they'll shoot me dead. The men nodded their agreement with this grim assessment, and one of them ran off. A moment later, he returned and handed Bourne the jerry can. Bourne thanked him profusely and departed. When he was sure no one was watching him, he climbed up onto the canvas of the coffee truck and disappeared back underneath. Inside, he used the screwdriver to puncture the jerry can near the bottom, so the gasoline slowly leaked out over a couple of the sacks. Then he lit it. The result was a whoosh of flames, followed by a cloud of thick smoke so acrid it was choking. Bourne, holding his breath, got out of there before more gas leaked out and the conflagration spread. His eyes were already watering. The smoke billowed up through the hole in the canvas. Bourne climbed down just as the canvas itself caught fire. Flames licked upward, and now the smoke billowed in earnest as the rest of the hemp sack started to burn. The smoke quickly reached the tunnel's arched ceiling, and boiling spread horizontally. It took only moments for visibility in that part of the tunnel to erode severely. People started coughing and wheezing, their eyes tearing so badly they couldn't see. Shouts went up from the soldiers in the forefront. Then the basso voice of the commander bellowed through, calling for his men to retreat. But the smoke was too thick, and the soldiers were bent over, gasping. Bourne sprinted through this chaos, shoving aside soldiers and drivers alike. The wrench was gripped in his right hand. A FARC rebel loomed out of the smoke, abruptly blocking his path with both his body and his submachine gun. Bourne slammed him across the cheek with a wrench, kicked him in the groin, and as the rebel doubled over, slid past him. Another was on him almost immediately. Bourne could see the commander. He had no time to waste. Absorbing two punishing body blows, he drove home the screwdriver between two ribs, and the rebel went down. Bourne came up on the commander from a different lane. Sliding across the hood of a vehicle, he grabbed the man, disarmed him, and, jerking him hard, pulled him, stumbling toward the light at the far end of the tunnel. The commander was gasping and trying to spit out the smoke. His red-rimmed eyes continued to brim with tears, which rolled down his pockmarked cheeks. He struck out blindly. He was very strong. It took a knife-edged blow of Bourne's hand to his throat to subdue him. Bourne pulled him along as fast as he could, ignoring the commander's choked curses. He was beyond the perimeter of the advancing rebels. Up ahead, he could make out the jerry-rigged blockade of FARC vehicles. Four jeeps and a flatbed truck FARC was using for provisions, weapons, and ammo transport. Two drivers who had been smoking had grabbed their pistols and were now aiming the weapons at Bourne. Then they saw their commander, his own Makarov, pressed into the side of his head. Panga sus armas hacia abajo! Bourne shouted as he drove the commander forward. When they hesitated, he slammed the barrel into the soft spot behind the commander's right ear. Blood spurted and the commander cried out. The rebels put their pistols down on the hood of the flatbed truck. 
Ahora se alejan de los jeeps. Haz lo que dice, the commander shouted through a fit of coughing. The men backed away from the jeeps. Bourne shoved the commander forward into one and climbed in beside him. A rebel lunged for his pistol and Bourne shot him in the shoulder. As he spun away and fell to the ground, Bourne said, Tu turno. Your turn? The other rebel raised his hands and did not budge. Si vienen después de nosotros. Bourne called back to the men as he started the vehicle and put it into gear. Lo mato. If you come after us, I'll kill him. He stepped on the accelerator and they sped away from the smoking tunnel. Chapter 7 The moment Peter got back to Treadstone HQ, he fired up his computer, logged in his code name using the algorithm of the day, and scoured all the clandestine services databases for the word Samaritan. He wasn't surprised to receive a null finding. He sat staring at the blank screen for a moment, then typed in Indigo Ridge. This time, he got an immediate hit. He read the government assessment with mounting fascination. Indigo Ridge, an area in California, was ground zero for the mining of rare earths. Rare earths, he read, were essential for rechargeable nickel hydride batteries, something he used every day but never gave a thought to. The real name was lanthanum nickel hydride, a rare earth. Rare earths were used in every laser as well as in electronic warfare, jamming devices, the electromagnetic railgun, the long-range acoustic device, and the area denial system used on the striker vehicle. The list of cutting-edge weapons needing rare earths was staggering. The next paragraphs dealt with Neodyme, the company created to mine the rare earths at Indigo Ridge. Neodyme had just gone public, but it had the backing of the U.S. government. Peter immediately understood the strategic importance of Neodyme and Indigo Ridge. In that event, Samaritan was linked in some way with a rare earth mine. But what was its purpose? Peter got up and stretched. He waved away Anne, his secretary, as he emerged from his office, went over to get himself some coffee and a stale donut. He stirred sugar and half and half into his mug, took it and the donut back into his office to have a think. Ever since he could remember, sugar had been a great stimulator of creative thinking for him. As he chomped down on the donut, he thought about the meeting between Hendricks and Danziger, and then the thought came. What if Samaritan was an interagency initiative? That would make it huge indeed. And again, Peter felt the sharp pang of being left out. If Hendricks didn't trust him, then why did he want Peter heading up Treadstone? It made no sense to him. Peter didn't like mysteries, especially when they cropped up in his territory. And then he thought of something else that made him sit up straight. In trying to find out about Samaritan, he'd been able to access all the clandestine services databases. Hendricks had told him that, almost as an aside. Odd, considering, so far as Peter was aware, it was an unprecedented coup. The various services were notoriously zealous in guarding their own data, even after the well-publicized revamping following 9-11. Being on the inside, Peter knew that plan was for PR purposes because the American public had to be calmed and soothed. The fact remained that when it came to interagency intel sharing, nothing much had changed. The clandestine services community was still a feudal nightmare of separate fiefdoms, lorded over by political-minded mandarins jockeying for congressional funding while desperately staving off budget cuts and staff downsizing forced by the current economic climate. Dusting off his fingertips, he took a swig of coffee and dived back into the top-secret soup he had at his fingertips, courtesy of his boss. At some point, he wondered whether Hendricks had had an ulterior motive in getting this access for Treadstone. He couldn't help but wonder why Hendricks had told him about it in such an offhand manner. He was trained in suspicion, to see ulterior motives, to peer into the dim interiors of what people said and did. Had Hendricks been giving him a subtle clue to hunt around the database soup? But for what? What if it had to do with Hendricks himself? He navigated to Hendricks' own computer and sat there for a moment, staring at the blinking box that asked for a security code. He thought about words that his boss might use. Sitting back, he closed his eyes, pondering the briefing at Hendricks' house this morning. He went over everything that had been said, every move the secretary had made. Then he recalled Hendricks's curious parting line. Oh, by the way, I've been able to get Treadstone access to all the clandestine services databases. 
He frowned. No, that wasn't quite it. His frown deepened as he struggled to recall the secretary's exact phrasing. Excuse me, director? He looked up to see Anne standing in the doorway. What is it? He snapped. She flinched. She was not yet used to her boss's moods. I'm sorry to bother you, but there's a problem at school with my son, and I need a couple of hours off. Of course, he said, waving at her vaguely. Go on. His mind had already returned to its original train of thought. Anne was about to leave when she turned back. Oh, I almost forgot. Before she left, Director Moore asked for an additional server to be added to her. She asked for what? Peter had swiveled toward her and was half out of his seat. She turned pale, clearly scared half to death. Through his mounting excitement, he recognized this and willed his voice to modulate more normally. Anne, did you say that Soraya asked for another server? Yes, it's going to be installed tonight, so on the off chance you're going to be working late. Thank you, Anne. He forced himself to smile at her. As for your son, take as much time as you need. Thank you, Director. Slightly bewildered, she turned, grabbed her coat and handbag, and left. Peter, turning back to his computer screen, thought long and hard about Hendrix's precise words. Then he had it. Oh, by the way, I've been able to get the Treadstone server's access to all the clandestine services' databases. Servers. Peter's eyes flew open. Why on earth had he said that when the servers had nothing to do with access? The Treadstone servers were where its own data was stored. He stared at the blinking box in the middle of the screen, asking its mysterious question. Jesus Christ, he thought. Could it be that simple? His fingers trembling slightly, he typed in the word, Servers. At once, the box was replaced by a file tree. Peter stared in disbelief. He was inside Hendrix's computer. The secretary wanted him there. He was absolutely certain of that. He delivered a coded message to Peter. Why hadn't he been able to tell Peter outright? Peter's first thought was that Hendrix was afraid his house was bugged, but he immediately dismissed the thought. The secretary's house and offices were electronically swept twice a week, so Hendrix was afraid of something else. Was it someone on the inside? One of his own people? Peter stared at the screen. He had a sense that he would find the answer somewhere within the secretary's file tree. Leaning forward, he got to work with a feverish intensity. This is utter madness, the fart commander said as Bourne hurtled the stolen jeep down National 40. How did you know I was in the tunnel, Bourne said. You will be followed to the ends of the earth. His name was Suarez. He hadn't been reticent about telling Bourne his name or the ways in which he was certain Bourne would die. Bourne smiled. There isn't one of your men who could get out of Colombia. Suarez laughed, even though it caused him some pain in the area behind his right ear. Do you think FARC is my only affiliation? Bourne glanced at him, and that was when he saw the gold ring, gleaming on the thick forefinger of his right hand. You're a member of Severus Domna. And you are a dead man, the commander said flatly. All at once he grabbed at the wheel. Bourne smashed the barrel of his Makarov down on the back of his hand, and Suarez bellowed like a maddened bull. He snatched his hand away, cradling it with the other. Fuck! 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 he cried. You've broken it! Relax. Bourne hummed to himself as they rocketed along. He deftly moved the jeep around lumbering semis and laden flatbeds. Suarez, rocking back and forth in pain, said, What the hell are you so happy about, Maricon? For some time, Bourne occupied himself by flying past vehicles. Then he said, I know how you knew where I was. No, Suarez said. You don't. Someone at the last roadblock before the tunnel made me and radioed you. Someone also with a Domna. This is true, but I am not following orders. Your debt is a gift to a friend of mine, an enemy of yours. He was way-faced, the pain causing beads of sweat to break out at his hairline. He stared fixedly ahead until his gaze strayed to the side mirror. A smile flickered across his lips, and in the space of a heartbeat, was gone. 
Born, who had been checking the rearview mirror every minute or so, saw the two motorcycles flicking in and out of the traffic behind him. Roberto Correos has expended a lot of capital with us to have you killed. So Correos was taking revenge for Born having lost him face in front of his men. Now they were mortal enemies. You'd better buckle up, Born said. He waited for the motorcycles to break three of the other vehicles behind him. Then he accelerated. Putting on speed, they closed the distance between them. At the moment of their maximum acceleration, Bourne trod on the brakes so hard that the jeep laid a layer of rubber onto the macadam of the highway. The vehicle swerved violently from side to side as he threw it into neutral, its transmission traveling down through the gears as its tires fought to grip the road. The motorcycles shot past him and then, swerving mightily, braked, turning in a wide circle. Bourne forced the transmission back up the ladder and stomped on the accelerator. The jeep shot forward, slamming grill first into the right-hand motorcycle, catching it broadside, throwing it completely off the highway. Suarez's forehead nearly went through the windshield. The motorcycle skidded wildly, the cyclist trying desperately to regain control as he skated across the width of the macadam. An instant later, it crossed the narrow shoulder and disappeared over the mountainside. A gunshot spiderwebbed the jeep's windshield, and Bourne threw the vehicle into reverse, spun it around until it was headed directly at the second motorcycle. The biker was taking aim again with his handgun. The cycle was between the jeep and the mountainside with its vertiginous drop of hundreds of feet. Owing to the FARC roadblock, the oncoming traffic had been at a standstill. Now, motorists were scrambling to get away from the chaos. Bourne drove directly at the cyclist, whose pistol was aimed right at him. Dios mio, what the hell are you doing? Suarez shouted. You're going to get us both killed. If that's what it takes, Bourne said. The reports about you are true, the commander stared at him. You're insane. The motorcyclist must have thought so as well, because after firing wildly, he took off in a spray of gravel. Breaking, Bourne extended his left arm and squeezed off a shot. The motorcyclist's arms flew outward as he was launched off the cycle seat. It slammed into a stalled car, which slewed into the truck in front of it. Bourne took off down the highway, which, owing to both the FARC blockade and the fire in the tunnel, was now entirely deserted. Chapter 8 30,000 feet in the air. Boris Karpov sat in the jetliner and watched the dove-gray clouds scroll past the Perspex window. As always, he had mixed feelings about leaving Russia. A Russian, he mused, was never truly comfortable outside the motherland. This was to be expected. The Russian people were special. Extraordinary, really, once you took into account the terrible history they'd had to endure first under the Tsars, the Cossacks, then Stalin and Beria. A darkness constantly stalking his beautiful country. Altruism was not a well-known quality in the Russian mindset. Deprivation had made self-preservation the primary motivating factor for so long, it was now hardwired into the Russian psyche. But in this respect, Boris was different from his fellows. His love of Russia motivated him to want a better life, not just for himself, but for those people who were continually looking up at a light they could never attain. The first-class cabin attendant asked if he had everything he needed. We're baking chocolate chip cookies she said, bending over him with a smile. She was blonde and blue-eyed, Nordic, he surmised, and had a slight accent. You can have them with milk, chocolate milk, coffee, tea, or any of a dozen liquors. Cookies and milk, Karpov thought with a wry smile. How all-American. The classic, he said, making the attendant laugh softly. Mr. Stonyfield, you Americans she said affectionately, using Karpov's legend name. And with a hushed whoosh of fabric against pantyhose, she returned up the aisle. Karpov sank back into his ruminations. Of course Americans were born into the light, so they were used to looking down on everyone else. But what else could you expect from such a privileged people? Karpov did not know what to make of being mistaken for one of them. He waited for the reaction to come, and when it did, he realized that he was somehow humiliated as if he were a country hick who had by some miracle been momentarily mistaken for a Yale graduate. 
The attendant's error had diminished him in some way he couldn't quite grasp, holding up to him the mirror of everything he had lacked from the moment he'd been born. His parents had had little time for him, being locked in grim and silent combat to determine who could have the most affairs during the course of their marriage. There was never any thought of divorce. That would negate the rules of the game. Consequently, they scarcely noticed when Karpov's sister, Alex, died of an uncontrollable brain fever. Karpov had taken care of her, nursing her through her terrible and debilitating illness, first after school, then cutting school entirely to be with her. When she was transferred to the hospital, he went with her. He formed the impression that his parents were relieved to have both the children out of the house. So gloomy, his mother would mutter as she made breakfast. So damn gloomy. But most mornings she failed to appear. Karpov sensed that she had never come home during the night. I can't stand it, was all his father could manage the mornings he did appear. He couldn't look at Alex, much less go into her room. What's the point? He responded to Karpov's question one morning. She doesn't know I'm there. On the contrary, Karpov knew that Alex knew when someone was with her. She often squeezed his hand as he sat beside the bed. He read stories to her from books he'd bought. Other times, he read aloud the lessons from school books he deemed important enough to learn. Because of these sessions with his sister, he discovered a love of history. What he loved best was to read to her about various periods in Russia's storied past, though admittedly some were depressing, awfully difficult to digest. Karpov was at her bedside at the hospital when she died. After the doctor's pronouncement, a suffocating silence engulfed the room. It was as if everything in the world had stopped, even his heart. His chest felt as if at any instant it would cave in. The smell of antiseptic made him want to gag. He bent over Alex's waxen face and kissed her cool forehead. There was absolutely no outward evidence of the massive and brutal war that had gone on inside her brain. Is there anything I can do? The attending nurse had said when he exited the room. He shook his head. His chest was too congested with emotion to allow for speech. Echoes followed him down the linoleum-lined corridors, the pain-filled, inarticulate noises of the sick and the dying. Outside, the glowing Moscow twilight was filled with snow. People walked this way and that, chatting, smoking, even laughing. A young man and woman, their heads together as they whispered to each other, crossed the street. A mother pulled her little boy along, singing softly to him. Karpov observed these everyday occurrences as a prisoner will the sky in passing clouds outside his tiny, barred window. These things no longer belonged to him. He was cut off from them like a diseased limb cleaved from a tree. There was a hole in Karpov's heart where Alex had resided for so long. The tears came, and as he walked aimlessly, watching the snow pile up, listening to the bells of St. Basil's, muffled and indistinct, he cried for her but also for himself, because now he was truly alone. Sir? The attendant had reappeared with his milk and cookies, and Karpov shook himself like a dog coming out of the rain. I'm sorry, she said. Shall I come back? He shook his head, and she slid his tray out and set down the plate of cookies and the glass of milk. Still warm, she said. Is there anything else? Karpov smiled at her but there was more than a hint of sadness in it. You can sit down beside me. Her soft silver bell of laughter wafted over him like a cool breeze. What a flirt you are, Mr. Stonyfield, she said. Shaking her head, she left him alone. Karpov stared down at the cookies, not seeing them at all. He was thinking of Jason Bourne. He was thinking about what he was setting out to do. He was thinking of what his decision would mean not only for the present, but for the rest of his life. Nothing would ever be the same. The knowledge didn't frighten him. He was too used to the unknown for that. But he did have a queasy feeling in the pit of his stomach, as if a group of moths were fluttering there, directionless, waiting for the inevitable to happen. It wouldn't be long now. That was the only thing he knew for certain. Marcel Probst the Quai d'Orsay IT tech to whom Inspector Lipkin René had delivered Laurent's cell phone and its SIM card was one of those Frenchmen for whom wine, cheese, and an arrogant sneer were the essentials of life. 
Moments after she had arrived with Aaron, Probst made it clear via a sour, almost offended look that he did not like Soraya. Whether it was because she was Muslim or a woman or both, Soraya could not say. Then again, he didn't seem entirely enamored of Aaron either, so who could say? In any event, his face, sour as a prune, announced his prejudices like a warning sign on a highway. Probst was dapper, well-dressed, and in his late forties. In other words, the direct opposite of the American IT text of Soraya's acquaintance. Liberté, égalité, fraternité, she thought as she stepped up to his workbench. It contained, among other paraphernalia, a laptop computer and an oscilloscope flanked by a pair of high-end bookshelf speakers. What do you have for us? Aaron said. Monsieur Probst pulled on his lower lip, making it into a kind of teapot spout. The phone itself is beyond even my skills, he said. And the SIM card is a mess. Apparently, he never met a consonant he didn't try to swallow. Maybe, Soraya thought, they tasted like brie. Monsieur Probst cocked an eyebrow upward. Was the instrument by any chance compromised while being transported here? Certainly not, Aaron said, and then, somewhat irritably, have you found something or not? Get on with it, if you please. Monsieur Probst grunted. Oh, the curious thing is that from what I can tell, the SIM card was wiped clean of information. Sarai's heart sank. From the damage? Well, mademoiselle, that depends. You see, this SIM card was subjected to two forms of damage. The one, as I have already mentioned, is physical. He tapped the oscilloscope's spikily juttering line. The other was electronic. What do you mean? Aaron said. I can't be 100% sure, Monsieur Probe said, but there is a strong indication that the card was subjected to an electronic pulse that wiped it clean. He cleared his throat. Well, almost. There was only one thing salvageable, he said. There is no doubt that it was entered after the electronic pulse, but before the phone was rendered useless. You mean in the instant before Laurent was struck by the car? Soraya said, and immediately regretted the interruption. Monsieur Probst glared at her as if she were a rat that had crawled into his sanctum sanctorum. I believe that is what I said, he said stiffly. Moving on. Aaron said gamely. Let's get to what you salvaged. Monsieur Probst sniffed like a character out of Victor Hugo's Les Miserables. It's a good thing you came to me, Inspector. I very much doubt anyone else could have brought up so much as a kilobyte of information. For the first time, a smile curved Monsieur Probst's bloodless lips, thin as a miser's coat. It was clear he felt he had put the interlopers in their place. Here is what was transferred to the SIM card in the last moment of the victim's life. On the laptop screen, a single cryptic word appeared. Denoig. Aaron shook his head and turned to Soraya. You know what that means? Soraya looked at him and said, I'm starving. Take me to your favorite restaurant. Miles away from La Linnea, Bourne pulled off the highway into a dense copse of trees and overgrown brush. Exiting the jeep, he came around to the other side and hauled Suarez bodily out of his seat. What are you doing? Suarez said. Where are we going? He was a mess. The right side of his head was bloody. A huge bruise, standing up like a fist, scarred his forehead, and he cradled his bruised and swollen right hand. Bourne dragged him along, hauling him to his feet when he occasionally stumbled. When they were completely hidden from the road, Bourne shoved Suarez against the trunk of a tree. Tell me about your role in Severus Domna. It won't help you. When Bourne came at him, he held up his good hand. All right, all right, but I'm telling you, it won't do you any good. The Domna is completely compartmentalized. I move goods for the group when and if I'm asked to, but I don't know anything else. What kinds of goods? The crates are sealed, Suarez said. I don't know and I don't want to know. What are the crates made of? Bourne asked. Suarez shrugged. 
Wood? Sometimes stainless steel? Bourne considered for a moment. Who gives you your orders? A man? A voice on the phone? I never met him. I don't even know his name. Bourne snapped his fingers. Phone. Suarez dug awkwardly in his pocket with his left hand and drew out the phone. Call your contact. Suarez's head moved spastically back and forth on his shoulders. I can't. He'll kill me. Bourne took Suarez's swollen right hand in his and broke the pinky. Suarez screamed and tried unsuccessfully to pull his hand away. Bourne shook his head and took hold of the next finger on the hand. Five seconds. Sweat was rolling freely down Suarez's face, staining his collar. Dios, no! Two seconds. Suarez opened his mouth, but nothing came out. Bourne broke the second finger, and the commander nearly passed out. His knees gave out, and he slid down the tree trunk. Bourne slapped his cheek. Suarez's eyes watered, and he turned and vomited onto the ground. Bourne imprisoned his middle finger. Five seconds. Basta! Suarez cried. Basta! All the color had drained from his face, and he was shaking in reaction to the trauma. He stared at his cell phone, clutched in his sweaty left hand. Then, as if snapping out of a trance, he looked up at Bourne. What? What do you want me to say, hombre? I want his name, Bourne said. You'll never give it to me. Bourne tightened his grip on the middle finger of Suarez's ruined right hand. Find a way, hombre, or we continue where we left off. Suarez licked his lips and nodded. He punched a button and a number popped up on the screen. Wait, Bourne said, and reaching over, killed the connection. What? Suarez said in that slightly dazed tone of voice that had come out of him ever since his fingers had been broken. What is it? I did what you asked. Don't you want me to call him? Bourne sat back on his haunches, thinking. He knew who Suarez's contact was. He recognized the digits. Suarez was calling Halal Isai's satellite phone. Chapter 9 Chez Georges, the restaurant to which Aaron took Soraya, was a block from the Bourse, Paris's stock exchange. As such, lunch was attended mostly by suits, talking stocks, bonds, options, derivative swaps, grain and pork belly futures. Nevertheless, the atmosphere was old-world Paris, before the advent of the EU, the Euro, and the slow disintegration of French culture. First it was the Germans, then the Dutch, Aaron said, and now we are encircled by what amounts to refugees from North Africa, with no hope of integration, jobs, or prospects. It's no wonder they want to burn Paris to the ground. They were sitting at the long banquette, facing each other, eating hanger steaks and the establishment's astonishing frites. The homogeneity of the French is under siege. Aaron looked at her for a moment. This is how we do, he said, using the English slang of American cops. This is the way we do things. She laughed so hard she had to put a hand to her mouth in order not to spray food all over her plate. His eyes crinkled nicely when he smiled. Despite that, the smile made him look younger, like a little boy whose joy is unadulterated by life's responsibilities and concerns. So, he put down his utensils and steepled his fingers. Dinoig, he spread his hands. You have an explanation. I do. Soraya licked salt off the tips of her fingers. The word is an anagram. Aaron stared hard at her for a moment. A code. Soraya nodded. Admittedly a crude one, but it was meant as a fail-safe, in case my contact got into trouble. Terminal trouble. Aaron took a sip of the Bedouin mineral water. He'd very kindly refrained from ordering wine. Soraya dug in her handbag, pulled out a pen and a pad, and wrote Denoig on it. She looked at it for several moments before she said, Since the anagram begins with a consonant, let's start with the assumption that the word begins with a vowel. Two eyes and an O. There are only six letters, so the chances of both eyes being in the center are virtually nil. Beneath Denoig, she wrote, I. Now it becomes easier because of our choices for a next letter. N makes the most sense. Now the second line read, In. There. 
She looked up at Aaron and turned the pad around so that it faced him. Then she handed him the pen. You finish it. Aaron frowned for a moment, then he wrote down the next four letters and turned the pad back for her to read. Indigo, Soraya read aloud. Peter's back was killing him. He'd been working nonstop on Hendrix's files, opening the folders one by one since they were only marked with numerical designations, 001, 002, 003, and so forth. They were filled with memos, to-do lists, even reminders of birthdays and anniversaries. The files were remarkably devoid of anything interesting. He rose from his computer crouch, put his hands at the small of his back, and stretched backward. Then he went off to relieve his aching bladder. Peter liked to think while he peed. In fact, some of his best ideas had come to him while his bladder was emptying. There was something about the physical feeling of relief that set his brain to wandering down fruitful paths. He stared at the wall. His eyes roved among the multitude of small cracks in the plaster, finding fanciful shapes as if they were clouds passing across the sky. Except these shapes were permanent. That being so, some of them had already become friends. There was the roaring lion, the boy holding balloons, the boxing kangaroo, the old man with drooping earlobes, and then there was Houdini, the man with what to Peter looked like a lock around his waist. Good Lord, Peter cried all at once. Shaking and zipping up, he hurriedly washed his hands and virtually ran back to his computer terminal. Now, instead of going folder by folder, he scrolled down, looking for a file locked with an electronic encryption. Sure enough, there was one, at the bottom of the folder tree. When prompted for a password, he typed in, Servers. Nothing happened, not that he was surprised. It would have been extraordinarily stupid for Hendricks to use the same password twice. Peter twirled a pencil between his teeth, sat back, and considered his next move. What word would Hendricks use to safeguard this file? He tried Hendricks's birth date, the date he was appointed Secretary of Defense, his address. Nada. He sat there so long without moving his cursor that Hendricks's screensaver came on. He was looking at a beautiful green-eyed woman with high cheekbones and an open, smiling face. Fifteen seconds later, the image faded out and another of the same woman appeared. This time, she was seen with Hendricks. They were holding hands on a bridge in Venice. The woman was Amanda, Hendrix's third wife. She had died five years ago. The scene changed again to a shot of Amanda in a formal gown on the terrace of a huge stone mansion. Idiot, Peter thought, smacking his forehead with the heel of his hand. He typed in, Amanda. Open sesame. He was in. The file contained two long paragraphs and one short addendum. The long paragraph seemed to be notes Hendricks had taken after a recent meeting he'd had in the Oval Office with the President, General Marshall, the Pentagon's Chief of Staff, Mike Holmes, the National Security Advisor, and someone by the name of Roy Fitzwilliams. Peter was immediately reminded of the conversation between Hendricks and Danziger at the Folger he'd overheard piecemeal. We weren't ever going to meet in your office, his boss had said, for precisely the same reason you weren't invited to the meeting in the Oval Office. From what Peter read, the briefing concerned the extreme strategic importance of rare earth metals. The president had decided on an interagency task force, codenamed Samaritan, to safeguard the Indigo Ridge mining operation in California. Apparently, the president had put Hendricks in charge of Samaritan and had given it the highest priority. Peter had reached the end of the second paragraph and was wondering anew why his boss hadn't briefed him and Soraya regarding Samaritan when his gaze fell on the last short addendum. With a shock that went through his body, he discovered that the paragraph was addressed to him. Peter, I know you're reading this. You're more curious than George the Chimp. There's something about this Fitzwilliams character that disturbs me. Can't put my finger on it, which is why I want you to investigate him. Strictly down low and off the clock. The POTUS has read us the riot act about non-compliance with Samaritan. The work I'm asking you to do certainly falls into that category, so I urge you to be exceptionally careful. I know you will be. If you're wondering, you're the only one I trust with this. Do not use any of the normal channels to contact me regarding your progress. Your findings here only. I can't stress enough how important your conclusions could prove. Good luck.
Esteban Vegas. Born, having consulted his map, calculated that they were less than five miles from Vegas' home. He'd had to make a decision as to whether to try finding him at home or at the oil field. The long, dusty afternoon was fading, the sepia light like that in an old photograph. The day was dying, and in any event, he wanted to approach Vegas in the presence of his Indian mistress. Oh, Commander Suarez said in a voice bleary with pain, fear, and the sour aftermath of adrenaline. Am I supposed to know this man? He's a member of Severus Domna. So what? Suarez couldn't even shrug his porcine shoulders without wincing. I told you, everything inside the Domna is tightly compartmentalized. He smacked his lips. I need a beer. I bet you could do with one, too. Born, driving very fast, ignored him. They were still climbing through the Cordillera Mountains. He had rolled down his window. The air cooled the Jeep's stinking interior. Suarez sweated like a wild boar. If you tell me one more time that you don't know who Esteban Vegas is, Bourne said, I'll stop the car right now and throw you down the mountain. Okay, okay. Suarez resumed his sweating. So I know Vegas. Everyone in the area knows him. He's a character. So fucking what? Tell me about the woman he's living with. I don't know a thing about her. Bourne pulled off the highway, put the jeep in neutral, and turning, slammed his fist into Suarez's left ear. Suarez's head snapped back and he let out a low groan. The rich sense of plants and loamy earth pushed into the jeep. You've already pulled the guts out of me, Suarez said. What the fuck more do you want, hombre? You're making this hard on yourself. Bourne struck him again, and the commander gagged. He bent over with his head between his knees. Bourne hauled him back up by the collar of his sweat-stained shirt. Shall we continue? Her name is Rosalita. Vegas calls her Rosie. He wiped blood and bile off his lips with the back of his good hand. She's lived with him for, I think, five years now. Why? Suarez's eyes flared. How the fuck? His voice uncharacteristically petered out. What I hear is that Vega saved her from a Margay, a female who'd just given birth. Rosie had had the bad luck to stumble across his den. She couldn't outrun it. It had mauled her pretty good, I heard, before Vegas, hearing her screams, shot the thing. He carried her back to his place and took care of her. She's been taking care of him ever since, so I hear. Ever meet her? Who, Rosie? No, never. Why? I'm wondering why he never got her pregnant. Suarez was silent for several moments. Ahead of them, thick thunderheads, purple and yellow, the colors of the bruises on his face, were piling up. The air had turned heavy. There was a blue-white flash of lightning, and almost immediately, the silence was cracked open by a double rumble of thunder, followed faithfully as a dog follows its master. The storm will be a son of a beach, Suarez said. He put his head back and closed his eyes. A moment later, the first fat spatters of rain rolled down the windshield. In no time at all, the drumming began on the jeep's roof. My question has an answer, Bourne said. Provide it. Suarez's eyes popped open and he turned his head toward Bourne. I hear there's a grave out behind their house. A very small one. Bourne put his hands on the wheel, gripped it hard. How long did the baby live? Nine days, so I'm told. Boy or girl? I heard boy. Bourne thought about how fleeting life was, especially for some. Nine days was no life at all. But to Esteban Vegas and Rosie, it must have been everything. It had to be. That was all they had. He put the jeep in gear and got back on the rain-pocked highway. They were very close to Vegas's house. He put on as much speed as he dared with such poor visibility. Back when Amanda was alive, Hendricks looked forward to coming home after a long, hard day's work. These days, he went jogging in Rock Creek Park. He went every day and jogged the same three-mile course. He liked jogging in the late afternoon when the light was spent from the day's exertions and lay along the winding path he had chosen like a river of molten gold. He felt all the stronger for it. He also liked the repetition. 
he had discovered a curious comfort in passing the same trees, the same curves and S's. Of course, they were never quite the same. The season saw to that. He particularly liked jogging in the snow, his breath white in front of him, the frost in his nostrils and on his eyelashes. Cleo always accompanied him, her lithe golden body bounding, her black muzzle moist with saliva from her wagging pink tongue. She watched him with her liquid brown eyes, wanting to please him and at the same time, he imagined, feeling keenly the pleasure of her working muscles. Sometimes he wondered what it would be like to be her, to run ecstatically on all fours, to feel pure joy, to have no knowledge of your impending death. Of course, Hendricks and Cleo had company, his National Guard detail making certain the route in front and back of him was clear. He disliked their presence in this context, in a place of serene beauty when all he wanted was to be alone with his thoughts. In a way, his detail saw to that, though it was entirely inadvertent. Anyone on the length of his run during the time he was there was pulled aside and grilled to within an inch of their lives. Then they were held under surveillance, almost as prisoners, until he had completed the three-mile course. Today, there were precious few people caught in the security net as he jogged by, Cleo loping beside him. But the sight of one person made him stop and turn back. When he approached the cluster, one member of the detail stepped in front of him and asked him for the sake of security to kindly keep his distance. No, wait a minute. I know her, Hendricks said, looking beyond him. Stepping around the guard, Hendricks approached the young woman in jogging outfit and Nike sneakers. Maggie, he said, what are you doing here? Good afternoon, the woman he knew as Margaret Penrod said. Same as you, I imagine, having a run. Hendricks smiled. My mind says run, but my knees insist I jog. Do I have to be kept here under guard? Of course not. He lifted a hand. You can jog with me. That is, if you can stand my relatively slow pace. Maggie looked around at the grim faces of the detail. Only if your hounds will let me. My hounds follow orders. He looked at his detail. Already body scanned, sir, one of them said. Hendricks could see the disapproval in his face. His jogging with someone not pre-approved weeks in advance was against protocol. To hell with their protocol, Hendricks thought. This is my time. By now, Cleo had come over, sniffing at Maggie's sneakers. Find anything interesting? Maggie asked. Cleo looked at her, and Maggie, crouched down, rubbed the boxer behind one ear. Cleo leaned against her in ecstasy, her sides panting. She likes me. Hendricks laughed. Cleo falls in love with anyone who scratches her ears. Maggie looked up at him. Her face had found the lowering sunlight, and her eyes seemed to glow. What about you? Hendricks felt his throat redden. I... Maggie rose. That was a joke. Just a joke. Come on. Hendricks rose up on the tips of his toes. Let's go. They moved off, Maggie careful to keep to his pace. Cleo bounded at his side or between them, maintaining contact, bumping his legs in sheer joy. The guards followed close behind. He could feel their tension, and he imagined their eyes boring into Maggie's back, on alert for any sign of hostile action. He supposed they were concerned about Maggie suddenly turning on him and snapping his neck like a dry twig. Every once in a while, Cleo glanced at her, as if wondering what was going on. Hendricks was wondering the same thing. As they moved along the familiar path, tree branches dipping in the wind as if waving or saluting, he realized that everything looked different, the shapes sharper, the colors more vivid. He saw details he hadn't noticed before. He was jogging with Maggie beside him. It was happening because he wanted it to happen, and frankly, that astonished him because he hadn't wanted something like this in a long time, probably five years, not since Amanda died. He hadn't wanted to be with another female since then. How shabbily he had treated Jolene and the other females who flitted in and out of his life. When they said or did something that reminded him of Amanda, it threw him into despair. Worse, when they said or did something that was different from the way she'd said it or done it, he became enraged. The embers of that despair-rage cycle were visible to him at last. And being visible, they cooled, their heat growing dim. 
he felt as if life had sprung up whole from the ground and materialized before his eyes, and he thought, What have I been doing with myself? He felt ashamed of his behavior. That wasn't the way Amanda would want him to act. And now, jogging along, feeling Maggie's heat, smelling her particular scent of cinnamon and bitter burnt almond, he did something he hadn't been able to do before. He looked back over those five years. He had been wandering in a desert. Maybe it was a desert of his own making, he thought, but it was no less real for that. Now, at last, he thought he was ready to leave that barren place and rejoin the world in which he and Amanda had laughed and loved and talked and just, well, enjoyed each other in the pure way that Cleo enjoyed her runs. Hendricks, feeling lighter, became aware that he was enjoying jogging. He was enjoying not being alone. Maggie said something to him, and he said something back. A moment later, he couldn't remember what either of them had said, and what's more, it didn't matter. He hadn't shied away from her. He didn't feel embarrassed or a need to run away. In fact, he wished the course was five miles instead of three, so that when they came to the end, he turned to her and said, Would you like to have some dinner with me tonight? As if it was the most natural thing in the world. She must have felt the same way, because this time she said, I would like that very much. Esteban watched the storm coming in over the horns of the Cordilleras while Rosie was preparing dinner. She worked slowly and methodically, as she always did. Her hands were strong and sure as they trimmed the meat, seasoned it, and set it to braise in a pan slicked with hot oil. When the rain came, it slashed at the windows and rattled the loose roof tiles he had promised to fix but never had. She lifted her head and smiled, the familiar sound assuring her that everything was as it should be. The end of the day grew dark as night, and for a moment he saw her reflection in the mirror, the livid scars the Marge had made down both sides of her neck. Outside, the white cross Esteban had fashioned from hardwood rose stark as bleached bone from the spot beneath the Tamarillo tree that had been her favorite ever since he had brought her to his house screaming and severely wounded. She turned away from the window, and, touching her upper chest, where matching scars rose like white welts, lowered her head and wept silently. At once, he was at her side. It's all right, Rosie, he whispered. It's okay. He's out there, she said, in the rain. No, Esteban said. Our child is in heaven, safe and secure in God's light. There would never be another child, so the doctors told them. Esteban knew that she had expected him to throw her out, convinced that the infant's death was her fault. Instead, he had treated her with even more kindness. Hearing her weeping in the night, he had held her tight, rocked her, told her to forget about what the doctors had said, that they would keep trying to have another baby, that surely, by the grace of God and Jesus Christ, his son, a miracle would befall them. That had been three years ago but since then nothing had grown inside her. She was transferring the meat to the pot of cut-up potatoes, onions, and chilies when they heard the alarm. He could feel her body tense. Don't worry, he said, leaving her in the kitchen. He rustled around the living room, making his preparations. Son ellos, she asked. Han venido por fin. Is it them? Have they come at last? When Begas returned to the kitchen, he had a shotgun in one hand. Look at the filthy weather. He dragged his fingers through his thick beard. Who else could it be? If I was them, I'd make my move now. Begas was beside her, one strong arm around her, pulling her close. He kissed her cheek, her temple, her eyelids, and she felt the familiar tickle from his mustache. No te preocupes, hija mia, he said in her ear. Everything is ready. They can't touch either of us. We're safe. Do you hear me? Safe. He led her then to see the last of the preparations, which were elaborate. Placing the lid on the pot, she wiped her hands on her apron and moved to the den where Esteban was crouched over the equipment he had spent months installing and tweaking until everything worked to his complete satisfaction. Los ves, mi amor. Do you see them, my love? Is a jeep. Esteban Vegas pointed to the green and black infrared image on the small screen just to his left. 
To his right was a laptop computer connected to the array. Begos had installed a software package that identified the infrared images. It currently showed a closed-top jeep. It's them, he said. No doubt. How long? Begos looked at the meter on top of the infrared projector. Three hundred yards, he said. They're close now. Rosie placed her hands on his substantial shoulders. Se acerca el final. It is the end. Para ellos, sí, el final. For them, yes, the end. Vegas' fingers danced over the laptop's keyboard, and the image on the screen was wiped clean, to be replaced by images of the video cameras he had installed around the perimeter of the property. For a moment, all they could see were gray sheets of rain, and then, all at once, a shape, the jeep cutting through the rain, jouncing along the road to Vegas' house. Rosie, feeling Esteban's muscles bunch in tension, leaned farther over him. She inhaled the raw oil smell of him, so ingrained that nothing could erase it. Serrar ahora, he said softly, almost to himself. Muy cerca. Close, very close. Will it work? she breathed. Yes, he said. It will work. And then, a moment later, the fruits of his labor arrived. They saw the explosion just before they heard it. The explosives he had planted beneath the road detonated by the vibration of the Jeep's engine. The vehicle jetted into the air for a moment out of range of the video cameras. When it appeared again, crashing to earth, it was in pieces, ragged, fiery, smoking, twisted, almost unrecognizable. Almost. Esteban Vegas breathed a sigh of relief. Ya está hecho. It is done. The wreckage of the jeep, smoldering, guttered in the downpour. Ay es el fin de ellos. There is the end of them. But just to make sure. Vegas was not a man to leave anything to chance. This was how he had always lived his life. The philosophy had been good to him. It had made him a rich man. He rose, took up his shotgun, and stepped to the front door. Lock it behind me, he said without turning around and Rosie moved to do as he asked. He went outside and strode through the driving rain, looking for the dead men. Book Two, Chapter Ten Boris Karpov found plenty to dislike about Munich. Like almost all Russians, he despised the Germans. The bitter taste of World War II was impossible to dispel. The Russian senses of outrage and revenge were ingrained in him as deeply as his love of vodka. Besides, despite the city's new motto, München mag dich, Munich likes you, Munich was easy for Boris to dislike. For one thing, it was founded by a religious order, the Benedictines, hence its name, derived from the German word for monk. Boris had an atheist's staunch distrust for organized religion of any stripe. For another, it was in the heart of Bavaria, home of right-wing conservatism that had its roots in Adolf Hitler's hateful National Socialism. In fact, it was in Munich that Hitler and his supporters staged the infamous Beer Hall Putsch in 1923, an attempt to overthrow the Weimar Republic and usurp power. That they failed only delayed the inevitable. Ten years later, Munich finally became the stronghold of the National Socialists, who, among other heinous crimes, established Dachau, the first of the Nazi concentration camps, ten miles northwest of the city. So yes, plenty to dislike here, Boris thought, as he instructed his taxi driver to drop him along the Brinerstrasse at the beginning of the Kunstareal, Munich's art district. From there, he walked briskly to the Neue Pinakothek, the museum concentrating on European art from the 18th and 19th centuries. Inside, he stopped at the information booth for a map, and then made his way to the gallery that housed Francisco de Goya's plucked turkey. Not a major work, Boris thought as he approached it. A group stood contemplating the painting as a guide went through her spiel. Boris, standing to one side, waited in vain for her to mention whether or not plucked turkey had been one of the paintings stolen by the Nazis. His mind clicked over his responsibilities. Before leaving Moscow, he had issued orders to Anton Fedorovich and left the day-to-day -day running of FSB-2 to him. 
but by definition, that had to be temporary, since Boris was still in the process of shaping the organization to his desires and hadn't yet weeded out all the dead potatoes. From the outset, he'd given himself five days at most to deal with Cherkasov's assignment. He could not count on FSB-2 being run properly without him longer than that. Eventually, the group moved on, leaving in its wake a man who remained contemplating the Goya. He seemed unremarkable in every way, medium height, middle-aged, salt and pepper hair with a bald spot on his crown. His hands were plunged deep into the pockets of his overcoat. His shoulders were slightly hunched, as if they were supporting an invisible weight. Good morning, Boris said in passable German as he came up beside the man. Our cousin regrets he could not come in person. This contact was one of thousands cultivated over the decades by Ivan Volkin. As such, he was unimpeachable. How is the old gentleman? the man said in passable Russian. Feisty as ever. The coded exchange having been made, the two men strolled together through the gallery, stopping at each painting in turn. How can I help? the man said softly. His name was Wagner, most likely a field moniker. That was fine by Boris. He felt no need to know Wagner's real name. Ivan had vouched for him. That was enough. I'm looking for connections, Boris said. A faint smile crossed Wagner's lips. Everyone who comes to me is looking for connections. They had moved on and were now in front of Friedrich Wilhelm von Shadow's The Holy Family Beneath the Portico. In Boris's view, a thoroughly reprehensible subject, like all religious themes, though he could appreciate the clarity of the artist's style. Involving Viktor Cherkisov. For a time, Wagner did nothing but stare intently at the painting. Von Shadow was a soldier first, he said at last. Then he found God, went to Rome, and became one of the leaders of the so-called Nazarene movement, dedicated to bringing true spirituality to Christian art. I couldn't care less, Boris said. I'm sure. Wagner said this in a way that made Karpov feel like a Philistine. As to Cherkisov, Boris pressed. Wagner moved them on. He let out a sigh. What specifically do you want to know? He was just in Munich. Why was he here? He went to the mosque, Wagner said. That's all I know. Boris hid his consternation. I need more than that, he said evenly. The secrets of the mosque are closely guarded. I understand that. What Boris couldn't understand was what possible business Cherkasov's new master might have with a mosque. Victor seemed about the last person to be sending into that particular snake pit. Cherkasov hated Muslims even more than Germans. He spent most of his time in FSB too hunting down ethnic Chechen Muslim terrorists. It's exceedingly dangerous to poke into the mosque's business. I know that too. Boris was well aware that the mosque in Munich was ground zero for many of the Muslim extremist terrorist groups the world over. The mosque indoctrinated disaffected young men and women, fired their hopelessness, channeled their frustration into anger. Then it trained them into cadres, armed them, and funded their subsequent flares of violence. Wagner thought a moment. Is there someone who might be able to help you? He bit his lip. His name is Hermann Borgia. He's a watchmaker. He also watches the goings-on at the mosque. His lips curled into a smile. Amusing, no? No, Boris said flatly. Where can I find Herr Bolger? Wagner told him the address, and Boris committed it to memory. They visited two more paintings for show. Immediately thereafter, Wagner left. Boris consulted his map, wandering through the remainder of the galleries for the next twenty minutes. Then he went in search of Hermann Bolger. The rain fell like shouted words, like commands to the troops, with a fatal crash of ancient armies locked in hand-to-hand -hand combat. Bourne stood beside a vaulting pine, its black branches swept by the wind, battered by the rain. From this vantage point, he witnessed the explosion rip the jeep apart, the pieces crashing down in flames for only seconds before the torrent doused them. Twisted junk fountained in all directions, two parts landing within three feet of where he hid, the blackened steering wheel and Suarez's head, 
stinking, still smoking as if fresh from a barbecue pit. Suarez's lips, nose, and ears had been burned away. The remains of his eyes were smoking as if he were a creature from hell. Born, seeing Vegas clomp down the front steps of his house, stepped back within the dense shadow of the looming pine. From this distance, he looked like he was wearing old-fashioned hobnailed boots. Bourne noted the shotgun he carried, but that was hardly his most dangerous aspect. Vegas' eyes were like living coals. His bloody-minded demeanor reminded Bourne of a grizzly he'd observed in Montana, protecting her cubs from a marauding mountain lion. He wondered whom Vegas was protecting himself and Rosie from. This electronic setup must have been weeks in the making. It certainly wasn't meant for Bourne. Who, then? You're out of your mind, Suarez had said, when Bourne had stopped the jeep a thousand yards from Vegas' house. I'm not doing that. It's the only way you're going to get some medical help, Bourne had replied. Once you get out, what's to stop me turning the jeep around and getting the hell out of here? The only way out is back down the mountain, Bourne said. The rain was so torrential it felt like being inside a waterfall. You'll be driving with one hand. You're welcome to kill yourself any way you want. Suarez had delivered a murderous glare, but a moment later he just looked glum. What evil moon was I born under to have crossed paths with you? Bourne opened the door, and a roar like the end of the world rushed into the jeep. Just stick to the plan and everything will be fine. You make the direct approach. Vegas knows you. I'll come around from the rear. Are we clear? Suarez nodded resignedly. My hand is killing me. I can't feel the fingers you broke. You're lucky, Bourne said. Imagine how much worse the pain would be if you did. Slipping out of the jeep, he was completely drenched in seconds. He watched Suarez slide awkwardly over behind the wheel and move off down the road toward the house. Bourne had seen the first of the infrared camera posts and had immediately stopped the jeep, though he hadn't told Suarez why. It was disguised as a mile marker. He recognized the equipment because he'd come across the same scenario in a villa in the mountains of Romania several years ago. The system was highly sophisticated, state-of-the-art, but in the end, Bourne had defeated it and gained access to the villa. Even if Suarez had noticed the mile marker, Bourne doubted he'd know what he was looking at. The infrared setup was a surprise. Bourne didn't want another, so he had decided to have Suarez drive the jeep the rest of the way while he explored Vegas' property on foot. The proof of Bourne's prudence was at this moment staring up at him with empty eye sockets. He felt no remorse at having sent Suarez to his death. The commander was a stone-cold killer, and given half a chance, he would have shot Bourne through the heart. He watched Vegas move cautiously around the wreckage, poking here and there with a shotgun barrel. When Vegas found one of Suarez's arms, he crouched down, examining it closely. From that point on, he concentrated on body parts. Slowly, methodically, his search took him in concentric circles, farther and farther from ground zero, closer and closer to Bourne's position under the pine. The rain was still torrential, the hidden sky coming apart with scars of lightning and booming thunder. Bourne's vision wavered, blended with a newly risen memory shard which took over. Bourne had slogged through a near blizzard to get to the disco where Alex Conklin had sent him to terminate the target. The fast-melting remnants lay on the fur collar of his coat as he made his way through the packed club. In the ladies' room, he had fitted the silencer to his handgun, kicked open the door. The icy blonde's face was set, almost resigned. Even though she was armed, she had no illusions about what was about to happen. Was that why she had opened her mouth? Why she had spoken to him just before he had ended her life? What was it she had said? He combed through the memory shard, trying to hear her voice. In Columbia, in the intense downpour, he heard a woman's voice shouting across the thunder. And now he heard the icy blonde's voice, so similar in pitch and in desperation. There is no... There is no what? Bourne asked himself. What had she been trying to tell him? He searched through what was left of the memory, but it was already breaking up, like an ice flow in summer, the images fading, becoming gauzy and indistinct. A sound close by startled him back into the present. Vegas had found one of Suarez's legs, and rising from his scrutiny of it, was looking around, 
He spotted Suarez's head and began to make his way toward it, a deep frown furrowing his brow. Bourne wondered whether he would recognize the burn-mutilated face. He didn't have long to wait. Vegas came upon Suarez's head. Using the end of the shotgun barrel, he turned the thing around so it faced him. Immediately, he reared back and, raising the shotgun to the ready, backed away, peering through the downpour with an ominous look in his eyes. That was all Bourne needed. Vegas had recognized Suarez and had been unsurprised by his presence in the jeep. If his sigh had been telling the truth, it was possible that Vegas had been preparing himself for an assault by the Domna. If Bourne was reading the situation correctly, Vegas was quits with the Domna and had been preparing himself for their violent response. This would explain why he and Rosie hadn't cut and run. There was nowhere he could go that the Domna couldn't find him. At least here he was on familiar territory. He knew it better than anyone they would send, and he was prepared. Vegas was someone whom Bourne could respect. He was his own man. He'd made a difficult and obviously dangerous decision, but he'd made it nonetheless. Esteban, he said, stepping out of the towering pine's shadow. Vegas swung the shotgun in his direction, and Bourne raised his hands, palms outward. Easy, Bourne said, standing absolutely still. I'm a friend. I've come to help you. Help me. What you mean is help me into my grave. The noise of the rain was so great the two men were obliged to shout at each other, as if they were in a stadium filled with screaming fans. We have something in common, you and I, Bourne said. Severus Domina. In reply, Vegas hawked and spit at a spot almost exactly between them. Yes, Bourne said. Vegas stared at him for a moment, and that was when Rosie appeared through the pines. She held a glock in one hand. Her arm was extended, straight as an arrow, pointed at Bourne. Vegas's eyes opened wide. Rosie! But his warning came too late. She had let herself get too close to Bourne. He grabbed her outstretched arm, swung her around, and as he disarmed her, held her tight against him. Esteban, Bourne said. Lower the shotgun. Bourne could see Vegas's love for Rosie in the older man's eyes, and he felt a fleeting twinge of envy. The normalcy of the world of sunlight would never be his. There was no point dreaming about it. The moment Vegas lowered the shotgun, Bourne released Rosie, who ran to her man. Vegas wrapped one arm around her. I told you to stay inside. Vegas's voice was gruff with worry. Why did you disobey me? I was worried for you. Who knows how many men they sent? Apparently, Vegas had no answer for that. He turned his bleak gaze on Bourne and the Glock still in his possession. Now what? Bourne walked toward them. Seeing Vegas tense, he reversed the Glock in his grip. Now I give you your gun back. He held it out. I have no need of it. It was just you and Suarez. Bourne nodded. Why were you with him? I ran into a Fark roadblock and took him hostage, Bourne said. Vegas seemed impressed. We weren't followed, Bourne added. I made sure of that. Vegas looked at the Glock, then up into Bourne's face. Surprise was replaced by a spark of curiosity. He took the Glock and said, I've had enough of this rain. I think we all have. Hendrix almost didn't recognize Maggie when they met at the restaurant he had chosen. She had on an indigo dress and black high heels but she wore no jewelry, just an inexpensive but functional watch. Her hair was loose, longer than had seemed possible when she was wearing a hat. In her baggy gardener's overalls, she had seemed to have a tomboy's figure, but the dress shattered that illusion. Her long legs tapered to tiny ankles. Whoever invented high heels, Hendricks thought, must have been a man in love with a female form. Amanda had worn them only infrequently, complaining of how uncomfortable they were. When he had pointed out that her friend Mickey always wore high heels, Amanda told him that Mickey had been wearing them for so long she could no longer wear flats. The high heels had foreshortened the tendons in her arches. Barefoot, she walks on tiptoes, Amanda had told him. Hendricks found himself wondering what Maggie would look like barefoot. He was about to give his car over to the valet when Maggie waved the boy away. When she slid into the passenger's seat, she said, 
I'd rather eat at Vermilion, so I made reservations there. Do you know it? In Alexandria? She nodded. 1120 King Street. He put the car in gear. Have you been there before? Once. He was thinking of his first anniversary celebration with Amanda. What an amazing night that had been, starting with Vermilion and ending at dawn curled and drowsing in each other's arms. I hope you don't think I'm willful, she said. He smiled. I don't know you well enough. She settled back in the seat as he pulled out into traffic, heading for the key bridge in Alexandria. Her hands were very still in her lap. The fact is, I'm a desertaholic. Is that a word? It is now. Her laugh was low and liquid. He drank in her scent as if it were the bouquet given off by a single malt scotch. His nostrils flared and he felt a stirring in his core. Anyway, there's a dessert at Vermilion, salted profiteroles. That's my favorite. I haven't had them in a long time. You'll have them tonight. Hendricks maneuvered around traffic, the car containing his detail for the night right behind him. Two portions, if that's your desire. She looked at him. The oncoming headlights turned her eyes glittery. I like that, she said softly. A man who's not afraid of turning me into a glutton. They were on the bridge now, the city's monuments lit up, turning the evening sky gold and gray. I can't imagine you being a glutton. Maggie sighed. Sometimes, she said, there's a certain excitement in overindulging. He frowned. I'm not sure I... It's the forbidden nature of the act. Do you know what I mean? Hendricks didn't, but he was beginning to wish that he did. You've never done anything forbidden, have you? Maggie, a martini in her hand, watched him from across the table at Vermilion, an atmospheric townhouse. Their table was beside a window, and from their second-floor perch, they could watch the nighttime parade of young people, tourists and residents alike, as they passed by on the sidewalk below. You've always been the good fellow. Hendricks was both nettled and fascinated that she had nailed him so quickly. What makes you say that? She took a sip of her drink. It looked like it had twinkly lights in the center of it. You smell like one of the good ones. He smiled uncertainly. I'm afraid you've lost me. She put her drink down and, leaning forward, took his free hand in hers. Turning it over, she smoothed open his fingers so she could study his palm. The instant she took hold of him, Hendricks felt an electric pulse travel up his arm into his chest before settling in his groin. He felt as if he had stepped into a tub of warm water. Her eyes flicked up to engage his, and he had the distinct sense that she knew precisely what he was feeling. A slow smile spread across her face, but it was without irony or guile. You're an older brother, or else an only child. Either way, you were the firstborn. That's true, he said after a moment's hesitation. That's why you have such a strong sense of duty and responsibility. Firstborns always do. It's like it's hardwired into them before birth. Slowly and sensually, her forefinger traced the creases on his palm. You were the good son, the good man. I wasn't such a good husband, at least the first time, and I certainly wasn't a good father. Your duty is to job and country. Her eyes seemed to gather him in. Those things come first. They always did, yes? Yes, Hendricks said. He found that he was inexplicably hoarse. He cleared his throat, took his hand from hers, and drank half of his single malt. This intemperate act caused his eyes to water, and he almost choked. Careful, Maggie said. You'll bring your babysitters running. Hendricks, his cheeks pink, nodded. He wiped his eyes with his napkin and cleared his throat again. Better, Maggie said. He wasn't sure whether that was a question, in which case it would require a response. He let it go and sipped the remains of his scotch. So how many languages do you speak? She shrugged. Seven? Does it matter? Merely curious. But it was more than that. 
Part of him, already infatuated, sat back with eyes closed, but the other part, the always vigilant good fellow, as Maggie herself put it, wanted to vet her. It wasn't that he didn't trust the government's vetting process, though he could name numerous cases where it had missed something vital, but rather he trusted his own instincts more. He handed her a menu and opened his own. What do you feel like, or would you prefer to have the profiteroles first? She looked past the menu and smiled. You're so sad. Is it me? Would you rather we do this another time, or not at all, because that would be... No, no. Hendricks found himself raising his voice to ensure that he stopped her. Please, Maggie, just... He looked away, his eyes losing their focus for a moment. As if sensing his shift in mood, she tapped the menu. You know what I love here? The soft-shell crab BLT. His gaze swung back to her, and he smiled. No profiteroles? She returned his smile. Now I think of it. Tonight, I just might want another kind of dessert. Chapter 11 when Halali Sai left Bourne, he boarded a flight to Bogota and then 90 minutes later transferred to an overseas flight, just as he had told Bourne he would do. After that, however, it was a different story. He flew to Madrid and then to Seville, where he hired a car and began his journey to Cadiz on the southwest coast of Spain. Cadiz had a storied history. Depending on whom you believed, it was founded either by the Phoenicians or, following Greek legend, by Hercules. The Phoenicians called it Gadir the walled city. The Greeks knew it as Gadira. According to legend, Hercules built the city after he had killed the three-headed monster Geryon, completing his tenth labor. In any event, Cadiz was Western Europe's oldest continuously settled city. It had passed through the hands of a number of legendary conquerors, the Carthaginians, Hannibal, the Romans, the Visigoths, and the Moors, who ruled Cadiz between 711 and 1262. It was from the Arabic that the modern name Cadiz was derived. Isai had cause to think on this history as his car jounced the seventy-some-odd miles from the Seville airport to the sandy spit on which Cadiz was built. The Moors had spent the most time in control of the city, and it looked it. Because of the sandy soil, there were no high-rises in Cadiz, so the skyline looked more or less the same as it had in medieval times. Though in Spain, the city had a distinctly North African aspect and feel to it. Following the map engraved in his mind, he entered the walls of Casco Antiguo, the old city. The cream-colored house off the Avenida de Duque de Najera overlooked Playita de las Mujeres, one of the city's most beautiful beaches. From the second-story rear windows, all of Casco Antiguo presented itself like the history of southern Spain. Isai had called from the airport in Seville. Consequently, Don Fernando Herrera was expecting him. He opened the thick medieval wooden door as soon as Asai turned off the car's engine. Don Fernando, who lived in Seville but maintained the second home as an occasional getaway, wore an immaculate summer-weight linen suit, the exact shade of cream as the outside of his house. Though he was in his early seventies, his body was nevertheless lean and flat, as if he had been constructed in two dimensions instead of three. The vivid blue eyes made all the more prominent by his leathery skin, dark, wind-burned, and sun-wrinkled. Apart from his eyes, he might have been mistaken for a moor. Isai got out of the car, stretched, and the two men embraced in the European style. Then Herrera frowned. Where is Esteban? Esteban is fine. He's being protected, Isai said. It's a long story. Herrera nodded ushering a sigh into the cool interior, but his worried expression did not abate. The house was built in the Moorish style, with a central open space cooled by fountains in the fronds of slender date palms, which clashed softly in the sea breeze. Herrera had set out food and drink on a beaten brass tray atop a folding wooden table. After a sigh had washed, the two men sat amid the shifting shadows and the musical plinking of the fountains, eating the foodstuffs of the desert Bedouins with only their right hands, as the Arabs do. Herrera plucked a Valencia orange from a bowl. Ahora, he said. Digame, por favor. Taking out a folding knife with a long, thin blade, he began to peel the orange. 
Esteban is not simply an employee of mine. He is an old friend. I sent you to Colombia to fetch him and the woman and bring them back here before the Domna killed them. So it was a test. Herrera separated an orange segment from the sphere. If you want to think of it that way. How else should I think of it? Esai was clearly upset. You don't trust me. Esteban isn't here. Herrera popped the orange segment into his mouth, then in a blur of motion pressed the knife blade against Esai's throat. He pointed westward with his other hand. Out there are the pillars of Hercules. Legend says there is a phrase engraved on them. Non plus ultra. Nothing further beyond, Esai said. Unless you explain yourself, Esai, there is nothing further for you beyond this point. You have no cause for either anger or concern. Isai's head was tilted back in a vain attempt to get away from the blade. He could feel the cool metal pressing against the pulse in his neck, and he fought the urge to swallow, a sure sign of his fear. You sent me to bring Esteban Vegas back, but in Colombia, I got a better idea. In Colombia, I met Jason Bourne. Herrera's eyes opened wide. You sent Born to fetch Esteban. You know Born personally, Don Fernando. Is there anyone better for the task? He's certainly a better choice than I am, especially once I discovered that the Domna had readied its attack on Vegas. Herrera's eyes darkened. He put the knife away, but he was far from relaxed. What did you tell Born? Not the truth, if that's what you're worried about. I told him that Vegas is a weak link in the Domna chain. That much is true. Lies require a certain amount of truth in order to be believable. Herrera stared at the incomplete sphere of the orange and shook his head. It's never wise to lie to Born. You'll never find out. Herrera's eyes flicked up. How do you know? Esteban, Vegas isn't going to say a word to Born. He has no reason to, and every reason not to. Herrera appeared to consider this for a moment. I still don't like it. You'll have to contact Born. Tell him to bring Esteban and the woman here. He's too dangerous. There are tickets waiting for him in his name at the regional airport. When he gets to Seville, there will be a packet with the rest of the details. A sigh shrugged. It's the best I could do under the circumstances. You should have manipulated the circumstances better, Herrera said sourly. You had Correos in your pocket. What more did you need? Correos is about as stable as a boat taking on water. The man's a walking time bomb. All this may be true, Herrera said, but it doesn't change the fact that Correos is still useful to me. Owning a Guardiente Bancor isn't enough for you. It's one of the largest financial institutions outside the United States. Herrera looked up into the clattering fronds beyond which the sky shone as blue as his eyes. A guardiente is my day job. He broke off another orange segment. I need to be engaged at night. His gaze, lowering like the sun, settled on his size face. You should understand that better than most. Popping the segment into his mouth, he chewed reflectively for a moment, savoring the sweet tart juice, then swallowed the pulp. But this isn't about me, Esai. It's about Born. He broke off a third segment, but instead of eating it, he handed it to Esai. Then he waited, patient as a Roshi in his Zen retreat. Isai sat with a segment balanced on the fingertips of his right hand, staring as if it were a sculpture he had just bought, not something to eat. You know what he did to me. Invading your house is not something one forgives easily. Isai was still staring at the orange segment. Or at all. Herrera grunted and put aside what was left of the orange. Now I'll tell you a secret, Isai. Born invaded my house too. Isai's eyes snapped up to meet his, and Herrera nodded. It's true. He came to the house in Seville with a woman named Tracy Atherton, posing as... He waved a hand dismissively. 
What matters is that it was as much an invasion as his stealing into your home. And what did you do? I? Herrera appeared surprised by the question. I did nothing. Born was doing what he had to do. He had no reason to trust me, and every reason not to. He allowed his echo of a size own phrase to sink in before he continued. There was nothing to do. It's all part of the territory you and I and he inhabit. Asai frowned. Do you think I've taken this too personally? I think you need to gain perspective. You ignore the differences between the Muslim and the Western worlds. It's the Western world you've chosen to live in, Isai. You can't have it both ways. He deserves... You're using him to bring Esteban here. That's enough. I know this man better than you do. It would be a mistake to push your luck. Herrera pointed to the orange segment. Don't disappoint me. After a moment, Asai pushed the fruit between his lips and bit down. Come sit by the fire. Esteban Vegas patted the raised stone hearth. You'll be dry in minutes. Bourne stepped across the kitchen and sat beside the older man. Rosie was at the stove, seeing to dinner. Night had come on with a jaguar's rush. Lashings of warm yellow light from the gas lamps Vegas had lit kept the dark from drifting in through the windows. The storm had abated, but the sky was still thick with filthy clouds. Outside, the blackness was absolute. It was as if they had been transported to the bottom of a well. You were expecting Halal Isai? Vegas raised his eyebrows. Is Isai in Colombia? I have no knowledge of that. Then these elaborate preparations, Vegas's eyes slid away. For others. Bourne took the older man's right hand in his, stretched out the forefinger. A pale circle of flesh bore witness to the ring that had been recently discarded. Vegas jerked his hand away as if Bourne had drawn it into the fire. I know about the Domna, Bourne said. I have no idea. They are my enemies as well as yours. Vegas rose abruptly. This was a mistake. He backed away from Bourne. As soon as your clothes are dry, you will leave. Rosie turned from the oven. Esteban, where are your manners? You can't send this man out into the cold and dark. Rosie, stay out of this. Vegas's gaze remained on Bourne. You don't know. I know what it means to be a decent human being, mi amor. She could have said more, but she didn't. Instead, her eyes willed Vegas's to meet her own. It was there the argument was decided. Fine, he grunted, but first thing tomorrow morning. Rosie's smile burst across her face like sunlight. Yes, mi amor, as you wish. She pulled the roast out of the oven. Now, por favor, offer our guest a drink before the poor man dies of thirst. Born carried his cachaça a fiery liquor made from fermented sugar cane, and stood by a window. Behind him, Rosie was making the final preparations for dinner, and Vegas was adding another place setting at the table. He saw only his face in ghostly reflection, which was fitting, he thought. I'm only a shadow, moving through a world of shadows. His thoughts turned to Halal Isai. Was he still working for the Domna? He had certainly been moving contraband through Suarez and his Fark Cadre. Suarez was a member of the Domna, but he was also a political creature. Fark had been Suarez's life, fighting against the Colombian government. So was Isai using him for his own purposes? But what could those purposes be? Was the story about his daughter a fabrication as well? If so, then his plan for a murderous revenge against the Domna was also a lie. Bourne took a sip of the liquor. It was possible that Isai's grudge was against Benjamin El Arian, personally, and not the Domna collectively. That scenario put an entirely new spin on the situation. If it had any basis in fact, the truth was, Halal Isai was a complete mystery. Neither his actions nor his motives were clear. Once again, Bourne thought, he was in a place where he could trust no one. He was called to dinner by Rosie. When he turned, she was smiling sweetly at him, her arm outstretched to the waiting chair. In her own unconventional way, she was quite beautiful, Bourne thought, with her long black hair, coffee-colored eyes, and dusky rose skin. 
She was trim, with little fat on her, testament to living in the middle of nowhere. She wore no makeup nor any jewelry, save for a gold stud in each earlobe. Her teeth were white and even, her mouth generous, her smile as warm as her manner. Bourne liked her, liked as well the manner in which she handled Vegas. It wasn't easy for females in such a macho society. Vegas was already at the head of the table, which was laden with stew, potatoes, two green leafy vegetables, and fresh bread that, as Rosie explained, she had made that morning. Vegas said a brief prayer, then they ate in silence for some time. A carved wooden crucifix observed them coolly from its place on one wall. The food was delicious, and Rosie beamed when Bourne said as much. So, Vegas said, wiping his lips with a soiled cloth. Where is he? Bourne looked at him. Where is who? Isai. Then you do know he was in Colombia. I hoped as much anyway. I was told he would come and take us away before. With a quick glance at Rosie, he stopped short. You can say the name, mi amor. She was eating slowly, with very small bites, as if afraid if she ate her fill, there wouldn't be enough to satisfy her man and their guest. I won't curl up and die. Vegas crossed himself. God forbid. He scowled. Never say such a thing, Rosie. Never. As you wish. Rosie lowered her gaze to her plate as she commenced eating again. Vegas redirected his attention to Bourne. As you have witnessed, we are prepared for the inevitable, but I no longer want to stay where we will eventually become vulnerable. But the Domna is everywhere. Isai has promised us asylum. And you trust him? I do. Vegas shrugged. But honestly, what choice do we have? Bourne thought about that and decided that they had no choice. Why is the Domna attacking you inevitable? He put down his fork. What have you done? Vegas was silent for a very long time. Just when Bourne was thinking he might not respond, he did. It's what I haven't done that has the maricons worried. Vegas shoveled food into his mouth and chewed contemplatively. Bourne waited in vain for him to finish. As Vegas took a swig of peasant wine, he said, What did the Domna want you to do? Vegas smacked his lips. Spy. They wanted me to spy on my employer and one of my oldest friends. He's the man who gave me a job when I was broke, a drunkard being thrown out of bars in Bogota, and spending nights in one alleyway or another. I was young then, foolish and angry. He shook his head. Dios, so angry. He took another swig of wine, perhaps to fortify himself. I made my living, if you could call it that, putting my old trusty knife to the throats of nighttime passers-by and stealing their money. He looked up at the crucifix and scratched the back of his hand. I was lost, a wastrel, no good for anything, or so I thought. One night, my fortune changed. This man, my intended victim, disarmed me in the blink of an eye. To tell you the truth, my heart wasn't in that business. It wasn't in anything. But I had nothing else. He shrugged, staring at the dregs of the wine in his glass. He moved to refill it, but Rosie slid the bottle out of his reach. He didn't go after it. Perhaps, Bourne thought, this was a daily ritual between them. What spark of life this man saw in me, I can't say, but see it, he did. Vegas cleared his throat as if he was struggling to keep emotion at bay. He cleaned me up, took me to his oil field, trained me from the ground up. I found something within me, call it a home, I don't know. Anyway, it was a place where I felt safe, protected. I worked hard, I loved the hard work, it afforded me a pleasure so acute it was just shy of pain. And now, here I am, many years later, having learned my lessons well, running his oil feeds for him. I have an instinct for it. I believe he knew even when I did not. His eyes shone as his gaze centered on Bourne. And in all those years, it's decades now, he never told me why he took me off the street. You never asked. Vegas turned his head away, as if looking into Rosie's face would calm him. 
That would have been a breach of whatever it was that brought us together. He sighed now and pushed his plate away. This is the man I was ordered to spy on. His head swung around, and now there was the flint of genuine anger in his eyes. It was a test, you see, a test of my loyalty. And I passed. My loyalty, now and forever, is to Don Fernando. For a moment, Bourne thought he had misheard. What is Don Fernando's family name? Herrera. Don Fernando Herrera. Vegas continued eating. Bourne smiled, still trying to figure out the vectors and implications of this crucial nugget of information. Suarez was moving contraband for Isai. Isai was somehow tied to Herrera, who owned the oil fields Vegas was managing. Herrera had also somehow come under the scrutiny of the Domna, still to be determined. Why? Not to mention how Halal Isai and Herrera had hooked up. Rosie cocked her head. Why are you smiling, senor? Don Fernando is a friend, Bourne said. Vegas looked up. How fateful. Isai did well in sending you here. You'll be our shepherd. Tomorrow we will begin our long journey to Don Fernando. After dinner, Hendricks offered to drive Maggie home. Let's go to your place, she said. I want to check up on the roses. Do I have to pay you overtime? She smiled. This is for me. She got out of the car as they pulled up to his townhouse. The following car slid to a halt a discreet distance down the block, but still well within range of getting to Hendricks before anything untoward could happen to him. He could imagine his guards worrying that Maggie would hit him over the head with one of her spiked heels. In fact, Maggie, on the grass, had just taken off her shoes. They dangled from the crook of her forefinger as she stepped lightly across the jewel box lawn to the rose bed. Kneeling, she whispered to the bushes, touching each one as if they were her children. When she rose and turned to him, she was smiling. They'll be fine. Better than fine, you'll see. I have no doubt. Hendricks led her up the brick stairs and opened the front door. All the lights were off for security reasons, and as he shut the door behind them, they were bathed in a darkness striped intermittently by the street lights. Occasionally, a powerful beam from one of the guard's flashlights passed across one of the windows. Just like prison, Maggie said. What? He turned to her, startled by her comment. The guard towers, the searchlights, you know. He stared at her, the hairs at the base of his neck stirring. She was right, of course. He, and all politicians at his level and above, lived in a kind of prison. He had never thought of it that way before. Or maybe he had. Hadn't Amanda mentioned something of the sort during their dinner at Vermilion? He passed a hand across his forehead. This evening and the one with Amanda were becoming confused in his mind, blurring. But that was utter nonsense. Suddenly, he became acutely aware that the two of them were standing in the semi-darkness. Would you like a drink? I don't know. How long am I staying? That depends on you. She laughed lightly. What will your bodyguards say? They're trained to be discreet. You mean our sex tape won't end up on Perez Hilton or Defamer? Hendricks felt a fluttering at the base of his belly. I don't... I don't know who those people are. She came over to him and he breathed deeply of her special scent. His throat constricted so badly he could barely get the words out. Do you want to sleep with me? He sounded like such a schoolboy. But she didn't laugh. Yes, but not tonight. Tonight, I'd like to talk. Is that all right? Yes, of course. He cleared his throat. But I haven't talked to a woman since. He could not evoke Amanda's name. Not here, not now. In a long time. It's all right, Christopher. Neither have I. He led her to one of the sofas, his favorite. He often fell asleep on it late at night with a report open on his chest. His bed still felt cold without Amanda lying beside him. He liked that Maggie called him Christopher. No one did these days, not even the president. 
He despised the term Mr. Secretary. It seemed to him something to hide behind. As they had settled on the cushions, he reached for a lamp on the end table closest to him, but she stopped him. Please, I prefer it just the way it is. The glare from the guards' flashlights had become more intermittent as they returned to their constant patrol. Pale bars of street light striped the rug at their feet, illuminated the bottoms of their legs. He saw that she had not put her shoes back on. She had beautiful feet. What was the rest of her like, he wondered. Tell me about yourself, he said. What were your parents like? He paused. Was that too personal? No, no. When she shook her head, her hair floated around her face like a liquid frame. But there's not much to tell, really. My mother was Swedish, my father American, but they divorced when I was little and my mother took me to Iceland for five years or so before returning to Sweden. This was true, enabling her to better sell the lie of her Maggie Penrod legend. I came to the States when I was 21, mainly to see my father, whom I hadn't since the divorce. She paused for a moment, staring into space. More truth was emerging than she had intended. What did that say about her? I don't know who or what I expected to find here, but my father wasn't happy to see me. Maybe it was the illness. He was dying of emphysema, but really it seemed to me that his imminent death would make him all the more grateful for my presence. Hendricks waited a moment before speaking. He wasn't, though. Something of an understatement. Her smile was grim. It did something to her face he didn't like. He wanted to put his arm around her, but he made no move. He had forgotten I existed. In fact, he denied who I was, said I was an imposter out to get his money after he died. He said he'd never had a daughter. In the end, his nurse showed me the door. She was big and burly. I guess she had to be in order to carry him around. But she was so intimidating that I left without saying another word. Did you try to go back? I was so hurt I couldn't make up my mind. By the time I decided to try again, he was already dead. She hated her father, hated everything about him, including his American crudeness at fucking another woman while he was still with Skara's mother, his arrogance at leaving her alone in Sweden with a small child he cared nothing about, his narcissism that insisted he had never given life to her. Leaving a wife was one thing, and might under any number of circumstances be excused, but to deny your child's existence was unforgivable. Much to her dismay, she discovered tears rolling down her cheeks. Leaning over, elbows on thighs, she put her face into her hands. Her head was about to explode. She felt crushed underfoot, as if her heart was breaking all over again. But so strangely that it made her dizzy, a part of her had separated itself, as if she were watching her own grief the way she might watch the rushes of a film, raw and overfilled with emotion. Now Hendricks did touch her. He put a hand lightly on her shoulder. I'm so sorry, he said. Don't be, she said, not unkindly. I can't, I won't be sorry for myself. Picking her head up, she turned to him. Her tear-streaked face seemed suddenly very young and vulnerable. I don't often remember the past, and I never tell anyone about it. Naturally, Hendricks was flattered. Recognizing that, she felt the divide within herself widen. In deep cover work, there existed the possibility of wanting to be your legend, of feeling as if you never wanted to leave the circumstances in which you found yourself. This, Scara sensed, was what might be happening to her now. She was being drawn toward her Maggie identity and away from Scara. She was comfortable in this house, comfortable with Christopher Hendricks. He was not at all how she pictured him, the cynical, double-dealing, greedy American politician. The human face on the target was, she knew, the most dangerous aspect of cover work. Hendricks, sitting next to her, was of course unaware of her thoughts, and yet the connection between them he had sensed when they first met had strengthened and deepened during the course of the evening to such an extent that he felt the conflict within her, though he was unable to divine its nature. Maggie, he said now, is there anything I can do? Take me home, Christopher. 
and she meant it from the bottom of her cynical, double-dealing, greedy heart. Karpov took the U-Bahn to the Milbertshofen stop and walked several blocks to Knorrstrasse. The watchmaker Hermann Bolger's shop was on the second floor of a narrow, old-fashioned building, incongruously sandwiched between an ultra-modern branch of Komertzbank and the garish facade of a fast-food chain sandwich shop. Outside, an ancient sign depicting clockwork innards creaked in the fitful, filthy wind. The stairs were steep and very narrow, the gray marble hollowed by decades of foot treads. The stairway smelled faintly of oil and hot metal. A radio was playing somewhere above him, a sad Germanic song that made him clench his teeth. Boris passed a small window, through whose grimy panes he could just make out a cramped back alley lined with galvanized garbage cans. Bolger's shop door was open and Karpov stepped in. It was a small space. The sad German song sung by a sad and smoky female voice swirled around the shop, emanating from the innards of the place. Three walls were filled with clocks on shelves. Boris peered at them. They all seemed to be genuine antiques. In front of him was a low counter with a glass top and sides. Inside were watches in stainless steel and gold. All he saw, as he bent to take a closer look, custom-made, presumably by Herr Bolger himself. Speaking of which, the proprietor was nowhere in sight. Boris rapped his knuckles sharply on the glass counter, then called out, his gaze fixed on the open doorway to the back room where, presumably, the watchmaker had his workshop. The song ended and another began, tearful nostalgia for the Weimar Republic. Growing impatient, Boris went around the end of the counter and into the back room. Here, the smells of oil and hot metal were more concentrated, as if Herr Bolger were cooking up an odd industrial stew. Light came from a rear window overlooking, Boris assumed, the same back alley he'd glimpsed on the staircase. The music was unbearably loud. He stepped over to the radio and turned it off. Silence flooded the workshop, and with it a smell that mingled with the others. It was a familiar and galvanizing scent to Karpov. Herr Bolger, he called. Herr Bolger, where are you? Making his way through the overstuffed space, he yanked open the ridiculously narrow door to the water closet and said, Damn it to hell. Herr Bolger, on his knees, presented his backside to Karpov. His arms hung down loosely, the backs of his hands against the tiny gray tiles. His head was in the toilet, submerged in water. Boris did not bother to check the body. He knew a dead man when he saw one. Backing out, he went quickly through the shop. He was pounding down the stairs when he heard the high-low wail of police sirens. He continued down as fast as he could, stopping only at the front door to peer through the pane of beveled glass. At least three police cruisers were pulling up in front of the building, cops piling out, drawing their service pistols and heading his way. Shit, Boris thought. It's a trap. He turned and sprinted up the stairs. The window along the staircase was too narrow for him to squeeze through. He kept going. Behind him, the front door opened, the cops rushing in. He'd had several encounters with the German police and was not anxious to have another. Shouldering his way back into the watchmakers, he darted into the back workshop and tried to fling open the window. It wouldn't budge. He tried the crusted swing lock, but it was stuck, and the sash had been painted over so many times it was almost impossible to make out the seam between window and sill. He could hear the police stomping up the stairs, calling out to one another as they progressed up toward the second floor. Boris heard the word Urmacher, and all doubt evaporated as to their destination. Here they came. He turned, and scrabbling among the late Herr Bolger's instruments, found what he was looking for then scored the edges of the glass pane. Knocking it out, he caught it before it fell and smashed into the alley. The police streamed through Bolger's doorway. Without a second thought, Boris climbed through and, squirming uncomfortably, set the pane back in place. He found himself on a brick ledge slanted down to keep the rain from seeping into the window. He edged to his right and almost slipped off. He grabbed onto a metal downspout bolted to the wall at intervals with galvanized brackets. The police were in the workshop. They had found the body. A loud commotion ensued. 
Someone was barking into a walkie-talkie, no doubt calling in the murder. Boris froze, aware that he couldn't remain here long. Sooner rather than later, someone was going to try to open the window, and then the glass pane he had wedged in would fall out. Looking to his left, he saw that there was only more ledge all the way to the corner of the building. He took a chance, and grabbing the downspout with both hands, leaned out to see what was beyond it. His heart leapt. He saw an architectural detail, a niche into which he was sure he could wedge himself out of sight. It was not that far to the ground, but jumping even from this modest height was out of the question. The two galvanized garbage cans below had spiked tops, presumably to keep out the prying paws of rats and the homeless. Besides, at any moment, he expected police to arrive at either end of the alley. In fact, he was surprised they hadn't already. Tightening his grip on the downspout, he turned his face into the building's facade. Then, leaning his upper body against the downspout, he swung his left leg around the metal tube and onto the ledge on the other side. Now for the tricky part. He had to transfer his weight from his right leg to his left. Doing this left him vulnerable until he was fully across. He was contemplating this when the glass pane he had wedged into its frame exploded outward and fell to shatter on the spiked lids of the garbage cans. He had to move now. He transferred his weight. He still didn't have a completely secure foothold with his left leg, so he was obliged to put the bulk of his weight against the downspout. He swung and immediately heard a pop, then another. He looked down. Two of the brackets had popped off from the downspout, which was never meant to hold such weight. The downspout bowed out, and for a terrifying moment, Boris was certain he was going to plummet straight down onto those wicked-looking spikes. Then he had transferred his weight completely. Both feet were on the ledge, and turning gingerly, he wedged himself safely into the niche. Just in time, too. The police were swarming all over the alley. Chapter 12 Born awoke before dawn. Night's shadows still filled the corners of the living room. Rosie had made up their one upholstered chair with bed linens and a pillow that smelled deeply of pine. For a moment, Bourne sat immobile. He had been dreaming of the Nordic disco, of the bright lights, the pounding music, and the woman in the bathroom stall. But instead of pointing a gun at him, it was her finger. Instead of being blonde and blue-eyed, she was dark-haired and brown-eyed. She was Rosie. Rosie had opened her mouth to say something to him, something important. He was sure with that certainty that exists only in dreams. Then he had rocketed awake. Why? Was it movement? He looked around, but the room was still and serene. What then? He rose and stretched his tight muscles. It was when he was moving through the first cycle of exercises he practiced daily that he understood. The sound of an engine, still far away, had penetrated his sleep, drawing him back to Columbia. Grabbing a sturdy carving knife out of the handmade rack on the kitchen counter, he went outside, shivering in the chill. The rain was gone, but a silvery mist obscured the ground and swirled somnolently through the treetops. In the east, Pearl Gray was grudgingly giving way to the pallid pink of the moment before sunrise. He saw two battered jeeps behind the house. They looked like World War II issue. The sound rose into the coming morning. Bourne cocked his head, listening more closely. And there it was, still faint but unmistakable. Thwop, thwop, thwop. He turned and was about to run inside when Vegas emerged toting a SAM, a Russian Strela-2 shoulder missile launcher, with what appeared to be a laser-guided SCS-132 photo-optic scope. Bourne laughed. You weren't kidding about being prepared. He's not just me I have to protect now, Vegas said. He's Rosie. They both turned to the north, and breathless moments later, the helicopter appeared through the rising mist. As Vegas rested the missile launcher on his shoulder and peered through the scope, machine gun fire whistled over their heads. Perfect, Vegas said and squeezed the trigger. The missile shot off with a boom that echoed through the mountains. The helicopter was still rising over the top of the mist-shrouded ridge when the missile struck it head-on. It burst into a fireball, 
spewing molten bits of metal and plastic like an erupting volcano. By that time, Bourne and Vegas had taken shelter behind one of the old jeeps. You'd better get Rosie, Bourne said. We need to get out of here as soon as possible. Are these jeeps gassed up? Vegas nodded. All part of being prepared. He'd started to head off to the house when they both again heard the telltale thwop, thwop, thwop. I hope you have another missile, Bourne said. Vegas sprinted into the house. The second Dom the helicopter was rising over the same ridge as the first one, but it abruptly veered off, taking a more indirect route toward the house. The crew inside had obviously seen the fireball. They would be more cautious in their approach. Vegas returned. All loaded up. Slamming the launcher back onto his shoulder, he peered into the sight. The copter had taken refuge behind a stand of tall pines. Not that it mattered. The laser-guided sight would home in on it, even if it dropped from view. Here we go, Vegas cried, and Bourne took a step away from him. He squeezed the trigger. Nothing happened. The moment Soraya met Amun Shalthum at de Gaulle, she knew bringing Aaron was a mistake. She and Aaron had driven out prior to their morning meeting with Laurent's boss at the munition club, and the moment Amun had clapped eyes on Aaron, it was hate at first sight. Realizing this, she asked Aaron to hang back while she went to fetch Amun. Who the hell is he? Amun said as he hefted his carry-on. Hey, we haven't seen each other for what, over a year, and this is how you greet me? Yes, over a year, and you show up with another man, and not a bad-looking one at that, considering he's French. It's business, Amun. That's Inspector Aaron Lipkin René of the Quai d'Orsay. The moment she said Aaron's full name, she knew she had made another mistake. What's a Jew doing in the Quai d'Orsay? Amun's black eyes looked hard as marbles. He was a tall man, trim but well-built, with wide shoulders and powerful arms. He was both charismatic and forceful in his opinions and orders. His men obeyed him instantly and unquestioningly. He's a Frenchman who also happens to be Jewish. Soraya leaned in and kissed him on the mouth. Then she linked her arm in his. Come along and meet him. He's smart and quick. You'll like him. I doubt that. Amun grumbled, but he allowed her to lead him across the concourse to where Aaron was patiently waiting. To Soraya's dismay, the energy between the two men seemed both electric and toxic, and she knew that she had brought oil and water together, trusting that, contrary to the law of physics, they would mix. No such luck, and as the three of them walked in silence to Aaron's car, she felt her heart sink. A triangle had already formed, with her at the crucial axis point. During the equally silent ride back into Paris, Soraya had time to observe this thoroughly distasteful side of Amun. True, he had been trained as a clandestine field agent, ordered to break up spy rings, including, she had to assume, those controlled by the Mossad from Tel Aviv. But having been born and raised in Cairo, he had been inculcated from a very early age in hatred of Israelis and, by extension, all Jews. The Jewish question was a topic she had never bothered to bring up with him. Or, she wondered as she squirmed in her seat, had she deliberately shied away from the topic because she did not want to face what must inevitably be his bias? The possibility shamed and diminished them both. She felt sick at heart. It was then that she felt the loneliness assail her. She had chosen this life. No one had forced her into it. But there were times, like now, when she felt as alone as an old woman at the end of her life. Aaron's voice cut through the uncomfortable silence. I think we ought to drop Monsieur Chalthoum at his hotel. We have an appointment to keep. I don't have a hotel, Amun said in a voice that could freeze a charging rhino in its tracks. I'm sleeping with Soraya. Then we'll drop you at her hotel. I'd rather come with you to this interview. Aaron shook his head. I'm afraid that's out of the question. This is Kedosse official business. Allah preserve me from male pissing matches, Soraya thought. Aaron, I invited Amun here because I thought his perspective might be valuable. Aaron frowned. I don't understand. The organization Laurent wanted to talk to me about is international. Its tentacles are everywhere, especially in the Middle East and Africa. We are talking about another extremist Islamic cadre. 
We're not, and that's the point. Soraya was looking at Aaron, but she was keeping track of Amun's expression and body language out of the corner of her eye. Laurent was able to tell me that this organization has brought elements of East and West together. That's been tried several times before, without success. But in this current climate, I'd say it was impossible. Soraya nodded, happy that the tone of the conversation had dropped below a simmer. I would have said the same thing, but something about what Laurent said convinced me that he wasn't lying. And what would that something be? Clearly, Aaron was skeptical. Septimius Severus, the Roman general, was born in Libya. It was Severus who increased the size of the Roman army by adding soldiers from North Africa and beyond. Aaron shrugged, but Soraya could feel Amun leaning forward in the back seat. She had grabbed his attention. General Severus was married to Julia Domna, a Syrian, whose family came from the ancient city of Amesa. Go on, Amun said, his eyes alight. Laurent told me that the name of this organization is Severus Domna. If we heed history, its name tells us that Severus Domna has somehow managed to meld elements of the East with the West. Aaron bit his lip as he contemplated the implications. Could any secret cabal be more dangerous? Everyone in the car knew the ominous answer. The second helicopter rose and shot toward them. The side-mounted machine guns started chattering, the air heating up, dirt, mud, and metal parts flying like shrapnel all around them. What the hell happened? Bourne shouted over the noise. I don't know. I think the launcher is jammed. Vegas had the launcher off his shoulder and was peering hard at it. Bourne grabbed him and pulled him down to the ground behind the jeep as bullets pinged all around them. Then he took the launcher away from him. Go get Rosie and get the hell out of here, he said. We'll never make it. Bourne was keeping track of the swooping helicopter. I'll distract them. You'll have to do more than that in order to escape. Let me worry about that. Bourne gave Vegas' shoulder a squeeze. Now go, hombre. There's no time to lose. Vegas tried to stop him, but Bourne hefted the launcher onto his shoulder and sprinted out from behind the jeep, heading for a stand of tall pines to the west of the house. The moment the pilot spotted him, the helicopter veered off in his direction. Vegas used this opportunity to scuttle, crouched over like a spider, from the jeep toward the house. But before he got there, Rosie flew out the door and met him part way. She was carrying a small leather case that looked like an old-fashioned doctor's bag. Vegas put his arm around her shoulders, guiding her lower, and together they ran back to the jeep. Climbing in, Vegas started the engine, and reversing hard, turned the wheel, changed gears, and shot forward along the side of the house. But instead of heading down the driveway, he lurched off to their left, following a hunting path he used. Soon enough, they were engulfed in the trees, out of sight of even the copter pilot. Where is Bourne? Rosie said. Protecting us, I hope. But we can't just leave him there. Vegas was concentrating on keeping the jouncing jeep on the narrow dirt path. Pine branches whipped at them, slamming against the doors of the vehicle, and every once in a while his vision was occluded by foliage whipping against the windshield. Had he not known the path so well, traveling it many times at night without a flashlight, he surely would have crashed by now. Esteban, Rosie prompted. What would you have me do, turn around and go back? She said nothing, just stared straight ahead. We must trust him, he said, just as we trust Don Fernando. I think maybe you put too much trust in people, mi amor. Not people, friends. You put a great store in friendship, mi amor, she said. Without friendship, what are we, Vegas said. We are set adrift without either obligation or responsibility. And when the storm comes, as it inevitably does, where are we to go? She leaned over and kissed him on the cheek. This is why I love you. He grunted, but it would be clear to a blind man that he was pleased. A double line of tracer bullets tore up dirt, grass, and the thick mat of pine needles on either side of Bourne. He made it into the relative safety of the trees with seconds to spare. The young pine right behind him crashed down, sawn in half by the rip of machine gun fire from the copter. Once beneath the branches, Bourne knelt down and checked the launcher. Vegas was right. It was jammed, and he hadn't the time to try to fix it. 
Instead, he ejected the missile. It was an SA-7 Grail with a powerful fragmentation warhead, an older version Bourne saw. The warhead used a 370-gram TNT charge. Carefully, he took apart the missile, separating the TNT and the container of rocket fuel. Then, he searched through the underbrush, looking for a branch. The first was too long, the second too wet, but then he found a broken branch of the right thickness and length. It was knobbed like a medieval mace. Bourne hefted it, then swung it over his head several times. He thought it would do. Stripping off his jacket and shirt, he tied the sleeves of his shirt to two knobs on either side of the broken branch, then placed the TNT and the rocket fuel gingerly in the fabric. The sling he had made from his shirt held them both securely. Separating the items, he launched himself up into the thickest pine, moving nimbly, but mindful of the payload he carried, extremely cautiously from branch to branch, rising higher and higher. As he climbed, he could hear the helicopter's engine more clearly. It was hovering, waiting him out. Every once in a while, the pilot sent a volley of machine gun fire into the cops, perhaps hoping for a blind hit or to flush Bourne from his sanctuary. Bourne needed a place where he would become a visible target and also give himself sufficient room. It took him some time to find the right spot, but at last he did, a delicate crotch just beneath the tip of the pine. There, he balanced himself, then raised his head, waiting to be spotted. The pilot, possibly emboldened by the fact that Bourne no longer carried the Strela II launcher, moved the copter in for the kill. With the TNT and the rocket fuel loaded into his shirt sling, Bourne cocked his arm and waited. The few seconds as the copter maneuvered to get the kill shot were nerve-wracking. Bourne judged the distance. He needed the copter in closer. Just a few feet now. Three, two, one. The machine gun fire started up just as Bourne swung his payload up and out of the jerry-rigged slingshot. The combined payload struck the helicopter's shiny metal skin, where the TNT ignited, setting off the rocket fuel. Bourne ducked as the explosion ripped through the body of the aircraft, tearing it into pieces. He began to climb down, but the stricken copter came out of the sky with appalling speed. Its still-spinning rotors snapped off the tops of the pines and continued to saw into the trees, following the body as it crashed into the copse. Bourne, shaken out of his perch, felt the intense heat, the violent spray of wood chips, and heard the rotor's rhythmic drumbeat of death as they came crashing and flailing directly for him. Chapter 13 Indigo Ridge Peter had worked until the wee hours of the morning reading up on the California mine, how it had been started, then abruptly abandoned in the 1970s when China flooded the international market with rare earths, driving down prices and rendering Indigo Ridge too expensive a proposition. Mining rare earths was a long and complex process and was further complicated by the refining processes, which were different for each element. Flash forward to the present, when China abruptly reversed course, cutting rare earth exports by 85%, stunning everyone, including the supposedly bright lights at the Pentagon, the DOD, and DARPA. Now the Pentagon was screaming bloody murder. The unthinkable had occurred. The manufacture of its next-gen weaponry was being either delayed or canceled altogether because of the scarcity of rare earths essential for the components. While everyone else in the world was slumbering in ignorance, China had been buying up virtually all the rare earth mines outside the United States and Canada. Dismayed, Peter continued downloading everything he could find on Neodyme, the new public company charged to mine Indigo Ridge, and its head, Roy Fitzwilliams. He began to read. Then he pulled the chart on the IPO. Neodyme had gone public yesterday at 18. In its first day of trading, it had plummeted all the way to 12 before flattening out for what looked to be less than an hour. Late in the trading day, a number of huge trades brought the stock all the way back to 16 and 3 eighths, where it closed. A high volatility stock, that was for sure, Peter thought. Reading the accompanying commentary he pulled off the CNBC and Bloomberg sites, he could readily see why. The investing gurus didn't know what to make of Neodyme. Some felt that since it would take years to get the rare earths out of the ground and refine them, the stock would be dead money until then. 
Others, who seemed to have more knowledge of the strategic importance of rare earths, gave the opposite opinion. It was time to get in now. Completely hooked, he continued to read, switching to a bio of Fitzwilliams, a B.A. in Earth and Mineral Sciences from Penn State, an advanced degree from the University of New South Wales, Australia, then jobs in the uranium mines of Australia and Canada, a stint in the Middle East, including Saudi Arabia. Then he disappeared off the map for just over two years. Peter spent the next hour running down leads for 1967 to 1969 on the Internet, always finding a dead end. Just as he was about to give up, he discovered a clue. An obscure organization called the Mineralization and Rare Metals Conference Board had held a regional meeting in Qatar in the spring of 1968, at which Fitz was the guest speaker. Another frustrating 45 minutes yielded one more interesting nugget. Fitz was listed as a consultant for El Gabal Mining. Peter immediately looked up El Gabal, a Syrian company, only to discover it was now defunct. There was precious little known about it, or indeed any business in Syria. The country was not a member of the World Trade Organization, and every large business like El Gabal was controlled by the government, so accurate assessments of Syria's export profits, let alone a single company's, were impossible to find or even guess at. A dead end, Peter thought, returning to Fitzwilliam's CV. He returned from the Middle East to run Indigo Ridge, keeping his job even when the mine went more or less dormant in the 1970s. He'd been there ever since, and now, riding the stratospheric resurgence of rare earth metals, had returned to an almost princely prominence as a major player in the rapidly emerging strategic field. Peter sat back and pressed his thumbs into his bloodshot eyes. He was exhausted and would have dearly loved a cup of coffee, but at this hour the machine was out, and anyway, he didn't want to get up for fear of breaking his train of thought. He considered for a moment more, then called one of Soraya's assets in Syria gave him the rundown on Fitz and El Gabal, and asked for as much intel as he could unearth. Then he accessed Hendrix's hard drive and posted what he had discovered to the pertinent file there. Peter wanted to go on, but the figures, facts, and opinions had begun to whirl inside his head like a school of reef fish. He needed sleep. Picking up his coat, he dragged himself out of the office. The corridors were silent. Only the soft whir of the elevator rising disturbed the peacefulness. The elevator doors opened, and Peter stepped in. He pressed the button for the garage level and leaned his head against the wall, already half asleep. The bell sounded as the elevator came to a halt, and as the doors opened, he saw a hulking figure in the shadows of the fifth-floor corridor. The figure approached him with definite intent, and Peter's head came away from the wall. Light spilled onto the figure as it entered the elevator. The door closed, sealing them in together. Peter saw the service revolver at one hip. Evening, Director Marks. Hey, Sal. Sal's blunt finger stabbed out and pressed the button for the lobby, and the elevator resumed its quiet descent. Burning the midnight oil, huh? As always, Sal grunted. I hear you, but you look like you could use some sleep. That's an understatement. Well, you can rest easy. Everything's clear upstairs. The doors opened at the lobby, and Sal stepped out. Have a better one, Director Marks. You too. Moments later, Peter stepped out into the garage. The low-ceilinged space smelled of concrete, gasoline, and new leather. His footsteps echoed off the walls and ceiling. There were very few cars in evidence. As he headed toward his, he dug out his key, and because of the chill, pressed the button for the pre-starter. The engine roared to life. A heartbeat later... The explosion knocked him flat on his back. Bourne fell through the pine. Just above him came the crumpled helicopter's circling blades. But as they hit thicker and thicker wood, they slowed. And then the tree's gummy sap began to work on the blade's central mechanism, acting as a fast-drying glue, slowing them. Bourne, scrambling down, half-falling, half-leaping, was cut scraped and bruised in too many places to count, his eyes, mouth, and nose filled with wood chips, sawdust, and tiny bits of metal. But in the end, the beautiful pine became his ally, its sturdy lower branches holding the wreckage above him long enough for him to swing the last several feet down to the ground. Coughing and gagging, he ran to the house. 
Inside, he stuck his head under the faucet in the large soapstone kitchen sink, letting a continuous stream of cold water cleanse and revive him. He found the keys to the second Jeep right where Vegas had told him he'd left them. Because of Vegas's often dangerous work in the oil fields, the bathroom was almost as well-stocked as a hospital dispensary. He grabbed bottles of disinfectant and rubbing alcohol and a roll of sterile gauze on his way out. In the main room, he poured the alcohol in the pile of wood by the fireplace, then stood back, lit a wooden match from a box in the kitchen, and chucked it onto the wood pile. The resultant whoosh of flames was gratifying. For good measure, he set the kitchen curtains aflame. The fire spread greedily. Satisfied, he left the burning house. Outside, the pine that had protected him was in ruins. It, too, was burning. A piece of one of the helicopter's rotors, sheared off by the tree, had struck the second jeep, crumpling the driver's side front fender but leaving the engine unharmed. Putting the vehicle in gear, Bourne backed out, turned, and took Vegas and Rosie's path, veering off to the left of the driveway into the thick copse of trees. He followed what he sensed was a hunting path through the woods. He drove cautiously, acutely aware of the path's tortuous twists and turns as it wound steeply down the mountainside. Every now and again, through a gap in the trees, he could see the steep drop-off, and he noted how close the path came to the near-vertical plunge down into the lower country at the foot of the Cordilleras. He could hear bird song, which heartened him. Birds were the first to fall silent at any threat, whether real or perceived. If he had to bet, he'd wager that the two copters were the extent of this attack on Vegas. Why would the Domna think any more firepower was needed? After thirty minutes or so, the dirt path emerged from the woods into a clearing, a small meadow filled with tiny wildflowers. Beyond rose another stand of even taller trees, pines and firs, but also, as the woods continued down the mountainside, an increasing number of deciduous trees, even some tropical varieties in the hazy distance. The smoke from the mounting house fire played over this part of the mountainside like a noxious industrial smog, obscuring the rising sun graying out the high sky. Cutting diagonally across the meadow, Bourne could make out the tracks of Vegas's jeep. He followed these precisely. On the other side of the meadow, the tracks plunged through the woods for a short distance before veering to the right. Bourne could see why. Off to the left, the cliff face dropped off, possibly the result of a gigantic rockfall sometime in the past. Continuing straight on would mean certain death. This new trail was narrower and rougher, the jeep jouncing precariously as it twitched and whipped branches that sometimes obscured Bourne's vision. Fifteen minutes of this ended just as abruptly as it had begun, and Bourne found himself on a snaking two-lane paved road. He recognized it as the one he and Suarez had taken up to Vegas' house. Another jeep, with Vegas and Rosie in it, was waiting for him on the gravel of the inner shoulder. Fantastico, en verdad me sorprende. Vegas was grinning. Fantastic, truly, I'm surprised. Rosie smiled at him. Pero yo no lo soy. But I'm not. You'll have to tell us about your escape. But not now. Vegas slapped the palm of his hand against the jeep's door. Anyone left alive? Not from their side. Cada vez mejor. Better and better. He squinted up the mountainside to the plume of smoke. Big fire. Your house, Bourne said. This way no one will know whether you or Rosie are dead or alive for days, maybe weeks. Excelente, Vegas nodded. Where to now, hombre? The airport at Perales, Bourne said. But both the Federalis and Farc have set up roadblocks on the main highway. Do you know a shortcut? Vegas's grin spread across the entire width of his face. Follow me, amigo. Marlin Etana, having arrived by private charter plane in Cadiz at more or less the same time Halal Asai drove in, stood dreaming as he looked at the beautiful ancient facade of Don Fernando Herrera's seaside house. Here in Cadiz, Etana felt the terrible weight of history in the palm of his hand. Marlin Etana, in fact, all the Atanas were serious students of history. Marvelous businessmen in the purest sense of the word, they had the knack of spinning the knowledge they gleaned from the past into money and power. 
It was the Atanas who had founded the Monition Club as a way for Severus Domna to come together in various cities across the globe without attracting attention or using the group's real name. To the outside world, the Monition Club was a philanthropic organization involved in the advancement of anthropology and ancient philosophies. It was a hermetically sealed world in which the sub-Rosa members of the group could move, meet, compare work, and plan initiatives. The Atanas had envisioned a cross-cultural cabal of businessmen, spanning both the Eastern and Western worlds, whose combined power and influence would eventually dwarf those of even the largest of the multinational corporations. Duco ex ombra, influence from the shadows. That had been the motto of the Atana family from time immemorial. Marlin's great-great-great-grandfather, a giant among men, had laid out long-term plans for Severus Domna, a way to help the world grow together rather than splinter apart. It was a noble dream, and certainly, if he had lived long enough, it might have come to fruition. But human beings are fallible. Worse, they are corruptible, and influence is the great corrupter. Exceedingly rare is the man who can ignore its glittering temptation, and even some of the Atanas succumbed. Not the least of these was Marlin's father, who was weak-willed. In order to fend off a threat from a group inside the Domna, he had forged an alliance with Benjamin el Arian. Rather than becoming his savior, the clever el Arian happily arranged for the man's downfall. el Arian had already lined up a rival group within the Domna, and with its help, proceeded to toss the elder Atana aside. Soon after, Marlin's father took his own life. A terrible sin. For an Islamic, the lowest level of hell is reserved for suicides, because Allah has forbidden it in many verses of the Quran. The one Marlin had memorized upon looking at his father's blank face was, And do not kill yourselves. Surely, Allah is most merciful to you. Marlin did not know whether his father believed that Allah had been merciful to him, or whether he felt he had been abandoned. All he knew was that he'd used what little strength was left inside him to cause an uproar inside Severus Domna, to cause outrage, and hopefully, out of that outrage, the beginnings of a difficult debate concerning the soul of the organization. Benjamin el Arian, clever devil, had seen through the veil of the suicide and had forbidden any debate whatsoever. And so, Marlin, all that was left of the once mighty Atana dynasty, without whose vision the Domna would not exist, had been reduced to taking orders from Benjamin el Arian. He had become a whipped dog, begging for whatever scraps el Arian saw fit to throw to him. Just after noon, Marlin saw movement at the front door to Herrera's house. Halal Isai and Don Fernando emerged. They spoke for a few minutes before shaking hands in the Western style. Herrera climbed into a car parked at the curb and drove off alone. When the car was out of sight, Isai turned and began to walk toward the water. Marlin followed at a discreet distance. Isai's pace was no more than a casual stroll. He gave the impression that he had nothing to do and nowhere to go. He followed Isai along the crescent waterfront, where Isai picked up several newspapers from a kiosk vendor. About a mile farther on, he approached a cafe with a blue and white awning. A red anchor logo was stitched onto the awning center. Marlin Atana observed Isai seat himself at a table facing the water and proceed to order lunch. Marlin took several deep breaths, then retreated a distance so he could keep Isai in sight, but also have a wider field of vision. Stepping into the shadows of a doorway, he checked that his pistol was loaded and functional. Then he drew a noise suppressor out of his pocket and screwed it onto the end of the barrel. He gave himself over to one of his Zen-inspired deep breathing exercises. The moment he saw a figure pass by a second time, Etana walked briskly along the waterline, a man with an urgent purpose. The man followed. Benjamin el Arian had set him on Etana to make sure he terminated Halal Isai, and if by some chance Etana failed, the shadow would take over the mission. Etana led his shadow to the far end of the beachhead, beyond the piers and harbors, out along a strip of beach whose unpleasant constitution ensured it was deserted until the middle of the night, when, he had observed, kids used it to party, drink, and have clandestine sex. Etana had found it a nauseating sight, another vivid example of the corruption of the West. A fishing boat, turned keel up, sat up on a block of wood. The boat was rotting, 
the keel line encrusted with barnacles, entwined with dried seaweed. A faint odor of decomposition floated off the impromptu structure, which to Marlin seemed appropriate. He chose a perch along the keel and shook out a cigarette. As he put the cigarette between his lips, he drew his pistol with its elongated barrel and, turning, shot the shadow between the eyes. There was some noise, but none at all when the body hit the sand. Pocketing the pistol, Atana walked over to the shadow and, grabbing him by the back of his collar, dragged him the fifty or so yards to the upturned boat. With some difficulty, he jammed the corpse into the open space beneath the craft. It already smelled bad enough that a decomposing body would not arouse any attention for days, maybe a week. By then, the seagulls would surely have done their work, and no one would be able to identify the corpse. Dusting off his hands, Marlin Atana drew smoke deep into his lungs and started back the way he had come. There was no one around, no one to see him. Best of all, there was no one to report back to Benjamin El Arian. Now it was time, he thought to engage with Halali Sai. Boris Karpov wanted to murder someone. If one of the German cops was still stalking the back alley, as they had been for the past three hours while the forensics team in the watchmaker's shop methodically went about its business, the German would have been a dead man. In the darkness that had descended over Munich, Boris had found his legs spasming, cramping, then, worst of all, growing weak. His head pounded with his need to urinate. He felt that if he didn't pee soon, his bladder would surely burst. And yet his mouth was as dry as a desert, his lips all but pasted together. At last, the lights had gone out in Hermann Bolger's shop. The flashlights of the alley cops were extinguished, and save for a dog barking hoarsely, all fell silent. Boris made himself wait another agonizing thirty minutes. Toward the end, he'd had to bite his lip to keep from moaning. Finally, when he judged it safe, he swung onto the downspout and shinnied down. It was tough going because his legs were all but useless. Twice he felt his hands, slippery with sweat, lose their grip, and he was obliged to try to clamp the metal with his knees. This worked, but just barely. On the ground at last, he squeezed between two garbage cans and, crouching down, peed like a female. He let out a soft groan of relief. The pent-up water went on and on, creating a veritable lake. Getting his legs to work was a different matter. His muscles were so tight that the pain almost overwhelmed him when he stood up. Acutely aware that he needed to put as much distance as he could between him and Bulger's shop, he nevertheless spent the next several minutes stretching gingerly and then more vigorously. He had no choice, really. His legs wouldn't have taken him to the end of the alley without giving out. He cursed his time as an administrator when he'd failed to keep up with his often brutal exercise routine. While he worked out, silently and without respite, he concentrated on breathing slowly and deeply. When his legs had returned to a semblance of normalcy, he set out for the far end of the alley. He heard the soft swishing sounds of traffic and now and again a drunken laugh or two. At the mouth of the alley he stopped, more cautious than ever. A slow, dull drizzle wet the streets, just like in those American spy movies. The city was filled with a throaty rumble of approaching thunder. All of a sudden, the rain came down harder, bouncing off the concrete sidewalk and the asphalt street. He put up the collar of his coat and hunched his shoulders. He looked and listened for anything anomalous. He'd been blindsided. A trap had been sprung where there should have been no trap. His security had been breached. How had it happened? There was only one person he had come into contact with since he had arrived in Munich. Wagner, the contact he had met at the Noea Pinakothek Museum. And unless Karpov had been shadowed from the airport to the watchmakers, it was Wagner who had informed someone at the mosque of Boris's inquiries. Sensing a tale was more art than science, and Boris was a master at smelling a shadow. He was certain he had not been tailed. That left Wagner, or whatever his real name was, and Karpov would be in danger until he terminated the security breach. The sensible thing to do was to call Ivan and inform his friend that Wagner was playing both sides. If anyone knew Wagner's real name and whereabouts, it would be Ivan. 
He pulled out his cell phone and was about to punch in the number when a sudden flash of lightning illuminated a man standing in a doorway almost directly opposite the mouth of the alley. A moment later, thunder cracked and boomed. Boris put the phone to his ear as if he were actually making a call and spoke as if in a conversation with someone. Meanwhile, he forced his eyes to look left and right down the street, ignoring the now heavily shadowed doorway dead ahead. He pocketed the phone, then, hands deep in the pockets of his coat, emerged from the alley and headed left, hurrying through the rain. Three blocks along, he entered a beer garden. It was warm and bustling and smelled of Wurst and sauerkraut and beer. An enormous skylight ran the length of the establishment, giving the illusion of being outdoors without the weather problems. Shaking off the excess wetness, he wound his way around patrons and servers and took a seat at a long table near the rear. Abruptly famished, he ordered everything he had smelled when he came in. The beer arrived almost immediately in an enormous ceramic and metal stein. He took two quick gulps and set the stein down. On either side of him, jolly Germans were drinking and eating, but mostly shouting, singing, and laughing, obnoxious as hyenas. It was all Karpov could do not to get up and walk out. But he was here for a reason, and he wasn't going anywhere until he ascertained whether or not the man in the doorway had followed him. Since he had sat down, almost a dozen people had entered the beer garden, none of whom had set off any alarms. Mostly, they consisted of families or young couples arm in arm. Watching them, Boris strained to remember the last time he had walked arm in arm with a woman. He doubted he was missing anything. His food came, and just as he was tucking into his gleaming, fragrant bratwurst, a figure stepped through the front door. The hair on the backs of his hands stirred. He put the bite of wurst into his mouth and chewed meditatively. He had expected the man from the doorway across from the alley, but this was a woman, a young one at that. Boris watched her covertly as she shook out her umbrella, then collapsed it before taking a look around the restaurant. He was careful not to meet her gaze, concentrating on spearing a potato slippery with grease. He popped the morsel into his mouth, washed it down with some beer, and looked up. The young woman had taken a seat at the end of a table, on the side facing him. She was between him and the front door. Karpov had had enough of this nonsense. These people were either bad at their job or amateurs. He laid his knife and fork on his plate, took the plate in one hand, his beer stein in the other, and got up. As the hour had grown later, the beer garden had become downright raucous, more and more of the patrons transformed into red-faced drunks. Threading his way through the crowd, he decided amateurs were the worst kind of adversary. They didn't know the rules, which made them unpredictable. There was a small gap between the young woman and her neighbor a thick-necked German, stuffing his face and guzzling beer. When Boris nudged him to move over, the fat German looked up, his eyes glaring. He was about to say something, but Karpov beat him to it. Sie haben fett über ihr ganzes Gesicht. You have grease all over your face. Fatty grunted like a pig, and wiping his mouth with the back of his hand, heaved his bulk over. Danke, mein Herr, Karpov said climbing into the space rather clumsily so that he deliberately jostled the young woman slightly. Je suis désolé, mademoiselle. Her head jerked around. He was gratified to see that his French had startled her. Then a door slammed shut in her eyes and she turned away, staring down at a magazine she was holding. It was in English, Boris saw, not German. Vanity Fair. She was reading a story on Lady Gaga, one of those perfectly idiotic pop stars who could exist only in America. He returned his attention to his meal. Sometime later, she lifted the magazine so a plate of Wiener schnitzel could be placed in front of her. She took a look at it, wrinkled her nose in distaste, and pushing the plate away, resumed her reading. Boris swallowed a chunk of bratwurst and hailed a passing server. Nach ein Bier, bitte. Another beer, please. The server nodded. Just as she was turning away, Boris added, Und eine für die junge Dame. The young woman turned to him and said more tartly than sweetly, Thank you, no. Bring it anyway, Karpov shouted to the back of the disappearing server. She had dark hair and a cream complexion, with that quintessentially pretty look only American women have, healthy, vibrant, with perfectly symmetrical faces. In other words, bland as wonder bread. 
Once, several years ago in New Jersey, he had actually eaten a couple of slices of Wonder Bread spread with Peter Pan peanut butter. The cloying sweetness of the sandwich had dissolved into an unpalatable paste in his mouth, and he had gagged. He turned to the young woman and said in English, Aren't you going to eat your schnitzel? Please. She dragged out the word please. Boris eyed the breaded veal cutlet. Yeah, that'll put a couple of pounds on you for sure. This use of American slang caused her to finally look at him. What's your story? Gosh, Midge, he said with a plastic malt shop accent. I was just about to ask you the same question. She laughed. Midge, I haven't heard that name since I stopped reading Archie comics. She apparently made a decision because she held out her hand. Lana Lang. He took her hand in his. It was cool. The edge is more callous than he had expected. Maybe not an amateur, he thought. You're joking, right? Uh-uh. Her smile could be wicked. My dad was some huge Superman fan. Hello, Lana Lang. Brian Stonyfield. I know who you are, she said very softly. Boris, who had not let go of her hand, tightened his grip. How would that be? We've never met before. I am Wagner's daughter. She slipped her hand from his and put more than enough euros on the table to cover both their meals. Now, you must come with me. No questions asked. Wait a minute, Karpov said bristling. I'm not going anywhere with you. But you must, Lana said. You're in mortal danger. Without me, you'll be dead before dawn. Chapter 14 They made the trip down the mountain without difficulty. Bourne had been correct in trusting Vegas' local knowledge. His shortcut bypassed all the federal military roadblocks, as well as any of Suarez's FARC patrols looking for their commander. Bourne reconnoitered the airport and its environs, looking for hostels and finding none. You can't go into the terminal looking like that. Rosie said as she got out of Vegas' jeep. Bourne looked at himself in the rearview mirror. There were smears of blood all over him, and his clothes were ripped. Rosie dug into her bag and came out with a handful of money. Stay here, she said. Bourne was about to protest, but the look in her eyes stayed him. He watched her head into the terminal and counted off the minutes. At fifteen, he resolved to go in after her. Vegas leaned against his jeep, smoking. Don't worry, hombre. She can take care of herself. As it turned out, Vegas's trust in her was well-placed. Rosie emerged from the terminal swinging a white paper shopping bag. She had bought Bourne a shirt and a pair of jeans, along with underwear and socks. As he stripped off his bloody and shredded shirt, she climbed in beside him. Ah, good, she said when she eyed the bottle of disinfectant and the roll of gauze he had taken from the bathroom in Vegas's house. She worked expertly on his naked torso, dabbing at all the cuts, scrapes, and abrasions he had collected in his fall from the pine tree. All the while, Vegas smoked his cigarette and grinned hard at Bourne. Ella es una maravilla, ¿verdad? She's a wonder, isn't she? Tu debe verla en la cama. You should see her in bed. Esteban, basta! But she was laughing, somehow pleased, just the same. She got out of the jeep and then turned her back so Bourne could strip off the rest of his clothes and pull on the ones she had bought for him. Two hours after the rendezvous on the road, Bourne limped over to the Perales Airport check-in counter. The limp was false, as was his London accent. To his surprise, there were not one or two, but three open tickets waiting for him under the code name Mr. Zed. He was pleased to discover that Isai had paid for everything in cash, there were no credit card numbers on the ticket or voucher receipts. He asked for a wheelchair when the time came to pre-board his flight. He booked his ticket under the name of Lloyd Childress, a British national, according to one of the two remaining passports he carried. He had ditched the third before he had left Thailand because the Domna had found him under that identity. Afterward, in a secluded part of the modest departures terminal, Bourne told the pair what he had discovered. 
Asai left tickets for all three of us to Bogota, with a connecting flight to Seville via a stop in Madrid, Bourne said quietly. There's also a rental car voucher for when we arrive in Seville. Asai says final instructions will be with the rental car agreement. He looked from one to the other. You have your passports? Rosie held up her satchel. Packed days ago. Good. Bourne was relieved. He did not want to call Duran, his contact in D.C., for forged passports because of the delay it would cause. Besides the Domna, he had to assume both Fark and the Federalis would at some point be after them. The fire in the tunnel and now the conflagration at Vegas' house were signs that even the somnolent Colombian military could not ignore. On the other hand, they could not know whether Vegas and Rosie were alive or dead. The same for him, for that matter. He checked the time. They had almost two hours before their flight left, and then, in Bogota, 90 minutes more until the departure of their overseas flight at 8.10 p.m. He was certain they would make their plane here, but Bogota might be a different story. He needed a plan. He excused himself. Perales was a small regional airport. He knew he would have better luck finding what he needed in Bogota, but if the airport in the capital was being surveilled, that would be too late. It was here or nowhere. There were four shops in the departures terminal, a drugstore, a clothing store, a newsstand that also sold sundries aimed at travelers' needs, and a souvenir shop, the bright yellow, blue, and red horizontal strips of Columbia's flag in evidence on everything from T-shirts to bandanas to pennants. They weren't ideal, but then nothing ever was. He spent the next 15 minutes limping from shop to shop, buying what he thought he would need. He paid cash for all of his purchases. When he returned to where the couple were sitting, he divvied up the purchases. Then they all went off to the restrooms. Is this really necessary? Vegas said as he set out the shaving paraphernalia on the stainless steel ledge above the line of sinks. Get on with it, Bourne said. Shrugging, Vegas splashed his face with hot water, applied shaving cream, and began to take off his beard and mustache. I haven't seen this part of my face in maybe thirty years, he said as he rinsed off the disposable razor. I won't recognize myself. No one else will either, Bourne said. He took the buzzer he had bought and began to give himself a high and tight, the military haircut preferred by Marines. Then he opened up the various pots of cosmetics he had purchased and started applying color to darken the lower half of Vegas's newly shorn face to match the rest of it. He made his own lips ruddy, his cheeks hollow and sunken. By the time he was finished, Vegas had emerged from a stall in the new outfit Bourne had picked out for him. Shorts, flip-flops, a straw pork pie hat with a yellow, blue, and red band, and a t-shirt with Member, Colombian Cartel, emblazoned across the chest. Hombre, what have you done to me? He complained. I look like a fool. Bourne had to stifle a laugh. All anyone will notice is the T-shirt, he said. Taking up a pair of scissors, he slit the left leg of his new jeans. He threw a new roll of gauze at Vegas and said, Bind up my leg from just below the knee to the bottom of my calf. Vegas did as he asked. Bourne put on the pair of magnifying glasses he had bought and said, Let's go see how Rosie looks. I can't wait, Vegas said with an exaggerated grimace. At the last moment, he pulled Bourne away from the door and said in a low voice, Hombre, escucha me. If anything should happen to me, nothing's going to happen to you. We're all going to talk to Don Fernando together. His grip on Bourne's elbow tightened. You'll take care of Rosie. Esteban, what happens to me is of no concern. You'll protect her no matter what. Promise me, amigo. The intensity in Vegas' voice struck Bourne hard. He nodded. You have my word. Vegas withdrew his grip. Bueno. Estoy satisfecho. Bourne opened the door and they stepped out into the terminal, Bourne limping noticeably. Rosie was waiting for them. The clothes Bourne had bought for her fit her perfectly, maybe too perfectly, as Vegas's eyes seemed about to pop out of his head when he saw her standing there, hands on shapely hips. The clothes clung to her curves like a second skin, the low-cut shirt showing off the tops of her breasts to electrifying effect. The skirt was short enough that more than half her powerful thighs were revealed. Madre de Dios, 
Vegas exclaimed. With that display, even dead men will get an erection. Rosie gave him what looked like a Marilyn Monroe moo before breaking out into giggles. Now I'm ready, sugar, she said to Vegas. I feel as strong as Xena, the warrior princess. That's the spirit. Bourne looked around. Now all we need is the wheelchair. Hendrix, on his way to the conference room a floor below his office, was possessed with the desire to call his son Jackie. Instead, he was stuck in his meeting with Roy Fitzwilliams, the head of Indigo Ridge, who it seemed already had some problems with the details of Samaritan. Last night, after dropping Maggie off, he had spent an hour tracking Jackie down. Good thing he was Secretary of Defense, otherwise he would have gotten nowhere with the Pentagon concerning his son's deployment. Jackie, as it turned out, was in Afghanistan. Even worse, he was heading up black ops patrols scouring the cave-riddled mountains between Afghanistan and western Pakistan, which were inhabited by both Taliban tribal chieftains and the elite al-Qaeda cadres guarding bin Laden. Hendricks had lain awake the rest of the night, thinking alternately about Jackie and Maggie. Entering the conference room with his satellite aides, he settled himself at the head of the table. One of his aides laid down the sheaf of folders dedicated to Samaritan and opened them for him. Hendricks stared down at the computer printouts, trying to anticipate Fitzwilliam's objections, but his mind was elsewhere. Jackie. Jackie in the mountains of Afghanistan. Maggie had done this to him, opened up his heart. He had kept his desires locked up tight, but now he wanted his son back. His dinner with Maggie, such a simple thing, had been a night of normalcy after years of being out of the flow of life, of immersing himself so deeply in the sinkhole of his work. He had ignored, or was it resisted, the current urging him onward. Fitzwilliams was late. Hendricks channeled his anger away from himself, toward the head of Indigo Ridge, so that when Fitzwilliams came bustling in, all energy and bonami, Hendricks barked at him. Sit yourself down, Roy, you're late. Sorry about that, Fitzwilliams said, sinking into a chair like a punctured balloon. It couldn't be helped. Of course it could have been helped. It can always be helped, Hendricks said. I'm sick of hearing people use excuses instead of taking responsibility for their actions. He flipped the pages of the Samaritan file. No one's fault but your own, Roy. Yes, sir. Fitzwilliam's cheeks were flaming. His voice seemed caught in his throat. Definitely my bad. Won't happen again, I assure you. Hendricks cleared his throat. No, he said. What's your problem? Five Rue Vernet, which housed the Monition Club, was a large, vaguely medieval-looking building constructed of pale gold stone. To one side, there was a sunken formal garden with curving gravel paths looping back on themselves, lined with sheared boxwood hedges. In the center was a boxwood fleur-de-lis, ancient symbol of the French royal family. There were no flowers, giving it an austere beauty all its own. Soraya allowed Aaron to take the lead, standing just behind and to one side of him as he rang the front doorbell. Amun stood directly behind her, so close she could feel his heat. It was odd how the three of them had become a triangle simply because Amun had willed it into being. As the door opened and they were let inside, she wondered whether her love for Amun was real or imagined. How could something that had seemed so real last week dissolve into a mirage? She was appalled at the thought of how easy it was to fool yourself into believing an emotion was authentic. They were led through the interior of the building by a young woman unremarkable in every way. Medium height, medium build, dark hair pulled back in a severe bun, a detached expression that squeezed all personality from her face. Soft, indirect light illuminated their way down corridors lined in expensive wood and small-framed illuminated manuscripts, which were hung at precise intervals. Their footfalls made no sound on the plush, charcoal-colored carpet into which they sank as if in a marsh. At length, the young woman stopped before a polished wooden door and rapped softly. She responded to an answering voice and opened the door. Stepping aside, she waved them into the suite beyond. The first room of the suite appeared to be a study as well as an office. 
It was dominated by a hardwood refectory table and floor-to-ceiling library shelves filled with oversized tomes, some of which looked very old. A number of chairs upholstered in fragrant leather were scattered around the room. To one side was a large globe showing the world as it was known in the 17th century. Beyond this space was another distinct room that appeared to be a living room in a residence, modern and lighter in tone and decoration than the study. When they entered, a man atop a low-rolling stepladder twisted his torso, peering at them over a pair of old-fashioned half-spectacles. Ah, Inspector Lipkin René, I see you have brought reinforcements. Chuckling lightly, he came down off his perch and approached their group. Director Donatien Marchand, at your service. A moon shouldered past, interrupting before Aaron could complete introductions. Amun Shaltum, head of Mokabarat, Cairo. His stiff formal bow had about it a vaguely threatening aspect that caused Marchand a brief hesitation, a startle in the depths of his black eyes before his mouth returned to its businesslike smile. I understand you've come about Monsieur Laurent's unfortunate demise. Aaron cocked his head. Is that how you would characterize it? Is there another way? Marchand meticulously dusted off his fingertips. How may I help you? He was a shortish man whom Soraya judged to be in his mid to late fifties, but quite fit. His long hair was graying at the sides, but his widow's peak was still pure black. It possessed the peculiar metallic gloss of a raven's wing, spinning invisible light into an oil slick of colors. Aaron consulted his notes. Laurent was run down on Place de la Rie, à la Défense, at 11.37 in the morning. He looked up abruptly into the director's eyes. What was he doing there? Marchand spread his hands. I confess I have no idea. You didn't send him to la Défense. I was in Marseille, Inspector. Aaron's smile was sharp as an arrow. Monsieur Laurent had a cell phone, Director. I assume you do, too. Of course I do, Marchand said, but I didn't call him. In fact, I had no contact with Laurent for a number of days prior to my leaving for the South. Sarai noticed that Amun seemed to have lost interest in the conversation. He had broken away and was studying the books that lined the director's study. Aaron cleared his throat. So what you're claiming is that you have no knowledge of what business Monsieur Laurent had in the Ile-de-France Bank building two days ago. Very clever. Soraya thought. Aaron waited until now to mention the Ile de France Bank. Marchand blinked as if blinded by a very strong light. I beg your pardon? Until Monsieur Laurent's murder. Murder? Marchand blinked again. Now Aaron had him, Soraya thought. Until his murder, Monsieur Laurent was your assistant, is that not correct? It is. Well then, Monsieur Marchand. The Ile de France Bank. There was a slight edge to Aaron's voice, and he had picked up the pace of his questioning. What was Monsieur Laurent doing there? Marchand's voice turned abrupt, waspish. I have already told you, Inspector. He seemed to be losing his temper, which was the point. Yes, yes, you claim you don't know. I don't know. Aaron consulted his notes, flipped a page, and Soraya felt a little spark of glee rise up in her. Aaron opened his mouth. Here it comes, Soraya thought. Your answer interests me, Director. My research has revealed that much of the funding for this branch of the Munition Club comes from accounts in the Brive Bank. Marchand shrugged. What of it? A number of our senior members have their accounts at Brive. These men are large annual donors. I applaud their altruism, Aaron said lightly. However... After no little digging, it has come to my attention that the Brief Bank is a subsidiary of the Netherlands Freehold Bank of the Antilles, which in turn is owned by, well, the list goes on and on, and I don't want to bore you, but at the end of the list is the Nymphenberg Landes Bank of Munich. Here Aaron took a breath, as if to emphasize the exhaustion brought about by the amount of digging he'd had to do. Is Nymphenberg Landis Bank wholly owned? Indeed it is. And for a time this stopped me in my tracks. But then I decided to turn my supposition upside down. And what do you know? 
Early this morning, I discovered that for the past five years, the Nymphenburg Landesbank of Munich has been quietly buying up pieces of... Now he shrugged. Need I say, Director? Marchand was standing stock still, his hands in midair. Soraya, looking at them, had to give the man credit. His hands were rock solid, not a tremor to be seen. Aaron grinned. Nymphenburg Landesbank now owns a controlling interest in the Ile de France Bank. The takeover was devilishly difficult to detect, mainly because both the Landesbank and the Ile de France are private institutions. As such, they are not required to divulge changes in policy, key personnel, or control. He stepped toward Marchand a pace and lifted a forefinger. However, it occurred to me that there might be another reason for my difficulty in unearthing the connection. The silence grew so thick that finally Marchand said through gritted teeth, And what would that be, Inspector? Aaron closed his notebook and put it away. A bientôt, Monsieur Marchand. Until next time. With that, he turned on his heel and left. Soraya followed in his wake, but not before grabbing a handful of Amun's jacket and dragging him away from his study of the book spines. Outside, the sun was shining and the birds were chirping, flitting from tree to tree. How about some lunch? Aaron said. My treat. I'm not hungry. I'd rather get back to our hotel room, Amun replied. Well, I'm hungry enough for two, Soraya said, avoiding Amun's dark glare. Aaron clapped his hands. Splendid! I know just the place. Follow me. Soraya sensed that Amun didn't want to follow Aaron anywhere, but unless he could find a taxi station, he had no choice. Why didn't you tell me what you had discovered? Soraya said as she came up alongside Aaron. There wasn't time. Soraya suspected this was only partially true, but she held her tongue because she sensed that Aaron hadn't wanted her to say anything to Amun. They returned to the Citroën, and when they were all settled in, Soraya next to Aaron up front and Amun in back with his carry-on bag, Aaron fired the ignition. But before he could put the Citroën in gear, Amun leaned forward and put a hand on his arm. Just a moment, he said. Soraya, acutely attuned to both these men, felt immediate alarm. If Amun was going to start a fight, she had to find a way to head it off. Amun, let's just go she said in as even a voice as she could muster. She had been witness to Amun's temper. She did not ever wish to be on the receiving end of it. I said wait, he said in that tone of voice that turned lesser human beings to stone. Aaron took his hand off the gear shift and half turned in his seat. To his credit, he was content to be patient. That was a good piece of work in there. Amun stared straight into Aaron's eyes. I admired the technique. Aaron nodded. Thank you. It was clear he had no idea where this was going. Neither did Soraya. You hit a nerve with Marchand, and you left him wondering and frightened. Amun continued. It's too bad you didn't plant a bug in his office. Then we could have found out who he's calling right now. Aaron appeared slightly put out by Amun's denseness. This isn't Egypt. I'm not allowed to bug people's offices or homes without proper authorization. No, you aren't. Amun unzipped his bag and pulled out a dull black box about the size of a first-generation iPod. It had a grill on the top. But I can. He flipped a hidden switch, and at once they heard Donatienne Marchand's voice caught in mid-sentence. They were able to listen to the rest of the phone conversation. God alone knows. Not really, no, it's not the first time I've had an inquiry from the Quai d'Orsay. Certainly, but I tell you, this one feels different. No, I don't know why. An unusually long silence. Is the Egyptian having the head of al Mahabharat? Bullshit, you wouldn't like it either. The guy gave me the creeps. No, I don't know what. You try that then. You didn't look these people in the eye. Really? I haven't even mentioned the woman, Soraya Moore. Well, you may know her, but I don't. She worries me most of all. Because she says nothing and sees everything. Her eyes are like X-ray machines. I've had the misfortune of meeting several people like her. 
Inevitably, it's gotten messy, very messy. And with this Laurent business, messy is the last thing we need. Oh, you do, do you? And who would that be? There ensued what seemed to be a shocked silence before Donatien Marchand's voice started up again. You can't be serious, not him. I mean to say, there's got to be another alternative. I see. Marchand sighed in what sounded like resignation. Win. And it has to be me. All right, then. Marchand managed to inject a girder of steel into his voice. I'll give him his orders immediately. The usual price. A moment later, the connection was broken. The three eavesdroppers sat in silence, their bodies very still. The atmosphere was suddenly stifling, the musk of men and women mingling into a thick stew. Soraya felt the slow, heavy beat of her heart. It was one thing listening in on a conversation, quite another when a key part of that conversation concerned you. Interpretation, Aaron said a bit breathlessly. It sounds as if Marchand has been ordered to contact a hitman. Aaron nodded. That was my take as well. He turned his head. Amun? The Egyptian was staring out the Citroën's window and didn't bother to answer. Here he comes, he said, pointing to Marchand, whom they could see emerging from the munition club. He got into a black BMW and took off. As Aaron put the Citroën in gear and pulled out after him, Amun said, I assume you've both lost your appetite. The Federales were looking for Bourne, all right. At least the identity Bourne had used to enter Colombia. Of course, that identity no longer existed. Neither did the man in the blurry wire photo the cops were passing around the International Departures Terminal in Bogota. Don't worry, Bourne said from his seat in the wheelchair. It's me the Federales have an interest in, not you or Rosie. But the Domna has connections in this case, Bourne cut in. I very much doubt they'd want the Federalis involved. Too many questions would be asked. Nevertheless, as Vegas pushed Bourne across the concourse, he exuded nervous energy the way the sun generates heat. This was a problem. Of what magnitude, Bourne could not yet determine, for cops could smell fear from a thousand yards away. Directing them to the business class lounge, Bourne presented their tickets to one of the attendants, a slim, deeply tanned young woman who personally showed them the best place to park the wheelchair, then went to get a server for them. There were definitely perks to being perceived as disabled, Bourne thought, but right now the most important one was throwing the Federales off his trail. When the server appeared, Bourne ordered a stiff drink for Vegas to calm him down. Rosie ordered her own. Bourne wanted nothing. I'll be fine once I see Don Fernando again, Vega said. Stop looking around, Bourne said. Concentrate on me. He turned to Rosie. Hold his hand and don't let go, no matter what. Rosie hadn't said a word since they disembarked their regional flight from Perales, but Bourne sensed little fear in her. Her innate trust that Vegas would protect her, come what may, appeared to insulate her from their precarious situation. The moment she gripped Vegas' hand, he relaxed visibly, which was lucky since at that moment, a pair of federales stepped into the lounge and started querying the receptionists. Both of them shook their heads when they looked at the photo of Bourne. Nevertheless, the two cops decided to make a circuit of the lounge. Vegas had not yet seen them, but Rosie had. Her eyes locked on Bourne. He grinned at her. He laughed as if she had made a joke. Understanding, she laughed back. What's going on? Vegas said. What the hell is so damn funny? In a minute or two, a pair of Federalis will pass by here. Bourne saw the fear bloom anew in the older man's face. He was a country fellow, unused to the confines of the big city, and here in the lounge there was nowhere to run. He had already consumed more than half his drink. His face was pale. Bourne could see the bones of his skull clearly beneath the suddenly waxy skin. Dead men looked better. Seeking to distract him, Bourne asked him about the oil fields, his early days when he was learning the trade, when the danger was the most acute. He became animated, as Bourne had hoped. Clearly, he loved his work and was adept at its every nuance. 
All the while, Rosie listened as attentively as if she were a geological engineer. The Federales were fast approaching their area, strutting with their chests out, their hands on the butts of their sidearms. Tension ratcheted up. Even Rosie was not immune, Bourne saw. I saw the tamarind tree out back, Bourne said, and the cross that marked the grave. We do not speak of these, Vegas said, shaking. Mi amor, calmate. Rosie kissed him on the cheek. He couldn't know. I had no intention. Rosie lifted a hand to stop him. You couldn't know, she said grimly. She offered Vegas a wan smile that guttered like a candle in the wind. She turned back to Bourne. Our son, nine days old, and already he held the entire world in his eyes. A tear slid down her cheek, which she immediately wiped away with the back of her hand. This is how it is with children, before they are corrupted by the adult world. His death was a complete mystery. Vegas's words seemed squeezed out of him, as if each one gave him pain. But what do I know? Only where I've been. I don't know where I'm going. They have to be protected, the children, Rosie said. Something in what Vegas had just said disturbed her deeply. The Federales were only steps away. Bourne said, You can have the chance to protect another one. They both stared at him. It was Rosie who spoke. But the doctor said... That was a doctor in the middle of Colombian nowhere. There are specialists in Seville, in Madrid. If I were you, I wouldn't give up hope. The pair of Federales swaggered past, their eyes glancing over the tourists, the man in the wheelchair, whom they took to be an American war vet, the old man with the T-shirt emblazoned with its stupid logo that set them laughing. But mostly, they let their gazes linger over the high breasts and long legs of the woman whose sensuality took their breaths away. And then, like a storm cloud passing, they were gone, and the entire lounge seemed to breathe a sigh of relief. Maggie, Scarra thought of herself as Maggie now, it was effortless, was due for her daily report to Benjamin L. Arian. She luxuriated in bed, only a top sheet covering her naked body, and regarded the encrypted cell phone she used only for communicating with El Arian. Then she turned away and stared at the pale blue-gold light of morning, purling the loose-weave curtains of her bedroom. At this hour, it was so quiet she could almost hear the faint crackle and spark of the light, as if it were the only thing stirring, shifting easily as the sun slowly dissolved the darkness. Her mind was filled with many thoughts, some of them conflicting. But mainly she knew she did not want to speak with Benjamin. He was like a tether, dragging her back to another life, one she had chosen, true enough, though far from willingly. It was funny, she thought now, how the exigencies of life forced you to make decisions. That there could be any form of control was an illusion. Life was chaos. Attempts to control or even contain it could only end in tears. She had shed enough tears for several lifetimes, the last time when she saw her mother on the coroner's slab in the chill house of the dead, when she broke down sobbing with her two sisters. She had promised herself she would never shed another tear again, and she had kept that promise until last night. What was it about Christopher Hendricks that had shattered her resolve? For hours, while his presence still throbbed through her like a fever, she had lain awake thinking about this question. She had traced and retraced their evening together, combing through each nuance of voice and gesture like a starving tramp pawing through bags of garbage. Around four o'clock she had finally given up, turning on her side, curling up and closing her eyes, willing herself to drift off, as she often did, by thinking of her two sisters. Michaela was dead now, killed in the pursuit of their revenge. But Kaya was very much alive, though by mutual agreement they'd had no contact with each other for years. Maggie imagined the two of them together, touching foreheads as the triplets had done when they were very young, that particular feeling of a shared warmth flowing through them, a closed circuit that made them special and kept the outside world, the hateful world of their childhood, of Iceland, the betrayal of their father, at bay. He'd left them and their mother to kill, to finally be killed, all in the name of what? 
the shadow organization to which their father belonged. She thought of their father now, walking out the door into the snow glare of a Stockholm winter. She had watched him go, never to return. And then, nothing, until she had uncovered the news that he had been killed by his intended target, Alexander Conklin. A chill had flashed down her spine, a feeling she had not been able to share with her sisters. She closed her eyes on the bleakness of Stockholm, on the image of her father walking away from her, from all of them. She wanted to dream of him, which was why she held the memory of him close to her as she drifted. With sleep drawing her into its arms, a dream rose like a ghost from the grave, but her father wasn't in it. She and Christopher were at a sports complex. It was completely empty, save for them. Moonlight shone on a vast pool. She looked down and saw Christopher smiling at her. He waved up to her, and she realized that she was standing on a high dive board. Go on, he said. You needn't wait for me. She had no idea what he meant but she knew she was going to dive. She stepped to the end of the board and curled her toes around the edge. She flexed her knees, felt a spring in the board, the coiled power of it, and it gave her great courage. She sprang up and out in a beautiful arc. Her arms were in front of her, her palms together as if in prayer. She saw the water coming to meet her as she dropped through the night. Moonlight silvered the pool, turning it into glass, into a mirror. She saw herself diving down to meet the water, but it wasn't her she saw just before she cleaved the water. It was Christopher. That's when her eyes flew open. Across the room, she saw the curtains pattern with dawn light, which to her half-dreaming mind looked thick and aqueous. For a moment, she thought she was underwater, deep in the belly of the pool, on her way up. Then recognition flooded her, and she knew with a certainty she felt in her bones. She and Christopher were so alike, she felt chills ripple through her. She sat up in bed, her pulse beating in her ears. Dear God, she said aloud, what is to become of me? Peter awoke in an ambulance, siren wailing, rocketing along the city streets. He was lying strapped to a gurney, feeling as weak as a preemie. Where am I? What happened? His voice was thin and reedy, unfamiliar against the insistent ringing in his ears. A face bent over him, a young man with blonde hair and an open smile. Not to worry, the blonde said. You're in good hands. Peter tried to sit up, but the restraints prevented him from moving. Then, all at once, like an oncoming locomotive hurtling out of the mist, he remembered walking across the underground garage, pressing the button on his key fob to start his car's engine, and then a crack like the end of the world. His mouth felt dry and sticky. There was a metallic smell in his nostrils that made him queasy. Peter thought about Hendrix. He needed to brief his boss on what had happened. He also needed to find out why he had been targeted and by whom. He moved his right hand, forgetting that he was restrained. Hey, he said thickly, take off the straps. I need to get to my cell. Sorry, buddy, no can do. The blonde smiled down at him. Can't free you while the vehicle's in motion, rules and regs. If you get hurt, you can sue my ass off. Then have the driver pull over. Can't do that either, Blondie said. Time is of the essence. Peter was regaining his wits with every second, but he still felt physically exhausted, as if he'd just finished running a marathon. I assure you, I'm feeling much better. Blondie produced a rueful expression. I'm afraid that you're not in the best position to judge. You're still in shock and not thinking clearly. Peter raised his head. I said, have the driver pull over. I'm a federal agent reporting directly to the Secretary of Defense. The smile faded from Blondie's face. We know that, Mr. Marks. Peter's heart began to race as he struggled with the restraining straps. Let me the fuck up! That's when Blondie showed him the Glock. He laid the barrel gently against Peter's cheek. This says lie back and enjoy the ride. We've got some time to go. Which meant he wasn't being taken to a hospital. Peter stared up into Blondie's face, which was now as blank as a bank vault door. Were these the people responsible for wiring his car with explosives? 
Sorry to disappoint you. Blondie looked down at him, took the Glock away from his cheek. I know you expected me to die in the explosion. Blondie stroked the barrel of the Glock lovingly. What impresses me is how you got past security to wire my car. Blondie delivered a wry smile to someone out of Peter's field of vision. Who says it was wired in the garage? So these were the people who had targeted his car, and they knew where he lived. He still didn't know who they were working for, or, more to the immediate point, how many of them were in the ambulance with him. He assumed three, Blondie, the driver, and whoever Blondie had grinned at just now. But maybe there was a fourth riding shotgun up front. One thing was clear. These people were well-trained and well-funded. The ambulance swerved around a corner. Peter felt the gurney wanting to slide to one side, but it was locked down. Fortunately, the turn loosened the strap so that he could get his left hand free. Moving it down off the top of the gurney, he searched for the lever that would unlock it. A bit of surreptitious fumbling brought his fingers to the right spot, and he held on tight. Blocks passed, and Peter was despairing of ever getting his chance. But then he felt the centrifugal force begin to kick in as the ambulance went into another turn. He pushed down on the lever at the apex of the turn. The gurney slammed into Blondie's knees, then caromed back the other way. Peter freed his right hand, and when Blondie fell over him, Peter grabbed his Glock. As Blondie tried to right himself, Peter slammed the pistol into the side of his head. The second man came into Peter's view, lunging at him. Peter fired, and the man spun backward. His heavy set frame careened into the rear doors. Peter unsnapped the straps holding him down and slid off the gurney. At the same time, the ambulance was slowing. The driver was probably alarmed by the gunshot. Peter wasted no time. Leaping over the two bodies, he wrenched open the doors and jumped out. He hit the ground and rolled on his hip, but having used the last reserves of his strength, he was having difficulty even getting to his knees. Several yards farther on, the ambulance had pulled over. The driver jumped out, running back toward where Peter lay. Peter knew his only chance was the Glock, but he had lost it during his fall. He desperately looked around and saw it lying in the gutter. But the driver was on him before he had a chance to crawl the few feet toward it. He was plowed under by the driver's fists. He had no strength left with which to adequately defend himself, let alone retaliate. Bright spots of light exploded behind his eyes and waves of blackness rolled over him. He struggled against unconsciousness, but it was a losing battle. A drowning man going under for the last time could not have felt more despairing than Peter did. He never imagined a moment like this, a defeat this unexpected and complete. And then, after a maelstrom of violence, a concentration of pain, the last wave reaching up to pull him down, there was a soft breeze on his face. Sunlight, the sweet smell of a motorcycle's exhaust, and a face, blurry and indistinct as a dark cloud, loomed large in his limited field of vision. Not to worry, Chief. You're not dead yet. Chapter 15 In the dewy light of morning, Halal Isai went for a walk along the curving seaside streets of Cadiz. The day was already bright, with only a handful of white fluffy clouds way off to the south. The air was fresh, tangy with salt and phosphorus. Out on the water, several sailboats tacked, taking advantage of the wind. Many of the tourist shops were still closed, their metal gates rolled down like castle walls, and his eye caught a glimpse of the melancholy that invades coastal cities in the winter. He carefully chose the seaside cafe, passing up a cluster of others nearer to Don Fernando's house, for the one with a blue and white striped awning emblazoned with a red anchor. Seating himself at a small round table in the second row from the sidewalk, he ordered breakfast. Bicyclists whirred by like giant insects, and occasionally a car or a delivery truck rumbled past. Otherwise, the early hour had scoured the sidewalks clean. His coffee and pastry arrived. He sipped the coffee tentatively, deemed it good, and added just a touch of milk. Then he bit into his chewy, sweet pastry and sat back, breathing the humid air deep into his lungs. He began his ritual of plan review. Every day, variables cropped up that interfered with a plan or caused it to be altered in vital ways. 
It was like working out a delicately balanced puzzle that subtly changed each time you looked at it. Human beings were usually at fault, those involved both voluntarily and unwittingly. They were far too often unpredictable in their responses, and therefore had to be monitored carefully. It was exhausting work, worth the trouble only if the payoff was sufficiently valuable or desirable. In this case, as I thought, the payoff was both. Unfortunately, monitoring each human element was not always possible. Esteban Vegas, for instance, was an old friend of Don Fernando, but he meant nothing to Asai. But Bourne, well, Bourne was the constant in Asai's plan. Bourne's innate honor made him utterly predictable in life-or-death situations. This current situation was a case in point. Benjamin El Arian had finally made a major mistake by assigning Boris Karpov to kill Bourne, had failed to understand that the results of a collision between Bourne and Karpov were unpredictable and would likely be wholly unexpected. El Arian did not know Bourne the way Isai did. In fact, he knew next to nothing about him. Isai was counting on that, just as he was counting on Bourne to bring back Vegas and the woman from Colombia. He was congratulating himself when he saw movement out of the corner of his eye. He did not turn. He did not move. He simply stared straight ahead and watched Marlon Etana emerge out of the trembling morning sunshine and make his way beneath the blue and white striped awning with a red anchor. This way, Lana Lang said. Quickly. Karpov followed her through the cluttered streets of Munich until they reached a small, dark green opal. Fitful showers fell from a swollen sky the color of sheet metal. Get in, she said as she slid behind the wheel. Then she looked up at him, still standing on the sidewalk. Come on, what are you waiting for? Boris was waiting for inspiration. Walking down the street with someone he didn't know was one thing but getting into a small, enclosed, mobile space with her was something else altogether. Every instinct was screaming its paranoia in his mind. Hey, she said, clearly irritated. We don't have time for this. There's never time for anything, Karpov thought, getting in. Leastways, anything important. His life was filled with a constant flow of needs, obligations, accommodations, and reciprocal gestures, large, small, and everything in between. A political dance, in other words, that he could never ignore or even take the least little break from, for fear that when the music stopped, his chair would be taken over by someone else. And then, despite all his years of devotion, hard work, and the accretion of small atrocities for the state that hung invisibly on his uniform like medals of the secret wars, he would be looking at life from the outside in, which in Russia meant no life at all. Lana Lang drove very hard and very fast through the maze of city streets. She drove, Boris observed, like a man, with great competence, nerve, and not a lick of fear, even though the rain fell harder, the street slick. Here was her area of competence, he thought, whereas in the beer garden she had seemed like a silly, fashion-obsessed female whom he had no business accompanying, let alone trusting with his life. Every few seconds her eyes alternated between the rear view and side mirrors. She went through lights at the last possible instant, and often doubled back on what Boris assumed was their route. Where are we going? he asked. She smiled a secret smile, and that, too, was different about her. Somewhere no one can find me, I assume. Not exactly. That secret smile expanded. I'm taking you to the one place no one would seem to look for you. She put on a burst of speed, and Boris felt his torso pressed back into the seat. And that would be where? She shot him a mischievous look, then returned her gaze to the traffic ahead. Where else? she said. The mosque. Paris was laid out like a shell in the water of the Seine. Each district, or arrondissement, spiraled out from the center, the higher the number, the farther from the heart of the city. The outermost arrondissement were inhabited by immigrants, Vietnamese, Chinese, and Cambodians. Just beyond were the banlieues, or outskirts, which were given grudgingly over to the North African Arabs. 
Isolated on the cramped, unsightly fringes of the city, these disenfranchised were denied jobs or any meaningful contact with everyday Parisian life, culture, schooling, or art. Aaron followed Marchand's BMW into one of the northernmost banlieues, the filthiest, most congested and degraded outskirt any of them had ever seen. Allah, this stinking place looks like Cairo, Amun muttered under his breath. Indeed, the streets were narrow, the sidewalks cracked, the ugly, whitish buildings looking like the worst of the British council flats, tumbled one on top of the other without any space between them. Soraya, still on high alert, felt a renewal of tension between the two men and wondered at its origins. She sensed that Aaron was becoming more and more uncomfortable. As they rolled down the unlovely street, faces dark and tight with a toxic mingling of hatred and fear turned in their direction. Old women, their arms dragged down by bulging mesh shopping sacks, hurried away from them. Groups of young men came off the walls where they had been lounging or crouched, smoking, pulled toward the unfamiliar car like street dogs to a scrap of meat. She could feel the hostility directed at them from waves of black eyes, coffee-colored lips. Once, a bottle thrown in a high arc smashed against the Citroën's flank. Ahead of them, the BMW had turned left into an alley. Aaron pulled over to the curb and parked. He was the first out of the car, but Amun said, Considering the atmosphere, it might be better if you stayed with the car. Aaron bristled. Paris is my city. This isn't Paris, Amun said. This is North Africa. Soraya and I are both Muslims. Let us take care of this part of the operation. Soraya saw Aaron's face go dark. Aaron, he's right, she said softly. Take a step back. Think about the situation for a minute. This is my investigation. Aaron's voice was shaking with barely suppressed emotion. Both of you are my guests. Soraya engaged his eyes with her own. Think of him as a gift. A gift. Aaron seemed to crush the words between his teeth. Don't you see? He's used to these Arab slums. He can connect with the residents. Considering the way in which the investigation has turned, it's a great stroke of luck having him help us. Aaron tried to push past her. I don't. She blocked him with her body. We wouldn't even have this lead without him. He's already gone, Aaron said. Soraya turned and saw that he was right. Amun wasn't wasting any more time, and she understood. Coming this far, they didn't want to lose Marchand now. Aaron, stay here. She began to follow Amun down the alley. Please. The alley was narrow, crooked as a crone's finger, and twilight dark. She could just make out Amun's back as he slipped through a battered metal door. Racing ahead, she caught the door before it closed. As she was about to enter, she saw a rail-thin young man at the far end of the alley. She squinted. She could make out his red polo shirt, but the light was so dim she couldn't tell whether he was looking at her or at something else. Inside, a grimy iron staircase led downward. The area was lit by a single bare bulb, hanging from a length of flex. Ducking below it, she moved cautiously down the stairs. As she descended, she strained to hear the sounds of Amun's footsteps, anyone's footsteps, but all that came to her were the creakings and protestations of an old, ill-maintained building. She came to a tiny landing, and she continued down again. She could smell the dampness, mold, the sharp odors of decay and decomposition. She felt as if she had entered a dying body. Approaching the end of the stairs, she found herself on slabs of rough concrete. Cobwebs brushed her face, and now and again she could hear the click and chitter of rats. Soon enough, other small noises came to her. Hushed voices opened up the darkness. Doggedly, she groped her way forward, guided by the voices. Within fifty feet, she began to make out a wavering light that illuminated what appeared to be a warren of cave-like rooms. She paused for a moment, struck by the similarity between these spaces and those used by Hezbollah when they were preparing to cross the border for a raid into Israel. There was the same stench of sour sweat, anticipation, forgotten hygiene, spices, and the bitter, metallic smell of ordnance being prepped for detonation. She was close enough to make out the voices. There were three of them. This brought her up short. Had Amun engaged them already? But no. 
Now that she had crept close enough, her ears told her that only one of the voices was familiar. The miserable liar, de Natien Marchand. Approaching a corner, she peeked around. Three men stood in the dim, fizzy light of an old-fashioned oil lamp. One was very young, thin as a reed, dark-eyed and hollow-cheeked. The other was only a bit older, with a full beard and hands like axe heads. Facing them was Marchand. From the tone of their voices and their body language, it appeared they were in the middle of a difficult negotiation. She risked a glance around. Where was Amun? Somewhere close, she had to assume. What was his plan? And how could she get close enough to hear what the men were arguing about? Looking all around, she saw nothing that would help her. Then, directing her gaze upward into the shadows, she saw the massive beams that crisscrossed the space, keeping the entire building from collapsing into the Arab's basement lair. Using a series of boxes she found strewn over the floor, she climbed up until she could loop her arms around one of the beams. Hauling her torso upward, she wrapped her ankles across the top of the beam and, using that leverage, swung fully up. She had to be careful not to disturb the accumulated filth, grime, sticky cobwebs, iridescent insect shells, and rat droppings, which, raining down, would announce her presence. On her belly, Soraya inched along the beam until she was more or less above the three men. No, man, I say triple for that. Triple is too much, Marchand said. Shit for that bitch triples too little. You got ten seconds, then the price goes up. Okay, okay, Marchand said after a short pause. Soraya could hear the slither of bills being counted out. I'll have a photo downloaded to your cell phone, Marchand said. Don't need no photo. That moor bitch's face is etched in my brain. Soraya shuddered. There was something grimly surreal about eavesdropping on the plans for her own imminent demise. She could feel her heart hammering in her throat as the meeting broke up. She hated these Arabs, but she remained motionless. The mission was to discover whom Marchand had called after they had scared him half out of his wits. These Arab thugs couldn't tell her. Only Marchand could do that. He would never have talked on his own territory, but now that she had caught him in a compromising position with these hitmen, he might be more inclined. She started as Amun came racing out of the shadows. The older of the Arabs turned, a switchblade already in one hand. He stabbed outward, forcing Amun to change direction. The younger Arab smashed his fist into the side of Amun's head, knocking him down. Soraya dropped feet first from the beam, her knee catching the younger Arab in the small of the back. He went down, his head striking the concrete, which shattered his front teeth. Blood spattered from his split lip. He groaned and lay still. Amun scrambled away from the older Arab's knife, and they both vanished into the darkness. That left Soraya and Donatien Marchand. He stared at her with the fixed intensity of a trapped wolf. His eyes seemed yellow with hatred. How did you know where I was coming? When she didn't answer, he glanced around. Where's the Jew? Too timid to make it down here. You're dealing with me now, Soraya said. Before she could say another word, Marchand bolted away. She tore after him, back toward the stairs. Part of her mind was with Amun and his fight with the Arab. Were there more down here? But she couldn't think of that now. She couldn't let Marchand get away. He reached the bottom of the stairs and leapt upward, faster and more agile than she had expected. She pounded after, through the wan, gritty light, up through patches of darkness, past the tiny landing, ascending the second part of the staircase, up toward where the bare bulb emitted its waxen light. Marchand was running so hard, he hit the bulb with his shoulder. It swung back and forth on the end of its flex, casting wild and disorienting shadows across the stairs. Soraya redoubled her pace, closing the distance to her enemy. All at once, Marchand stopped and whirling, drew a small twenty-two with silver grips. He fired once, wildly, and then again as she closed, the second bullet tearing through the shoulder of her jacket, but leaving her unharmed. Barreling into him, she drove the edge of her hand into his wrist, knocking the twenty-two out of his grip. With a series of bright, hard clangs, it bounded down the stairs and lay half in the shadows. Soraya grabbed the front of Marchand's coat, drawing him to her, but he had reached up, and before she knew what had happened, 
looped the electrical flex around her neck. He pulled tight and she gagged. Her hands reached up to loosen the flex, but Marchand, standing behind her, only pulled it tighter. Her fingers scrabbled futilely at the flex cutting into her neck and throat. She tried to draw a breath, but it was no use. A moment later, she began to lose consciousness. Chapter 16 Bourne arrived in Seville with his two passengers without further incident. Interpol hadn't been waiting for the plane in Madrid, and in Seville the trio passed through the arrivals terminal unnoticed. As promised, a rental car was waiting for them along with an internet address. Bourne entered it into his cell phone's browser, and up came a map of the area from Seville to Cadiz. A purple line indicated the route Asai expected them to take. At the end was an address in Cadiz, the place, he assumed, where Don Fernando Herrera was waiting for their arrival. They climbed into the car, and Bourne started it up, then drove them out of the airport. He had spent the airtime trying to figure out Halal Asai's game. There was no doubt that Asai had fed him a brew of truth and lies, so whether he was ally or enemy was still to be determined. Bourne had also spent much of the time brooding over his friend Boris Karpov. If it was true he had been ordered to kill Bourne, he hadn't shown up yet. But would he? Asai wanted something from Bourne, something he knew Bourne wouldn't do if Asai asked him straight out. Did it have to do with Boris? Bourne felt a vast net beginning to tighten around him, but as yet he had no idea of its size or origin. Someone wanted him, but why and for what? You don't talk a lot, do you? Rosie said from the seat next to him. Bourne smiled, staring straight ahead as he navigated the road. He was concerned about tails, but so far the traffic behind them appeared normal. You're not like anyone I've ever met. Dios mio, Rosie, Vega said from the back seat. Stop peppering him with questions. I'm only making conversation, mi amor. She turned to Bourne, but her eyes did not meet his, sliding away into shadow. I know what it's like to be alone, really alone, crouched in the shadows, watching the sunlight. Rosie! Hush, mi amor. She addressed Bourne again. Here is what I can't understand. Why would someone do this voluntarily? You know, Bourne said, you don't speak like someone from the backwater of Colombia. I sound educated, yes? I admire your vocabulary. Her laughter was deep and rich. Yes, someone like you would. You don't know anything about me. No? You are alone, always alone. I think this is the essential thing about you. It defines how you think and everything you do. She cocked her head. You have no answer for this. I don't know a single thing about you. She touched the scars on her neck and chest. But I think you do. The Marge. She was so beautiful, Rosie said. But I got in her way. No, Bourne said. You frightened her. Rosie looked away, out her window at the passing scenery, which was nothing much. A series of hypnotically undulating hills, some covered in groves of gnarled, dusty-looking olive trees. Bourne glanced again in the rearview mirror. There was a red Fiat he was keeping an eye on, though he doubted any professional tail would be driving a red car. Stumbling over a Margay's den, he said. That doesn't sound like the kind of behavior I'd expect from someone who was born and raised in the Cordilleras. I was running. Crossing a stream, I slipped on a mossy rock and hurt my knee. I wasn't looking where I was going. I was frightened. You were running away? Yes. From whom? Rosie tossed her head. You're always running. You should know. I was told you were running away from your family. She nodded. That is true. I've never done that. And yet... You're alone, always alone, she said. It must be exhausting. Vegas leaned forward. Rosie, for the love of God. He turned to Bourne. I apologize for her. Bourne shrugged. The world is full of opinions. I know why you run, Rosie said. It is so nothing will touch you. 
Bourne's eyes flicked again to the rearview mirror, the red Fiat, then to Rosie's face, but once again her eyes were averted. I suppose there's not much call for a psychologist in Mbagwe, he said. Is that where you were born? I am a Chagua, Rosie said, from the serpent line. Born, an expert in comparative languages, knew that the Achagua had named their different family lineages after animals. Serpent, jaguar, fox, bat, taper. Do you speak the language? Iranche? A slow smile lifted the corners of her lips. Nice try. I'm impressed, really, but no. Iranche is its own language. The Ichagwe spoke any number of Maipurian dialects, depending on whether they lived in the mountains or the Amazon basin. Her smile broadened. Please, tell me you don't speak any of those languages. I don't, Bourne said. Neither do I. They were spoken a very long time ago. Even my father had no knowledge of them. Bourne's eyes returned to the rearview mirror. He could no longer see the red fiat and instead began to concentrate on the black van up ahead. Over the past fifteen minutes, it had had several opportunities to change lanes and speed, but it hadn't done so. Instead, it had maintained its position four vehicles ahead of him. Checking his side mirror, he waited for a break in the traffic, then, without signaling, shot forward into the left-hand lane. Within seconds, he had passed the black van. He watched it firmly planted in his rear view, receding slowly from view. Then it changed lanes and accelerated. Now he began to look for the box, a tailing maneuver extremely difficult to shake, since it involved vehicles in front and behind. What's happening? Vega said. Bourne could feel the anxiety radiating from him like waves of heat. There are people on this road who shouldn't be here, Bourne said. Sit back. Rosie gripped the handle above her door but said nothing. Her face was set in neutral. She knew when to keep quiet, Bourne thought. The black van had established a position a car's length behind him. Apparently, the driver understood he had been made. Bourne checked ahead but saw no other black van. He saw two Cedar sports cars, a bus full of Japanese tourists, cameras held in front of their faces, and sedans with families. There were also a wide variety of trucks, including a semi, but none of these vehicles seemed likely to be part of the box. He tried varying his speed, noting how each vehicle in front of him reacted, but he got no definitive read. He thought it interesting and worrisome that though the black van had announced itself, the second vehicle was still incognito. He wondered what that meant because it wasn't part of the box playbook, which dictated all in or all out. Once one of the vehicles in the box was made, usually the two vehicles either peeled off or closed in. Suddenly, the black van made its move, coming up on Bourne's left. He switched into the center lane, and moments later, it followed. He kept going into the right-hand lane, even though the semi was now in front of him. If the black van followed, he could always swing around the semi's left. With a burst of speed, the black van cut off a chugging sedan as it swerved into the right-hand lane behind Bourne. Bourne looked for a break in the traffic to switch to the center lane, but even as he plotted vectors, the black van came up dangerously close behind him. He accelerated, and at the precise moment, the rear of the semi slammed down, its edge casting off a shower of sparks as it dragged along the roadbed. The moment Bourne saw it, he understood. The rear panel had been retrofitted as a ramp. The black van then gently rear-ended him, urging his rental car farther toward the ramp and the yawning, empty interior of the semi, the box's second vehicle. These people never meant to tail him, never meant to kill him. They meant to capture him, seal him in, and take him out of the field permanently. Soraya, struggling to stay conscious, dug her heels into the grit of the staircase. At the same time, she swiveled her hips to the left, moving them out of the way of her right elbow, which she drove into the soft spot of Marchand's throat. Marchand reared back, so shocked that he took his hands off the flex to belatedly protect his vulnerable throat. With her right hand, she tore the flex away from her throat. She slammed her knee into Marchand's crotch, 
He gasped, bent over double, and she wrapped the flex around his neck, pulling on both ends so hard he collapsed to his knees. He made little gasping sounds like a fish on the deck of a boat. He looked up at her, his watering eyes bloodshot and bulging. He tried to swipe at her with his right hand, then his left, but her grip on him was terminal. She bent over, shoving her grim face in his. Now, Monsieur Marchand, you're going to tell me what I want to know. You're going to tell me now, or by Allah, I will take your life and your soul, and I will grind them both to dust. He stared at her. His face was becoming bloated, dark with pooled blood. Tears of pain spilled out of his eyes. She could see the whites all the way around. Ach, 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 was all he could manage. The moment she loosened the flex, the smallest amount, he lashed out at her, but she slammed her forehead into the bridge of his nose, resulting in a spray of blood that covered his upper lip, cheeks, and chin. Now talk, she said. Who did you call after we left your office? His eyes opened even wider. How? How did you know? Tell me. Why bother? You will kill me anyway. His voice sounded sodden, as if he were speaking to her from underwater. And why not? You were planning my death, she said. But unlike you, I might have a measure of mercy inside me. That's the chance you'll have to take. All of a sudden, his shoulders slumped, and he shrugged. So I tell you, what does it matter? You won't get out of here alive. Soraya had had enough of him. Her desire to break him into little pieces became overwhelming. Taking his broken nose in her hand, she turned it like a water faucet until new tears sprang from his eyes and he was panting like a pack animal about to collapse. Then, and only then, did she loosen the flex sufficiently. She stared hard into his eyes. Five seconds. Four. Three. He jabbed upward, his fist connecting with her left breast. Soraya saw stars and, staggering back, almost pitched off the stairs. Seizing his moment, Marchand sprang at her, his face purple, his cheeks blotchy, and his breath sawed raggedly from his throat. His hands throttled her, bending her backward as he attempted to pitch her off the staircase down into the blackness at the bottom. Also struggling for breath, Soraya cursed herself for letting down her guard while working to spread his forearms and mitigate his attack. But Marchand was out for blood. Soraya punched and punched, but she lacked leverage, so her blows were having a minimal effect. Lights were bursting behind her eyes, and she was having trouble thinking. She struggled mightily, but that only seemed to worm her deeper into his grip. Slowly, inexorably, he pushed her backward against the railing until her back was arched painfully. Light and shadow danced spastically, eerily, as the bulb swung to her ever more desperate movements. She found herself staring at the light bulb, a miniature sun emanating from the coils. Then she blinked. She was at the tipping point and felt him marshalling his energy to heave her over the side. Her arm shot up. Grasping the base of the bulb, she slammed it into Marchand's left eye. He screamed as the glass shattered, piercing his eyeball. Soraya, feeling the pressure come off, shoved the broken base deeper in. The corona of the electric shock spun her backward like a giant hand slap. She sucked in deep, shuddering breaths, desperate to return oxygen to her system. She felt harrowed, hollowed out. Then she smelled burning flesh and almost gagged. She stood up straight, groaning, every muscle in her torso sore and aching. Marchand was on his knees. His hands were glued to the base of the bulb, which was buried in his eye socket. Muscles jumped and spasmed even as he fell over, his heart short-circuiting.
Chapter 17 The oncoming black van was behind Bourne, the semi ready to scoop them up in front. To the right was a two-foot shoulder ending in a galvanized steel guardrail, beyond which was a steep drop-off into an olive grove clinging to the side of a hill. On his left was a convertible Mercedes, the oblivious driver bobbing his head to the music pouring out of his speakers. There was no time for thought, only instinct forged by years of training and hard experience. Bourne accelerated, closing the car's length distance between him and the ramp. Then he was on the ramp itself, the nose of the rental car pointed up. What the hell are you doing? Vegas shouted. Halfway up the ramp, Bourne turned the wheel hard to his left, and at the same time stamped the accelerator to the floor. The car shot up and off the ramp. Airborne, it passed over the Mercedes, the undercarriage clearing the driver's head by inches, even before he instinctively ducked. Horns blared, brakes screeched. Bourne clipped the rear end of the car in the far left lane, regained control, and kept going. Behind him, cars piled into one another in a chain reaction, but the rental car was free now, accelerating away from the semi and the black van, both of which were caught in the expanding chaos of a massive crash. Madre de Dios, Vegas cried. Is my poor heart still beating? Rosie released her grip on the handle above the door. What Esteban means is thank you. What I mean is, I need a drink, Vegas muttered from behind them. The day was spent. The sun, yellow bordering on orange, pressed down against the hills in the west like a fried egg. Twilight swept across the olive groves, lending their tortured branches a spooky aspect. They were racing west, toward the darkness of night and a sprinkling of first-magnitude stars. The atmosphere in the car had altered. Bourne could feel it as surely as you feel the onset of winter, a drop in the pressure, a tiny shiver of a premonition. Following their escape from the box, a subtle shift in the balance of his two charges had occurred. It was as if Vegas, the competent oil man, felt like a fish out of water away from his mountains and his oil fields, whereas their journey away from Ibagwe had caused Rosie to blossom like a flower in sunlight. He thought about the elaborate box, which had the hand of the Domna all over it. The Domna had tracked him down. Had Halal Isai told them? Bourne wouldn't put it past him. Isai remained a complete mystery to Bourne. Painful as it might be, everything Rosie had said was true. He was running away from everything and everyone, and of course it was clear why. Once, he had cared deeply for a handful of people. Now all of them save Moira and Soraya were dead. Perhaps some of them because of him. No more, an insistent voice inside of him cried. No more. His new philosophy developed without his even being aware of it, was simple. Keep running. He knew he couldn't get hurt running, but the downside, the collateral damage that Rosie had so cleverly pointed out to him, was that he felt nothing. Was that living? Was he even alive? And if he wasn't, what was the state of being in which he found himself? To distract himself, he turned to Rosie. Why were you running away? The usual reasons. She had a knack of answering questions as he would have, without revealing any pertinent information. There are no usual reasons, he shot back. This made her laugh, a sound he found intriguing. It was deep and rich, launched from her stomach. There was nothing shallow or phony about that laugh. Well, you're right about that. She was silent for some time. Bourne caught a look at Vegas, asleep in the back seat. He looked drawn, exhausted, as if he'd traveled from the Cordilleras to just outside Cadiz on foot. I was not a good girl, Rosie said after a time. She was staring out her side window. I was, what do you call it, the black sheep. Whatever I did made the people around me angry. Your family? Not just my family. There were friends affected, too. That was one of the things my family couldn't forgive me for. They rode on in silence, the wind cracking and moaning through the car. 
Rosie pushed her hair back behind her ear, revealing a small tattoo on the inside of one of the whorls. I see you keep a serpent with you at all times, Bourne said. The snake was striped orange and black. She touched the pink shell of her ear. It's a sky tail. It looks mythical. Does it breathe fire? Huh. I've yet to hear about a creature that breathes fire. You haven't met some of the Russians I have. That laugh again, filling the car as if with perfume. Bourne hesitated only a moment. But you have met some bad people. The wind floated her hair over her ear, obscuring the tiny dragon. Pretty bad, yes. Before he could follow up, she said, Why are you running? I pissed off some very powerful people. They had plans and I got in the way. Rosie gave Vegas a quick glance over her shoulder. If it's the Domna, then good for you. This brought a wry smile to Bourne's face. What do you know about Esteban's involvement with them? Rosie hesitated, possibly considering whether or not to violate a confidence. Then she said, His involvement wasn't voluntary, I can tell you that. How did they trap him? His daughter. I thought she ran off with a handsome Brazilian. Who told you that? Suarez? When Bourne said nothing, Rosie shrugged and went on grimly. That is the story Esteban decided on. It made sense. It was plausible. But the truth is the Domna kidnapped her. Where she is, I have no idea. Every week, Esteban received a photo of her holding a dated newspaper so he knew she was alive. But Esteban rebelled, Bourne said. She ran her hands through her hair. Isai told him that the Domna didn't have his daughter. They had taken her, but long ago she escaped. No one knows how or where she is. The only thing that Isai could tell Esteban was that the two men who had kidnapped her were found dead, their throats slit. The rest is a complete mystery. And the photo they sent him every week? Photoshop. They apparently used a girl built like her, then put Esteban's daughter's head onto her shoulders. She shuddered. Ghoulish. I assume Esteban has never heard from her. Not a word. Bourne turned off the highway at the exit for Cadiz. Not long now. Thank God, Rosie said under her breath. She must have had help, Bourne said thoughtfully. Esteban and I talked about that a lot, she shrugged, for all the good it did. Bourne could see the city up ahead, like a shining ball of Byzantine brass. He rolled down the window all the way and drew the rich scent of the sea into his lungs. How much does Esteban know about the Domna? Bourne asked. He remembered Isai telling him that if Esteban couldn't tell him what the Domna's new plan was, he would surely know someone who could. Rosie shifted in her seat. The fact that he had to be coerced into working for them should tell you all you need to know. He was a cog in a wheel. Everyone except the directors is a cog. It's safer that way. Compartmentalization provides complete security. In Esteban's case, he provided an invaluable service. Which was? Oil rigs are under constant stress. Parts wear out, clog, snap. New parts are always on order. The older ones being shipped back to the various manufacturers. You get the idea. Born did. What was Esteban smuggling in and out of Colombia for them? Rosie shrugged. Drugs, weapons, for all I know, human beings. Honestly, it could have been anything. Esteban never told you? He never knew. The sealed crates came and went. They were marked in a certain way. He was prohibited from opening them. He was simply the conduit. Curiosity is part of the human condition, Bourne said. He never peeked? They were sealed in a specific fashion. Anyway, if he found a way in, he never spoke about it. Would he keep something like that from you? As you have seen for yourself, Esteban is extremely protective of me. He would die rather than expose me to danger. When is a response not an answer? Bourne thought.
when Rosie provides it. They had entered the streets of Old Cadiz, ablaze with light and sharp shadows. The filigreed architecture of North Africa was all around them. It was as if they had immigrated into another world, one suspended on the ocean, balanced between east and west, part of both, belonging to neither. The light of day looked fatigued. The sharp odor of a storm was in the air. Night was already beginning to gather. They drove on, down crooked streets, hearing the calls of street vendors in Spanish and Arabic, inhaling the incense of history. Where did you learn to pilot a boat? Marlon Etana said as he sat on the sailboat's bench. I'm full of surprises, Isai said, even to a man like you. A man like me sent to kill a man like you. Isai laughed. The best laid plans. After meeting up at the cafe early in the morning, the two men had shared a coffee. They talked about home, about nothing at all. Then they went for a long walk. But even then, nothing of consequence passed between them. This was how they wanted it, how it had to be. Theirs was a relationship so buried in conspiracy, deceit, and deepest cover, they often had difficulty communicating simply as human beings. Isai had reserved a sailboat at the rental dock, and they had set sail just after lunchtime, when the world of Cadiz was still drowsing in siesta. All the other boats had pushed off just after dawn, so they wouldn't return until late afternoon. No one saw them. No one but the rental agent was around, and his sole interest was in the euros that crossed his greedy palm. The day was clear, just some high clouds passing, the sun beating down, flattening the water to beaten brass. Still, the wind was up, and Asai maneuvered the small sailboat expertly, effortlessly, as if he had been born on the water. The edge of Cadiz slipped away. A Saracen's massive scimitar, its hilt encrusted with jewels winking in the sunlight. It wasn't until the sun lowered, the western sky turning into a palette full of gaudy colors, that they got around to talking. El Ariane still thinks you hate me, yes? Esai said. More than ever, I think. Etana's skull was gilded, but his thick beard extinguished the light. I wanted to go after Bourne, but Benjamin assigned me to you. The wily bastard recruited Victor Cherkasov. Cherkasov has Boris Karpov in his back pocket. He's the only one who does. From his seat in the cockpit, Itana stared down into the water, cobalt with streaks of orange interspersed with an inky black. I don't think that's the only reason he recruited Cherkasov. Isai turned from checking the wind, one hand on the wheel. Oh? Itana pulled into himself, elbows on stringy, muscular thighs. Cherkasov's first assignment wasn't meeting with Kopov. El Aryan sent him to the mosque. Isai felt a chill run through him. The light was wavering before his eyes, turning from gold to blue-black. The mosque in Munich. The very same. But why? Itana sighed. I'd have to be a sorcerer to know that. He sent a Russian ex-FSB director to the mosque. Isai shook his head. El Aryan must be mad. Itana raised his eyes to his size. We need to come up with a better explanation, and quickly. What about the plan? Isai didn't want to think about the mosque. The mosque and the people who now ran it were the reason for the hatred burning inside him. El Aryan briefed the directors before I left Paris. But of course I wasn't part of the meeting. No one has said a word. I wouldn't expect them to. The wind changed, and the sails were beginning to luff, rippling like a flag. Isai rose briefly, made an adjustment, then returned to the cockpit and tacked starboard. Careful, he said. With the crack of the sail, the boom swung past them. Asai kept the boat close-hauled, the quartering wind pushing out the sails like a fat man's cheek. They skimmed through the water, roughly paralleling the shore. Itana steepled his brown fingers, long as a pianist's. I admit you were right, Halal. There's no doubt the mosque's influence over the Domna is increasing every day. This is Abdul Kahar's doing, Asai said bitterly. 
servant of the subduer indeed. But how did El Arian come under their control? Esai kept the boat steady on its course. One has to go back decades to a man named Noren, a deep-cover operative who infiltrated the Domna. Now and again the Domna required a bit of wet work, and they used Noren. He was a ghost, a reliable ghost, which is the most important thing. But all the while he was on assignments for the Domna, he was compiling lists of names, dates, facts, and figures. To use against the Domna? They were used. We lost twenty-one operatives in the span of three weeks. But who was he working for? No one knows, though many people within the Domna and under its control tried to find out. Isai squinted off to the west, where thunderheads were building. The wind grew gusty, the water choppy, and he turned the wheel, heading for shore. Noren was killed. What happened? He was overmatched on one of his assignments. Atana grunted. Who was the target? Isai maneuvered the boat so that it was running before the wind, the hull cleaving the water, spray slapping them in the face with each wave crest. A man named Alexander Conklin shot him dead. Isai gave his companion a glance. Heard of him? Itana shook his head. Asai kept one eye on the roiling thunderheads. Conklin was the head of Treadstone. In fact, he created it. One of the primary missions of Treadstone was to take down the Domna hierarchy. That's why Conklin became a target. And after Norin? The whole idea of terminating Conklin was deemed too risky, Asai said. They were nearing the shore now, the gusty wind pushing them fast, so that he had to begin a long tack in order to slow them. Here, take the wheel and hold it steady. With Atana's hands on the wheel, Asai stepped out of the cockpit, went forward, and reefed the jib in order to cut their speed even more. He could feel the storm's damp slap on his face, though it hadn't yet broken. When he returned to the cockpit, he retook the wheel. Conklin and Treadstone scared the Domna, he said. That was when El Arian reached out to Abdul Kahar. Without getting the other director's prior consent. Just like El Arian. I have a strong suspicion that he and Abdul Kahar had a prior relationship when they were young men, though I haven't been able to substantiate it yet. That would make sense. But what is clear is that Treadstone's assault was the excuse El Arian needed to forge an alliance between the Domna and the Mosque. Isai shook his head. That kind of Arab influence goes against the Domna's charter of East-West cooperation. It was a watershed moment for the Domna. It was when everything changed. Itana was sitting very still. His hands had a death grip on the bench, and he seemed green around the gills. Isai said nothing, out of respect, and soon enough he reefed the main sail and they glided into the dock. He threw the bow line to the rental agent. I was getting worried, the man said as he drew the boat slowly in. The storm front looks very bad. No need to worry about us, Isai said. No need at all. Don't you pass out on me, Tyrone Elkins shouted. Peter Marks, his arms tight around Elkins' waist, rode the motorcycle, dizzy and weak. There was a fire raging through his body, and he kept going in and out of consciousness, like an exhausted swimmer in the surf. That drowning reference again. Dimly, he wondered where that came from. Is that you laughing back there? Tyrone shouted across the wind. Maybe, Peter said. I don't know. He let his cheek rest against the thick leather of Elkins's jacket. Since when did C.I. allow one of its operatives to wear a leather jacket, he wondered. Then the thought was lost in the swirl of the inner surf that buffeted him. No hospital, he said. Gotcha the first time, chief. Peter gave a start of deep-seated anxiety. Who knew who was after him, what places they'd be watching, and waiting? Please. Fear not, chief, Tyrone said. I know just where to go. Someplace safe, 
Peter mumbled. Please, Tyrone said. Give me a fucking break. They arrived at Duran's house in northeast D.C. seven minutes later, Tyrone having broken every traffic ordinance known to the district. Tyrone, brought up in this African-American ghetto, had never held any truck with traffic laws, and now that he worked for C.I., he never gave them a second thought. Any cop stupid enough to pull him over got a face full of his federal ID and backed off faster than a rat looking at a cat. Back in the day, Tyrone had worked for Duran, a tall, handsome black man with a British education and cultured accent that stood him in good stead with his international clientele of shady art dealers trafficking in Duran's magnificent forgeries. Duran also created all of Jason Bourne's forged documents and some of his weapons as well. It was because of Bourne's friend Soraya Moore that Tyrone had decided to heed Duran's advice, leave the hood behind, apply himself, and train for work at CI. He'd never worked harder in his life, but the rewards had been many and worth it. What the bloody hell happened? Duran said as he helped Tyrone carry Peter into the house. Fucking meat grinders, what happened? Peter seemed delirious, rambling incoherently about making calls, dire warnings, pieces of a puzzle. Any idea what he's on about? Duran asked. Tyrone shook his head. Shit, no. All he was going on about on the way over was I shouldn't take him to a hospital. Hmm, Jason wouldn't want that either. Tyrone helped his former mentor lay Peter on the sofa. Details, Duran said. Tyrone recounted the scene with the ambulance, the men shot, the driver beating up on Peter. I brought him right over here, he concluded, handing over the Glock he'd snatched up from the gutter before helping Peter onto his motorcycle. I hope you didn't handle it too much. Little as I could, Tyrone said. Duran nodded, clearly pleased. After carefully putting the gun into a plastic bag, he surveyed the battleground of Peter's body. You know him. Yeah, he's Soraya's pal, Peter Marks. Used to work with her at Typhon before she was canned. Duran went to fetch his extensive first aid kit. Peter was still softly raving. Call him. Tell him. Tyrone bent over him. Who, Peter? Who do you want to call? Peter just thrashed, mumbled words tumbling from his blood-stained lips. Hold him down so he doesn't hurt himself, Duran said. This here Peter left C.I., Tyrone went on. Don't know what he been up to since then, but seeing him like this, it sure as fuck can't be healthy. Duran returned, knelt down beside Marx, and opened the case. Son, you have got to work on your King's English. Say what? Duran gave a short laugh. Never mind, we'll work on your pronunciation later. He administered a shot into Peter's arm. No, no, Peter cried, his eyes not quite focused. Must call, must tell him. But then the anesthetic took him, and calmed, he slipped into unconsciousness. Duran pulled apart Peter's shirt, sticky with blood. Peter's chest was studded with glass and metal shards, a miniature graveyard. Right now, Tyrone, let's you and me make this man right. Soraya heard the pounding of feet, and she turned, in a half crouch, ready to defend herself. But it was Amun sprinting into the feeble light of the staircase. Are you all right? He said from the foot of the stairs. She nodded, unable for the moment to speak coherently. She was still reeling from Marchand's second attack on her, and her chest hurt like hell. Marchand had seemed like the quintessential academic. She had never thought him capable of such viciousness, and thereby she had learned an important lesson. Amun, taking the stairs two steps at a time, said, That the whole son Marchand... She nodded again. Dead. It was the only word she was capable of uttering. It's over now. They're all dead down there. What a rotten nest of vipers. We should... His head exploded, and he pitched forward into her arms. She screamed, staggering backward. He was dead weight. She saw a moving shadow, caught a glimpse of a red polo shirt. The man at the far end of the alley. Then a flash of metal. Another shot clanged off the stair railing, and with her burden, she somersaulted backward, pitching down into the blackness. Two shots followed, then another, loud as a cannon shot. Then nothing. Not even an echo. Oblivion. Oblivion.